uh, embryo, kidney embryology. Uh, so before we read that, let's look at the diagram. We have degenerated pronephros here, mesonephros here, and metanephros here. This is your general sinus. This is the ureteric bud. This is the metanephric mesenchyme, and this is the mesonephric duct. Okay, so we have pronephros, uh, week four of development, then degenerates. So it's degenerated pronephros there after week four of development. Mesonephros, week four of development, uh, functions as interim kidney for first trimester. It persists in the ma male genital system as Wolfian duct, forming ductus deferens and epididymis. Okay, uh, need to know that. Uh, for mesonephros just uh, let me go to repro and bring that thing over here uh, right here Okay, so we have Wolfian duct right here, or mesonephric duct. It makes this uh, vesicles, uh, seminal vesicles, epididymis, ejacu uh, ejaculatory duct, and ductus deferens, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it functions as interim kidney for first trimester, persists in the male genital as uh, genital system as Wolfian duct, forming ductus deferens and epididymis. Okay, metosnephros is permanent, uh, first appears in week five of development. Nephrogenesis is normally completed by week 36 of gestation. Okay, so these is, this is the important stuff right here. Uh, the ureteric uh, bird or ureteric bird, sorry. A metanephric diverticulum derived from quadral end of mesonephric duct gives rise to ureter, pelvis, callus, uh, collecting duct, and fully canalized by week 10 of development. Uh, so to remember this, let's give it a draw. Uh, derived from quadral end of the mesonephric duct. Okay, so this is the mesonephric duct. That's where the ure ureteric bud uh, comes out of okay it's a metanephric diverticulum it gives rise to the ureter okay uh, the pelvis uh, calluses actually you know what let's find a photo it'll be better for this Okay, so ureters, uh, you already know what those are, right? Those are the these things connecting the uh, kidney to the the bladder. Okay, uh, pelvises are these things right here, uh, renal pelvis. Uh, the calluses are these things right here, the small ones right there, and the collecting ducts. Uh, the collecting ducts are in. The tubules, that's what they're talking about, right? Uh, in loop of Henley. So, that would be these things at the end, right? So, these are the collecting ducts. Okay, so that's what's being made by 
uteric bud they ask you that so uh, they also ask you where does it come from so it comes from metanephric diverticulum okay uh, we don't need this anymore I don't think so okay uh, then metanephric mesenchyme this is uh, that is met metanephric blastema it's ureteric bud interacts with this tissue interaction induces differentiation and formation of glomerulus through to distal convoluted tubule right so that's the glomerulus uh, this is the distal convoluted uh, tubule so all of that just before collecting duct Okay, once again, uh, so ureteric bud interacts with this tissue, the tissue that's known as metanephric uh, mesenchyme, right? Interaction induces differentiation and formation of glomerulus through distal convoluted tubule. It's important that you know that, that metanephric mesenchyme makes the distal convoluted tubule because they can ask you about any of these, like uh, what gives rise to proximal tubule or distal tubule right so like that and then what about the collecting duct then that's not going to be metanephric that's going to be your uteric bud right okay uh, aberrant interaction between these two tissues may result in several congenital uh, malformations of the kidney that is renal agenesis and multicystic dysplastic kidney okay so when the ureteric, uh, ureteric bud and the metanephric mesenchyme don't get, uh, you know, fused or attached to each other or something problematic is happening over there, you can uh, get several congenital malformations. Uh, you can get renal agenesis. You can get multicystic dysplastic kidney, right? So the junction, uh, ureteropelvic junction, lasts to canalize. It uh, leads to congenital obstruction, can be unilateral or bilateral. Most common pathologic cause of prenatal hydronephrosis. Okay, uh, this is important. They ask you, like they'll give you a photo or clinical symptom or like a clinical picture of hydronephrosis. You'll figure out it's hydronephrosis and they'll ask you, uh, why is this happening? It's because uh, there's a problem with the junction between ureteral pelvic junction right we just looked at what that was uh, so it's this is the pelvis and the ureters uh, come in from there as well these things right here right so that's the problem is between the pelvis and the ureter okay so again ureteral pelvic junction last to canalize leads to congenital obstruction it can be unilateral or bilateral. Okay, it could be on one side or both sides. Most common pathologic cause of prenatal hydronephrosis detected by prenatal ultrasound. That's how you detect it. Okay, uh, so important. Uh, it's important to remember all of these. This one makes the collecting uh, duct, right? And this one makes uh, everything from glomerulus to DCT. Okay, uh, this one also makes pelvis calluses and all that. Uh, and uterine pelvic junction, if that, uh, there's a failure of that, you'll get uh, prenatal hydronephrosis. Okay, um, the Potter sequence, uh, this is important, uh, not only in renal, but also for uh, congenital anomaly in a child or infant, right? Uh, so oligohydroaminos, uh, so let's see if there's a photo of that so we can better understand it. Okay, so I guess we'll just use this. Okay. Uh, so oligohydroaminos that's just uh lack of amino acids uh sorry <laughs> amnion fluid not amino acids 
right? Uh, placenta disease that is characterized by a deficiency of amniotic fluid sometimes resulting in uh, where to go? Sometimes resulting in an embryonic defect through adherence between this and this. Okay, so what this is is this fluid right here in the amnion sac. It's uh, less. Okay, why? Because the fetus is able to uh, swallow it, but it's not able to pee it out, right? So it's not able to excrete the amnion fluid, and that's usually how it functions, right? So when that doesn't happen, the amnion fluid decreases in the sac. That leads to, um, uh, that's called oligohydroaminos. And what that does is it causes compression of developing fetus, okay? And this is going to lead to many defects. So you're going to have a limb deformity because everything's getting compressed inwards, right? Because it acts as cushioning and buffer and everything like that. So it's going to lead to limb deformities. It's going to lead to facial anomalies, for example, low set ears and retrognathia. That's uh, this thing right here, right? Uh, backward uh, placement of the mandible. Uh, you have flattened nose, okay, because uh, it's getting pressed in. Compression of chest and lack of amniotic fluid aspiration into fetal lungs, okay. So even though all the fluid is going inwards, what's happening is uh, there's already increased resistance, right, in the lungs. And whatever it was able, capable of taking in, it's getting pushed in on, on the chest as well. Right, so now it's there's increase in resistance for that as well. So due to the compression of chest, right? So that's gonna lead to pulmonary hypoplasia because if it's not getting stimulated by any amount of uh, amniotic fluid, uh, you know, there's no need for the lungs then. So it's not gonna develop properly. And uh, this is usually the cause of death because of that, okay? It's caused by chronic placental insufficiency or reduced renal output, okay? So it can either happen because of this. This is a extra renal uh, thing, right? But the renal thing is this right here. So, or reduced renal output, including autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, obstructive uropathy, for example, posterior urethral valves or uh, bilateral uh, renal agenesis. Okay, so they're just telling you why uh, there could be renal, uh, reduced renal output, right? So it could be because of this or an obstructive uropathy like posterior urethral valves. So to understand that, we need to know where that is. Okay, so right there. Uh, so that would be right there, uh, posterior urethral valves, right? Uh, and bilateral renal agenesis, we know how that happens, right? We just read it over here, renal agenesis. When there's uh, aberrant interaction between two tissues, aberrant just means, uh, you know, a lesion. Uh, not the same or some kind of difference there or something like that. So abnormal, aberrant is abnormal. Okay, um, between metanephric and uh, ureteric bud. Okay, so it could be because of that. Uh, easy way to remember it is there's an acronym of Potter for Potter sequence. Okay. Uh, it's associated with pulmonary hypoplasia, P for pulmonary hypoplasia, oligohydraminos, this is the trigger. Uh, you have twisted face, uh, twisted skin, extremity defects, and renal failure in utero. So it's very important that you know this. Uh, they do test you on this a lot, okay? Uh, the questions will have like, um, uh, fetus that was uh, recently born, uh, has a difficulty in breathing or, you know, um, 
the Aptar score has not improved uh, and has like club feet or rocker bottom feet or something like that, right? That's because of, uh, you know, extremity uh, defects or something like that. Um, it's all pointing towards the Potter sequence. Uh, so you need to know um, what that is. And then they'll ask you what is the cause of this. So it could be anything uh, in the option that's from these three or you know, something that tells you that it's, there is an obstruction or oligohydrolinos, okay? Um, the twisted face, you gotta remember what that was. It's low set ears and retognathia and flat nose. Okay. And yeah, that's it. For that. Uh, horseshoe kidney. So you have a horseshoe kidney right there, uh, aorta with uh, IVC, ureter, and inferior mesenteric artery. Inferior poles of both kidneys fuse abnormally. As they ascend from pelvis during fetal development, horseshoe kidneys get trapped under uh, inferior metanephric artery and remain low in the abdomen. Kidney can function normally, but associated with hydronephrosis. For example, ureteral uh, pelvic junction obstruction, uh, renal stones, infection, and increased risk of renal ca cancer. Higher incidence in chromosomal aneuploidy, uh, for example, Turner syndrome or trisomies 13, 18, that's Patel's and... Uh, Edwards and Down syndrome 21 right okay uh, for this you need to know uh, you need to be able to identify it on an x-ray okay so let's look at a few more x-rays for that uh, not x-ray sorry scans You can see the thing, right? Uh, for this, you also need to, you know, know what a normal kidney scan looks like. So kidney over there, kidney over there, right? But the renal pelvis right there and attachments over there. Okay. Right there, right there. This is contrast. Over there and there. Uh, that's a uh, cancer growth. Okay, kidney, 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 kidney. Cool. I think that's good enough. Okay. Uh, important thing to remember: it gets trapped under uh, inferior meson meson uh, mesenteric artery. Okay. So while it's you know coming upwards. Uh, because that's what it does during development, right? As they ascend from the pelvis uh, and during fetal development, it gets trapped over there because it's not detached yet. Uh, and however, they do function normally, but it's associated with hydronephrosis. So remember that along with this uh, utero pelvic junction failure, aberrant interactions, or whatever. Okay. Moving on. Congenital solitary functioning kidney. Kidney, uh, sorry, condition of being born with only one functioning kidney, majority asymptomatic with compensatory hypertrophy of contralateral kidney, but anomalies in contralateral kidney are common, often diagnosed prenatally via ultrasound. Okay. Uh, so you can have unilateral renal agenesis. This is Uteric bud fails to develop, right? So let's bring this down here. Okay, so uteric bud fails to develop and induce differentiation of metanephric uh, mesenchyme, right? So complete absence of kidney and ureters. Okay, uh, do we remember what both of these make? Right, we remember ureteric uh, bud makes what? It makes the ureters, 
the pelvis, the callus, and the just uh, collecting tubules, right? And the metanephric makes everything from glomerulus to the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so absence of kidney because of that, and ureters because of the ureteric bud, right? Uh, you can have a uh, multicystic dysplastic kidney. Uh, let's see what that is. Okay. It's that. Okay. Uh, it's ureteric bud develops but fails to induce differentiation of metanephric mesenchyme. So you have non functional kidney consisting of cysts and connective tissue. Predominantly, it's non-hereditary uh, and usually unilateral. Bilateral leads to Potter sequence. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it fails to induce differentiation. That's the battle of that. Okay. So it leads to non-functional kidney. Duplex con collecting system. Okay. Uh, that's. Uh, look at that. Okay, so that's what it is. You have two ureters. Okay, duplex system with upper pole obstruction, secondary to ureterus feel, pole, lower pole. Okay, so it's bifurcation of ureteric bud before it enters the metanephric blastema. Created creates a Y-shaped bifid uh, ureter. So instead of this whole separate unit, uh, these two will fuse down here. Okay. So, like that, or hmm. I guess they don't fuse them. Okay, yeah, that's incomplete duplication, the unfused one. This is inverted Y, and this is duplex kidney. Okay. Uh, so bifurcation of ureteric bud before it enters the metanephric um, blastema creates a Y-shaped uh, bifid ureter. So before it enters this, right? Before this thing enters this, it's going to be two. So it's going to be like that and like that. That's what that's talking about. Okay. And Duplex collecting system can alternatively occur through two ureteric buds reaching and interacting with metanephric blastema. Strongly associated with uh, vesicoureteral reflux and or uh, ureteral obstruction. Increased risk of UTIs frequently presents with hydronephrosis. Uh, so that's important. Um, that's important. And... Uh, this as well okay so all of these are there uh, high risks for in duplex collecting system especially this I think they'll test you on that and this as well so hydronephrosis we have three things now right that we need to remember for that one uh, posterior urethral valves membrane remnant and posterior prosthetic uh, urethra in males its persistence can lead to urethral obstruction. Diagnosed uh, prenatally by bilateral hydronephrosis and dilated of or thick walled bladder on ultrasound. Severe obstruction in fetus associated with oligohydraminose, most common cause of bladder or outlet obstruction in male infants. Okay, so in normal, this is the kidney, ureter, bladder, and urethra. So in hydrosaminos, uh, you can have that. Why? Because there's some kind of blockage down here, right? Uh, or right there, urethra obstructed by this and this. So how do you know where the blockage is uh, that's causing hydronephrosis, right? So let's say the blockage was here, right? Uh, then what's going to happen? What you'll see, you'll see all of this. You'll see hydronephrosis, you'll see hydro ureters. But what you won't see is a hypertrophic bladder wall, right? Uh, and that will tell you that 
uh, it's normal here however it's not normal there but if the obstruction is down here you'll see this along with uh, hydrotroph uh, hypertrophic uh, bladder wall right uh, that's it so you have to be able to differentiate where the obstruction is if it's over here the obstruction then this is you're not going to see hydro ureter or uh, urinary reflux or whatever right uh, also if there's a problem with the valve here uh, the slits uh, that's this thing okay so vesicle ureteral uh, reflux this is retrograde flow of urine from bladder towards upper urinary tract can be primary due to abnormal insufficient insertion of the ureter within the vesicular wall so you have the utero vesicle junction or secondary due to abnormally high bl bladder pressure resulting in retrograde flow via the uvj increased risk of recurrent utis uh, so let's look at that I'm gonna help. Uh, normally they sh uh, ask you about inside the bladder. Okay, I'm not finding it right now. So it's some they'll show you a slit like this in the thing in the bladder. Okay. So one more time. Uh retrograde flow of urine from bladder towards upper this thing, right? Um No, we need to see it. Let me see if Google has anything. I guess it's not important then. Maybe it's just in my head. Uh, secondary due to abnormally high bladder pressure resulting in retrograde flow. So how do you differentiate this from uh, an opening, right? Or the obstruction. Uh, they'll ask you about this and you won't have the hypertrophy bladder wall. Okay. Uh, that's the main thing because any amount of pressure will just lead to the urine going upwards and backwards right which is known as the retrograde flow uh, vesicle is the bladder ureteral is the ureter right moving on uh, renal anatomy so renal blood flow okay you have the renal vein here the renal artery the segmental artery here the interlobar which is different than interlobular. Okay, so lobar comes first, and then uh, as you go longer into it, you have the longer one, which is interlobular artery, right? That's a longer name than lobar. Uh, the attachments between the interlobar uh, lobar are arcuate arteries, okay? Uh, okay, so got that. You have the arcuate vein, just like that, interlobar vein, and renal vein over there. Okay. Uh, this is important right here. The afferent arterial, glomerulus, efferent arterial, and peritubial tubular capillaries. Right. The capillaries surrounding this, that's actually absorbing stuff from the collecting duct and everywhere else. Okay, so left renal of vein receives two additional veins the left suprarenal and uh, left gonadal vein okay uh, need to note this so let's have a look at that
Okay. So this is what it looks like basically. It's coming from uh, this vein is coming from the kidney. However, this vein, left renal vein, is also coming from the gonadal vein, uh, the gonad, right, or the left gonad actually, like that. Uh, that's an ovarian vein. So ovarian vein in that uh, left gonadal vein right there. Okay. Whereas on the right side it goes directly into it. Uh, and you only get the kidneys coming in from here. Okay. So left suprarenal and left gonadal vein on the left side. Renal medulla receives significantly less blood flow through the renal cal uh, cortex. This makes medulla very sensitive right, uh, to hypoxia and vulnerable to ischemic damage, just like a watershed area. But this is not watershed. It's, however, very sensitive to hypoxia. Okay. Uh, so you need to remember that medulla. Okay. Uh, left kidney is taken during li living donor transplantation because it has a longer renal vein. Uh, cool. They'll ask you why it was taken from there. It's because it's longer. Uh, glomerular anatomy. Okay, so we have afferent arterioles. Afferent is the one coming in. Efferent is the one going out. Okay, uh, you have juxtaglomerular cells, the macula densa. This is like the sensing of uh, the sodium in the urine or the blood, right? The blood levels, not the urine, uh, coming in. And that's how it does renin secretion and all that over here. Okay, uh, you have convoluted tubule. Uh, endothelial cells and efferent arterioles, Bowman capsule, um, potocyte, basement, and this. Let me see if we can get, grab a scan for this as well. Okay, so. I'll try and see if there's a better one. Uh, that works. We'll just work with this one. Ugh. Uh, you need to be able to read the scans because that's how you uh, sometimes they test you with the nephrotic and nephritic. Okay, so just uh, easy way to remember. So these things that you're seeing are podocytes, right? Uh, that's really important for nephrotic syndrome. Okay, and those are these things on the edges that you're seeing. Okay, so podocytes are those. Okay. Uh, that's basically what you need to figure out. And then this glomerular basement membrane, it's going to be thick or small, uh, or atrophied or something like that, right? So you need to be able to see an intact one. And if it's anything different than that, that means there's something going on over there. Okay. Uh, and that's basically what you need to be able to figure out in a, from a scan. Uh, that would be the efferent artery right there. Okay. M is, I guess, macula. Right? Because it looks like a macula right there. So that would be the macula. Not really important when you're trying to look at a electron microscope scan. Right? And, yeah. So, we need to know what Podocytes are and where the glomerular basement membrane is to identify that. Okay, uh, there's the Bowman capsule, the basement membrane is right there, and these are the mesangial cells. Okay. Uh, 
just quickly uh, we'll go over this during the somewhere in the chapter but when this comes in with higher pressure right it's going to push the fluid inwards okay when there's a uh, low oncotic pressure here uh, it's going to push uh, the fluids get going to get pulled in e in here right when there's increased amount of pressure here it's going to make uh, the net uh, gradient go towards this so there'll be less GFR because of that and less oncotic pressure over here will make the fluid get pulled into the blood vessel right and towards that way and we'll do that during the thing okay the course of the ureters so this is important uh, as long as you remember this you don't need to worry about everything else because that's basically how you'll remember everything so water which are water because ureters hold the water or the urine uh, flow over the iliacs okay and under the bridge the bridge are the uterine arteries and vas deferens okay so just keep that in the back of your head and we'll read this and it'll come here Uh, course of the ureter arises from renal pelvis, travels under gonadal arteries over common iliac artery, right? So it goes over the iliacs, so that's the common iliac arteries, and under the uterine artery and vas deferens, uh, retroperitoneal, like that one. Okay, uh, so it's over there, that's what I mean. Uh, Gynecologic procedures, for example, ligation of uterine or uh, ovarian vessels. So during these procedures, it may damage the ureter, right? Uh, uteral obstruction or leak. That's what it leads to. Okay. Uh, bladder contraction compresses the intramural ureter and preventing urine reflux. Okay. Uh, well we'll look at this when we are reading repro uh it comes there as well so it's better you'll have a better understanding over there um bladder contraction compresses the intramural ureter okay uh preventing urine reflux uh this is important because when this doesn't happen that's when you get this uh vesicle ureteral reflux all right um I'm going to mute someone here. Okay. Uh, blood supply to ureter. So proximal renal arteries. Middle is gonadal artery, aorta, common and internal iliac arteries. Um, Mom, I'm going to mute you. Okay. It keeps getting unmuted. Okay, I'm not able to meet you. Can you mute yourself? Mom said the key. Okay, I guess I'll have to just do that then. Uh, Okay, so back to this. Uh, blood supply to the ureter. So you have uh, the ureter going from the kidneys to the bladder, right? Uh, was it quiet? Uh, no, someone has a noise. Yeah, I'm not able to... I'm not able to mute them, and I don't think they're paying attention. Okay, if next time you say I cannot do this, you cannot do this, maybe you should just remove it. Okay, there you go. It's muted now. Okay, uh, blood supply to the ureter. So you have three parts here, right? Uh, the proximal part would be the one near the kidney, and uh, this the part is near the bladder. Uh, the proximal renal arteries are the one that supplies this ureter over here, 
Actually, I should make this yellow. Okay. Uh, let's do. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay, uh, so this one is going to get supplied by the renal arteries. Okay. Get red. Uh, the middle part is going to get supplied by the gonadal arteries. Um, aorta, common, and internal iliac arteries. Okay, so common and internal, both iliac arteries are going to supply the middle part. Uh, aorta is involved in that and gonadal artery as well. So, actually, you know what? I'll see if there is a photo for this. It's going to be better. Okay, let's see that. Okay, better. So renal arteries for the proximal ureter. Uh, for the middle one, you have gonadal and aorta, like that. Also, you have a little bit of uh, common iliac and internal iliac supplying the middle part. You know, the distal middle and the proximal middle. And then the distal part is supplied by the internal uh, iliac and superior vesicle. Okay, vesicle is again a bladder. So superior vesicle over there and internal iliac as well. Okay. Uh, so three points of ureteral uh, obstruction, ureteral pelvic junction, pelvic inlet, and ureteral vesicle junction. Okay, so the obstruction can happen anywhere over here. So this is, uh, you know, obstruction here. Let's do that. So. That's the ureteral pelvic junction right there. The pelvic inlet is right here, right where it goes inside the pelvis. Uh, and then the junction right here where the slits are, the ureteral vesicle junction, okay? Uh, so Imper know that. So yeah, you're trying uh, artery coming in like that. You have the ureter coming in like that. Median umbilical ligament, vas deferens, uh, going from behind the bladder over there. The ureter gets, uh, there's the ureteral orifice right there, the slits that I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, this is the trigon, this is the prostate. Okay. And the internal ureteral orifice. Okay, so just revision. Uh, Course of ureter it arises from renal pelvis, travels under gonadal artery. Okay, so it goes under the ar gonadal artery. Uh, that's this artery right here, so it's going to travel from under it. Okay, uh, over the uh, iliac artery. So let me make an iliac artery. Okay, so it goes over the iliac artery. Right. And then under the uterine artery and vas deferens. Okay. Uh, it's important to know this. Uh, if you just remember this, you don't have to bother with this because you can answer questions just with this. So water flows over the iliacs and under the bridge. The bridge is uterine artery and uh, vas deferens. So this is the bridge and the water are the ureters. Okay, and the water goes over the iliacs. The blood supply, I remember that. So proximal part is renal arteries, middle part is gonadal and aorta, and the distal middle part is uh, common and internal iliac arteries. And the distal part takes, you know, uh, from the internal iliac arteries and also from the bladder, which is superior vesicle arteries. Okay, on to physiology. Uh, fluid compartments. Uh, so, 
here you have a person. Let's make a person. Okay. Uh, so the mass of this person is 70 kilograms. Okay. Uh, the total body water of that 70 kilogram is going to be 60% uh, of the body mass, which is 42 kilograms, right? Or 42 liters. And anything that's not water, like bones and muscles, is going to be 28 kilograms of mass. Okay? In a 70 kilo person. So 60% of that and 40% of that. Okay. I think we can finish. Uh, extracellular fluid, uh, this is one third, and the intracellular is gonna be two third. Okay. Uh, so 20% of uh, 70 kilograms uh, is gonna make up the extracellular fluid, and 40% of that is gonna make up uh, intracellular fluid. So if you add those up, you're gonna get 60% of that whatever that is right which is 42 okay so if you add up 28 plus 14 uh, then you have interstitial fluid in the extracellular fluid uh, you have 75 percent which is approximately 10.5 or 10.5 kilograms uh, liters or kilograms right um, plasma is 25% of this, right? So 25% of 14, uh, you get 3.5 kilograms or 3.5 liters. And RBC volume is 2.8, which is uh, from this thing, okay? Uh, six liters is what they're talking about, okay? Uh, so normal hematocrit is 45. So heck and high K, uh, high potassium intracellular. So you follow the 60, 40, 20 rule. Okay. So 60 of body mass, uh, 40 for intracellular of the body mass and 24 uh, of the total body mass for extracellular. So percent of body weight for average person. 60% total body water. 40% is ICF mainly composed of potassium, magnesium, organic phosphates, for example, ATP. 20% uh, ECF, mainly composed of sodium, chlorine, bicarbonate, and albumin. Plasma volume can be measured by radio labeling albumin. Uh, that's important, you need to remember that. We use uh, radio labeled uh, albumin to measure the plasma volume. Extracellular volume can be measured by inulin or mannitol. That's important. For extracellular, we use inulin or mannitol uh, to measure the extracellular volume. Uh, the serum osmolality is between 275 to 295 uh, milliosmoles per kilogram of H2O. Plasma volume is equal to total body volume uh, times 1 minus hematocrit. Uh, this is an important formula that you need to remember. Uh, all the other stuff doesn't really matter that much. This is the one that you need to remember mostly. Because they'll give you the body volume and they'll give you the hematocrit. And then they'll ask you about the plasma volume. Okay. Or they'll give you this and this and they'll ask you about this. Okay. Uh... Glomerular filtration barrier. This is endothelial cell pore, uh, glomerular basement membrane, uh, have foot podocytes and foot podocytes over there. It's response. So why is that important? So first of all, glomerular filtration barrier. This barrier made from the glomerular basement membrane and foot podocyte. They're responsible for filtration of plasma according to size and charge selectivity. Okay, it's composed of fenestrated. Uh, capillary endothelium, basement membrane with type 4 collagen chains, and heparin sulfate. Vis visceral epithelial layer consisting of uh, podocyte foot processes. Okay, the visceral level have, uh, layers have that. It's towards the outside. Okay, uh, the charger barrier. 
glomerular filtration barrier contains negatively charged glycoproteins that prevent entry of negatively charged molecules like albumin. Okay, so if this is negative and the albumin is negative, that should tell you that albumin does not get leaked out and that's why uh, if there is some kind of leakage over there, then there's problem with the barrier. So size barrier, fenestrated capillary endothelium prevents entry of more than uh, 100 nanometer molecules uh, blood cells per blood cells. Potocyte foot processes interpose with glomerular basement membrane, slit diaphragm, prevents entry of molecules more than 40 to 50 nm. How much time? Five minutes, okay. So this is the basement membrane. That's what they're talking about, right? Uh, it's negatively charged, okay? Uh, to prevent a negatively charged uh, albumin from leaking out or anything else that's negatively charged. What else is negatively charged? RBCs, right? Uh, RBCs are negatively charged as well. That's why when you have inflammation and all the cytokines get attached to these RBCs, uh, they reduce the negative charge that causes the agglutination or, you know, aggregation of RBC, increasing your hematocrit. And so in ER, uh, the erythrocyte sedimentary rate will increase because of that and inflammation. Okay. So albumin is negatively charged. So that's what we look for in nephrotic or kidney diseases. If you have that, uh, that means something's wrong with this. And then there are certain things that can do that. And that's known as the nephrotic syndrome. Uh, okay. Now a size barrier, it's fenestrated. That's just net like uh, capillary endothelium. It prevents the entry of anything um, more than 100 nanometer molecules. Uh, blood blood cells okay uh, potocyte foot processes they interpose okay so these things uh, are foot processes right there or this right here right so they interpose with uh, glomerular basement membrane actually this is the foot parasite not that okay and uh, those are the endothelial cell pores so these green stuff. Okay, uh, fenestrated uh, potocyte foot process interposed with glomerular basement membrane, uh, slit diaphragm, diaphragm, and prevents entry of molecules more than 40 to 50 nanometers. So, yeah, right there. So let's look at the this thing right here. Okay, so. If it gets through this, it's not going to get through this because this one is smaller. This is 40 to 50 and this is uh, anything more than 100. It's going to prevent it. And this is going to prevent anything more than 40 to 50. Okay, 40 to 50 over there. And then the endothelial cell pores that we just saw are going to prevent 100. Uh, nanometer molecules okay and that's it let's take a break and we'll continue from that after. Uh, okay we just finished that renal clearance so renal clearance equals uh, clearance of X equals a urine concentration of X times urine flow divided by plasma concentration of X okay uh, so, important formula, we've got to remember this. So, the concentration of whatever is... Concentration of whatever is in the urine times um, whatever the urine flow rate is and divided by uh, how much of the drug is in the plasma or the substance, right? Um, yeah. So... Clearance equals the volume of plasma from which the substance is completely cleared in the urine per uh, unit time, okay? If, so just to put it into graphical sense. Okay, so we have substance in the plasma, 
right um so to figure out how much is still in here we can do that or we can figure out how much clearance right either or um uh, with this formula so this is the plasma and say this is the uh renal tubules or whatever the collecting duct and the thing that comes out of the urethra okay any of that stuff uh so basically the urine right so how much of it is cleared and uh, that's what is uh, clearance of x means okay how much of it is cleared from the plasma uh, that's what this formula is about so volume of plasma from which the substance is completely cleared off so if this is the volume right and right here there is no substance in it so how much of that kind of volume without the substance is there that's what this is volume of substance from which the substance completely cleared in the urine per unit time so if it was here how much of how much time this took to go from here to here to make this completely less of that substance right so if the clearance is less than the gfr gfr is usually like 100 right so anything less than 100 that means uh, net tubular resorb reabsorption and or not freely filtered right so let's bring this over here okay uh, so when the clearance is less than 100 so it's 100 over here right um, if the net tubular resort, uh, if that happens, it means that the substance, when it travels from here to here, right? Okay, that's not going to work. From here to here, it's getting reabsorbed in the tubule. That's what it means. So even though it's getting uh, filtered 100% or 100 milligram per liter, right? Uh, it's getting reabsorbed. So it's uh, in the urine, you're only getting uh, 60 or 40 or whatever. Right, so if it's less than that, what does that mean? It means that it's getting reabsorbed in the tubule, or it could mean that it's not being able to travel this filter right here, uh, not able to get through this filter, right? So it's not freely filtered or net tubular, right? Because, and, and then that's the glomerulus, this is the proximal uh, thick ascending distal and then collecting tubule okay so it comes through so when it goes from here to here it gets in here and then comes down here and majority of the stuff gets filtered right in proximal tubule anyways so right up here and then it goes back in right so that's what it means that new tubular reabsorption is happening there or it could be that not all of it is making it through from here okay and uh, so anything less uh, than gfr is going to be that the cause of that if uh, the clearance is more than gfr that means there is hyper secretion uh, right uh, that means the net tubular secretion of x but that means is uh, you have this uh, even though it's getting uh, filtrated from here so 100 percent is getting filtered from here right because uh, gfr is 100 so 100 uh, milligram per liter or deciliter is getting filtered from here okay but how do you get a number more than 100 it's when it's also getting filtered in from here or and that's called secretion okay there's excretion secretion and filtration right three terms you need to know about Filtration is when it goes from the glomerulus into the uh, tubules. Okay, so from here to here, uh, it goes through this. That's called filtration. Excretion is what goes out from the collecting tubule. That's excretion. Secretion is the uh, secretion made by the tubules. Hold on. Someone's mowing the lawn outside. Uh, give me a sec. Okay, so yeah, so secretion is going to be uh, the things that are secreted by the tubule lining or the tubular cells, right? So it's over here and it's coming in from here. 
how does that happen it gets secreted from the uh, peritubular uh, capillaries that we saw up here right so it gets from here into this uh, it could be because of uh, increased hydrostatic pressure in the pericapillar, um, peritubular capillaries. Uh, and when there's increased hydrostatic pressure, it will move the things from here to here. Okay. Uh, where would we? Right there. Okay. So, net tubular secretion of X. So, that's how you get a number more than the GFR. And if clearance equals uh, GFR, that means there is no net secretion. So nothing is getting, you know, coming from the peritubules into the tubules or going from tubules into the uh, capillaries. Right. So whatever is coming in is getting cleared out as well. And there's one substance that does this. And that's what we use to actually figure out what the glomerular filtration rate is. Okay, uh, and we'll learn about that soon. So, inulin clearance. Okay, here we go. Lawnmower is coming back. Hold on. Okay. Uh, inulin clearance can be used to calculate GFR because it is freely filtered and is neither reabsorbed nor secreted. Okay, so we use inulin if you have the money for it, right? Uh, why? Because it, it's expensive to do this on our test. So instead of this, we actually use creatinine because it's similar. It just uh, calculates like 10% more than it is, I think, uh, which is okay. Or 2% more, I don't remember. It's, I'll tell you here. Okay, uh, so usu usually, ideally, it would be inulin that you use. So inulin clearance can be used to calculate GFR because it is freely filtered and is neither reabsorbed nor secreted, right? So it doesn't come from the peritubular into the tubular or tubular to the peritubular capillaries uh, because it's freely filtered uh, and is neither doing that or that. Okay, so uh, clearance of inulin equals GFR, which is uh, concentration of urine, uh, concentration of, uh, sorry, yeah, concentration, urine concentration of inulin times the urine flow, f flow rate divided by the plasma concentration of inulin, right? So it's this formula anyways for the clearance. Okay, uh, so... Uh, so what does this mean? This is the PGC and minus PBS and all this stuff, right? So what is that? That's actually This thing right here Okay, so I guess we'll do this while we're doing that Okay uh, So PC is glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, right? So that's uh, this thing right here, the capillary going from here to here. That's a hydrostatic pressure of this. This is the peritubular capillary now, right? Uh, going from the efferent, okay? Uh, so the hydrostatic pressure of this. So if this is increased, what's gonna happen? It's gonna push the fluid outwards right because that's what uh, hydrostatic pressure does it pushes fluid out of the uh, vessel it is in or tubule it is in right uh, a bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure is this thing right here uh, right this is the bowman space or bowman capsule is right there so hydrostatic pressure of this will do what it's going to again uh, it's going to push fluid out of the tubules into the peritubular uh, capillary so it's going to get reabsorbed into the vessel or it's going to stop the free filtration coming in from here right so pgc is going to be this way now or like the net uh, pressure is going to go into the capillary and not into the bowman's capsule okay uh, so bowman space hydrostatic pressure and then you have oncotic so oncotic pressure does what? It pulls fluid. Hydrostatic pushes the fluid out of the vessel. Oncotic pressure 
pulls the fluid uh, towards it. Okay, it's not as strong as hydrostatic, but it still has an effect. Okay, so you have oncotic pressure of the glomerular papillary over here. So if this uh, decreases like it does in uh, nephrotic syndrome, right, what's going to happen? Uh, the fluid's going to get pulled by an oncotic pressure of this. So net is going to go this way into the Bowman's capsule, right? And if uh, there is no oncotic pressure here, um, which is normal, right, uh, in a person, uh, then it gets balanced out because of the net tubular hydrostatic pressure, which is going to be more in this compared to the tubules because of our heart and not the whole system. So it's going to go this way, the net gradient this way, right, because of that. Okay, so we did that, glomerular capillary oncotic pressure, and then the oncotic pressure of the Bowman space oncotic uh, rate. Uh, normally, it equals to zero. So normally, it balances out uh, equally. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so Kf is the filtration coefficient. Uh, so the formula here is if you don't have this and you have been given these values, you can still figure it out. So they'll give you this, uh, which they have to. Uh, they'll give you three of these and then maybe you have to figure out one of them or something like that. Or they give you two of these and then you have to figure out what the net gradient for this is or some vice versa. Uh, they usually don't do that in a test because it takes time uh, for something like this because they have to give you a lot of things. And if they want to test the, your knowledge on this, it, there are easier ways to do that. Okay. Uh, normal GFR uh, is approximately 100 milliliters per minute. Creatinine uh, clearance is an approximate measure of GFR slightly overstates GFR because creatinine is moderately secreted by renal tubule. So if you're given uh, clearance of creatinine and then you're asked to guess how, what the clearance is and the options are like, you know, 60, 70, 90, 100, 102, 100 and uh, yeah, like that. You shouldn't pick the one that's 100 because it's going to be something that's above this, a slightly more than this, right? So you should pick 102 because that's the only one that's above 100. Okay. If they give you like 102 and 104 something, which they don't, uh, then you have to actually do the work and calculate it. But this is how you can save the time if you already know that it's above 100. And if there, there's usually only one option that's above 100 anyways. So you save like... 40 seconds right there okay so this is plasma creatinine uh, like that to there okay and this is glomerular, uh, glomerular filtration rate uh, which is normally here you get you know uh, stabling out right there okay so in, when it's increased uh, it has a lot of portals to go through so everything goes right through really fast and then as it uh, approaches 100 uh, it gets slower okay uh, renal blood flow autoregulation autoregulation mechanism helps maintain our constant renal blood flow and uh, GFR to protect the kidney from rapid uh, increase or decrease in renal perfusion pressure that uh, could cause renal injury or decrease glomerular filtration mechanism is myogenic increase in arterial pressure will cause increase in stretch of uh, afferent arterioles which leads to mechanical activation of vascular smooth muscles causing vasoconstriction of afferent arterioles this leads to rbf and remember uh, beta 1 also has an effect on this right so beta-1 receptors are found here so if you're giving beta-1 blockers this is going to get affected as well right uh, just real quick we'll look at that uh, 
Uh, what was it? What should I look for? It was in the... Yeah, right here. Okay, so beta-1 is in kidneys as well, right? That's what I wanted to point out. Okay, now uh, it increases renin secretion. Okay, and yeah, so beta, even though it's, if you're giving cardioselective uh, beta blockers, it will have an effect on kidney as well. Uh, so it's myogenic, right? If the pressure here is increased, uh, this is going to get sent a signal to the brain and the brain is going to send signal to vasoconstrict. Right. This is because of the stretch of afferent arterioles. Uh, mechanism mechanical activation of vascular smooth muscle causing vascular smooth muscles are the muscles inside of the vessels right we looked at an anatomy of a artery so in the middle it had a intima media and externa so media was the one with the smooth muscles uh, vasoconstriction of afferent arterial is caused by that so this gets smaller like that okay uh, tubular glomerular, so increase in NACL or tonicity of the filtrate sensed by the macular dense uh, cells. Remember I told you it senses uh, sodium, right? Uh, so increase in that, so it's going to sense that there's increased amount of sodium going through the tubules. So there's loss of uh, sodium and that's the one that, you know, determines your osmolality of the, or osmolarity of the serum or the, your body so ideally you do not want uh, a lot of sodium leaking out right because uh, wherever sodium goes that's where water goes and water is very important it's making up 60% uh, of your body right so increasing NACL or tonicity of the filtrate sensed by the macular dense cells will lead to paracrine driven vasoconstriction of afferent arterioles uh, decreasing the renal blood flow Okay, cool, makes sense. If not, uh, it should after, actually I'll just explain it real quick right here. So this is uh, afferent. Actually, wait, let's make that red. We'll make it afferent first. Yeah, afferent here. So blue is afferent and red is afferent. That's the one coming in. Okay. And then we have uh, green for glomerular or Bowman capsule or whatever. Okay. I don't know. Just cool. Uh, let's pick another color. Okay, so when blood is coming in, this is a ferrin, okay? So if there's increased amount of blood coming in, uh, it's going to have increased amount of blood going out as well, okay? That's called the renal blood flow. It flows from here into this and then out of this into this, okay? However, uh, there is auto-regulation happening here. Um, and how that happens is, one, if we uh, vasoconstrict this, okay? So now... This is going to come in, it's going to go here, and now there's going to be resistance here. So now there's going to be a backflow or like, you know, increased resistance. So the blood stays in this area a lot longer than it used to, right? And that means there's increase in GFR because of this. Because now that there's more blood here and increased amount of uh, hydrostatic pressure because of this, it's going to create a net flow into the Bowman's capsule and into the tubules, right? Uh, or 
what can happen is this increases and this decreases. Now what's happening is there's decrease in renal blood flow instead. Right. Uh, if decrease in renal blood flow. Okay. Uh, so decrease, 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 decrease. And then it comes out and then it goes in. Right. So what's going to happen to GFR? Nothing. It's going to uh, actually stay the same. It's not going to have an effect on it. Okay. However, there's decreased uh, renal blood flow now. Uh, we do this uh, in certain cases as well uh, when there's like increased amount of uh, blood pressure. Uh, this would be better to do uh, in that. Okay. Okay, so paracrine driven uh, vasoconstriction of our afferent arterial uh, leads to decrease RBF. Effective renal plasma flow. Uh, effective renal plasma flow can be estimated using para amniohyperic acid. Okay. Um, pH clearance uh, between filtration and secretion. There is nearly 100% excretion of all pH that enters kidney. Okay. So just like inulin for GFR and uh, what was the other one? Creatinine for that and uh, right. So albumin, nope. This thing, mentol and inulin for extra cellular volume and radio labeled albumin for the plasma volume. We have one for this as well. Uh, for renal blood flow, it's called the para amino acid clearance. We can determine that from that. Important to remember all of these. So there's a nearly 100% of excretion of all PAH that enters the kidney. Okay, so that uh, estimated, uh, estimated or effective, sorry, effective renal plasma flow is equal to uh, urine concentration of pH times the uh, flow rate and divided by the plasma concentration of the pH, which, equal, which gives you the clearance of this anyways. So it's the same thing. It's the clearance formula. It's nothing new. But when it comes to renal blood flow, we use uh, para amino hyperic acid. Okay. Uh, renal blood flow, it's RBF equals RBF divided by one minus hematocrit. They'll give you that, or uh, they'll give you this, and then you'll figure that out. And they'll give you that too for that. Or they might give you this, and you have to figure this out, either or. Okay. Oh. Usually 20 to 25% of the cardiac output remaining constant due to autoregulation. Uh, estimated renal plasma flow underestimates true renal plasma flow. Okay. Uh, so RPF uh, slightly so gotta remember that if they give you that if you figure this out you gotta remember that it's the true value is gonna be you know more than whatever this is uh, just like creatinine and uh, GFR okay so pH comes in over here goes through here and then from here to this and then 80% of it is secreted from the tubules into the uh, sorry, the capillaries into the tubules, and then it goes. It does uh, only twenty percent of it gets filtered through the this and eighty percent from here. So that's hundred percent altogether. Uh, filtration. So filtration fraction is equal to GFR divided by renal plasma flow. So normal filtration fraction is twenty percent. Okay. Uh, filtered load is mg over um, mg per minute equals GFR ml per minute times plasma concentration okay uh, it's 100 that's all you need to remember I don't think you need this formula GFR can be estimated with creatinine clearance 
uh, RPF is best estimated with pH clearance. Okay, uh, this is pretty handy to remember that PDA, so that's prostaglandins dilate afferent arterioles. Okay, so right here, if uh, there's prostaglandins involved, it's gonna you know it's gonna dilate this vessel this get bigger and whereas uh, angiotensin con constricts uh, efferent arterioles and ACE right, so that's easy to remember so this arterial gets smaller like that because of angiotensin 2 you have to remember these two right uh, these are your prills okay uh, we use that in uh, hypertension so when that's given, uh, you protect uh, this by doing something. We'll repeat about it. So NSAIDs. So when you give NSAIDs, what happens is there is uh, inhibition of this, right? Prostaglandins dilating, and so when you give this, it's gonna cause uh, prostaglandins uh, preferentially dilate afferent arterial, so they increase our RPF, increase GFR. So there is no net. Uh, change in filtration fraction but when you give this there will be decrease of this uh, decrease of this and no change of that okay uh, when I said when it comes in from here and uh, over here I was telling you guys when this is restricted renal blood flow is decreased right but there's no change in the GFR uh, no change compared to uh, renal blood flow but if renal blood flow is decreased, that means GFR is decreased as well. Okay. Uh, we'll do that over here. So we actually already looked at these. Let's look at that. Uh, angiotensin 2 preferentially constricts uh, efferent arterioles. So normally it will decrease, right? So if you have uh, afferent on this side, efferent on this side. And if this is inhibited, normally it's uh, open. So now when it's constricted, what's going to happen? Constrict. Angiotensin 2 preferentially constricts efferent uh, arterial, right? So when it constricts it, there's decrease in RPF, renal blood flow, right? Because it gets stuck over here. Uh, if it's stuck over here, that means there's more hydrostatic pressure pushing into the Bowman's capsule, increasing the... GFR, um, which also increases your filtration fraction, right? Uh, but if that gets inhibited, uh, we give the prills in this during hydros, uh, hypertension, right? So it flows right through. Okay, so it doesn't get hung up here and, you know, it doesn't create more pressure on this uh, to cause arterial, uh, renal arterial stenosis. That's how it happens. Because this thing keeps pushing and just like any muscle, uh, doing resistance training will cause increase in the muscle or hypertrophy of the muscle, right? So that's how you get the stenosis. So to prevent that, we give this uh, in that, okay? Uh, also, prills are uh, renal protective in diabetes, so you can give it in that as well. If you have diabetes and hypertension, it's preferred that you give like Remipril or something. Okay, uh, so let's put a block here. Let's close that off, let's close that off and see if you can get it. Okay, uh, so GFR, renal blood flow, or plasma flow, and uh, filtration fraction. Okay, so we have uh, afferent, we have efferent, and then we have glomerular. Over here with the plasma, uh, basement membrane and the Bowman's capsule. Okay, so if the afferent arterial is... Uh, constriction has happened so like this what's happening to the 
renal plasma flow is going to be decreased, right? But when it goes from here, compared to this, this is decreased as well, right? Because uh, compared to normal GFR, right? So I guess it would be decreased. Renal plasma flow is decreased and filtration fraction is going to be increased because let's see for severe, right? GFR is decreased. Renal plasma flow is decreased and this is ink. Oh, no change. Okay. Oh, okay. So because it's because uh, GFR is, uh, I mean, FF is GFR over RPF. So if this is like uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.2, because normal is 1 and normal is 1. So if it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it's still 1. So no change in that. Okay. Filtration fraction. Right. So filtration fraction, I think we'll see where it changes. Actually, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, so efferent arterial constriction. Now this time we are doing this. So when uh, blood comes in, right? And then uh, it stays here. And then when it's going here, it's getting black flow. So you have increase in GFR and Renal blood flow is decreased now because it's not going through, right? So, renal blood flow is going to decrease and GFR is going to increase. Filtration fraction, so you have bigger number on top and lesser number on bottom, 0 0.5. That will equal to a bigger number, right? So, it's going to increase, okay? Because of that, okay. Uh, increase in plasma protein concentration, so there is more things pulling in here, right? So plasma onco uh, oncotic pr pressure will increase that. So when it increases, GFR should go down, uh, right? Because it's going to create more turbulence. If this is uh, protein, right? If you have more of these, it's going to cause, you know, it's going to stop the thing from going in right because this stays on the it gets uh, rejected from the thing because it's negatively charged and the Bowman's capsule or the glomerular filtration uh, sorry basement membrane is also negative and foot potocyte is negative so it prevents the going from that in this so if you have increased amount of this it's going to cause turbulence and uh, I'm lacking on words right now it's going to prevent it from going in, right? So it's going to decrease GFR. Uh, renal blood flow, it's going to increase it or no effect on it. Not sure about that. GFR decreases it. Okay. Renal blood flow, no change. Yeah, there you go. So no change in renal blood flow uh, or plasma flow, right? So what's happening to this? So the number on top is going down, uh, right? So 0 0.5 over 1. So you get a number that's low, right? So you should have lower filtration rate. Uh, decrease in plasma protein concentration. Okay, so if you have decrease in that, that means there's going to be hyperfiltration now, right? So increase in GFR, uh, no change in RPF. Well, you, you have a bigger number on top and same number at the bottom. So you have increase in filtration fraction. Okay. Uh, what about constriction of the ureter? Okay. What's that going to do? So remember the tubules go from, uh, from proximal to collecting duct and then from collecting duct goes into the ureters. Right, so uh, if there is a constriction of the ureters, what's going to happen? It's going to do a backflow of collecting duct into the backup of tubules and backup of Bowman capsule stuff. So it's going to increase Bowman capsules hydrostatic pressure, right? So if that increases, uh, it's going to do what? It's going to push the fluid out into the capillaries, right? So that means there will be decrease in GFR. 
um, it's going to cause more resistance, so decrease in RPF, I think, or no change, okay, no change in RPF, so RPF only uh, changes when the capillaries are constricting, so that's it, uh, otherwise there's no change in RPF, and no matter which one's constricting, RPF is always going to decrease. Okay, uh, so no change in RPF because of that. And what's happening to the filtration fraction is going to decrease, right? Why? Because GFR is decreased and no change in RPF. So lower number on top gives you a lower number, right? So decrease. Uh, dehydration, that's decrease in renal plasma flow as well, right? Uh, Decrease in renal plasma flow will increase GFR. Uh, so decrease in that will increase. Okay, it in decreases GFR. All okay. oh, right, because you're always calling it relative to the RPF. Got it. Because uh, compared to the RPF, GFR is reduced as well, right? However, it's not. It is increased a little, but not as much as it's decreased, right? And that's why there are two arrows here and one arrow here. So you have a bigger number on top, lower number on bottom. So you have increase in filtration rate. Right? So that's why I was thinking increase in GFR. Okay. Hopefully that's cleared. Next. Calculation of reabsorption and secretion rate. Uh, filtered load equals GFR times um, plasma concentration or what is this uh, okay of x okay excretion rate is equal to urine flow times uh, urine concentration of the substance or x uh, reabsorption rate equals filtered minus excreted okay reabsorption rate is equal to whatever is being filtered and whatever is uh, yeah that's easy to remember because say this is the tubio right and collecting duct tubio is still collecting duct okay so you have this so the reabsorption rate is whatever is coming in and getting reabsorbed from the tubules right if it's here it's getting reabsorbed from there right so how do we figure that out? So we figure out how much is going into it. So how much is filtered inwards and how much is coming out, right? So if 100% is going in and only 50% is going out, that means 50% of it went somewhere and it it went into the, uh-oh, I think I broke it. Let me just try again. Uh, it's going into the, pericapillary uh, tubular capillaries right okay uh, and secretion rate is whatever was excreted minus whatever was filtered okay and that's how you know how much was added to it okay secretion is how much came from uh, the capillaries into the tubules directly without being filtered from the Bowman's capsule okay and uh, FENA is fractional excretion of sodium. Okay, so FENA is equal to uh, this is important when we're doing uh, acute tubular or uh, injuries and all that stuff. So FENA, this is fractional excretion of sodium. So how much sodium was excreted minus how much of it was filtered. So say if it was uh, excreted. Uh, 80 and it was only filtered 50 right so 80 subtract 50 gives you 30 so 30 of it came from in here right so that's how you get FENA of 30 uh, just example right so any excreted is equal to well flow of the urine times how much uh, concentration of 
uh, the substances in the urine divided by GFR how much of filtered is divided by GFR times how much of it was in the plasma which equals to uh, that right because uh, we use creatinine for that stuff so plasma concentration of creatinine times uh, plasma concentration of sorry urine concentration of sodium divided by urine concentration of creatinine times the plasma concentration of the sodium where GFR is equal to this is the formula urine concentration of uh, creatinine times uh, the flow of the never mind yeah this is just the GFR the urine times urine flow divided by the plasma okay uh, just keep this in mind I don't think you need the formula you just need to understand what this is FENA okay. how much of it was excreted divided by how much of it was filtered will give you how much was secrete uh, yeah okay secreted I guess wait I did a secretion one but not this hold on so how much and so say 50 came out and 100 was filtered then it's 50 or 100 so half of it is filtered okay we'll do this when we come to that portion to better understand it uh, glucose clearance glucose at a normal plasma level uh, which is range is uh, 60 to 120 milligrams per deciliter is completely reabsorbed in the proximal tubules right almost everything gets reabsorbed here including urea Okay. Uh, and glucose so glucose at plasma level normal plasma level ranges from 60 to 120 why is there such a wide difference uh, we'll talk about that too so wait never mind I was thinking of something else okay so normal plasma level for glucose is 60 to 120 right it is uh, completely reabsorbed in proximal convoluted tubule by sodium uh, glucose co-transport, that's SGLT, remember, from uh, endo when we did glucose transporters. Uh, in adults, so you have SGLT in intestine and uh, kidneys. Those are the only two places I think we had it. Uh, let me check actually let's do a recall to that okay uh, kidney and small intestine that's where it is Uh, in adults at plasma glucose of about 200 uh, this is important remember that uh, this is how glucose gets transferred in the PCT is important uh, we also have drugs that affect this right the flozins one the ones that flow right through the kidneys okay uh, in adults at um, plasma glucose of approximately 200 milligram per deciliter glucose urea begins or threshold at rate of approximately 375 milligram per minute all transporters are fully saturated okay. so that this is what they're talking about so you have 0 to 800 plasma glucose okay and you have 0 to 600 for glucose transporter so I have glucose transporter and this amount and then plasma glucose here so when the plasma glucose rises up till like here uh, which is like 60 to 120 uh, there are enough uh, transporters to effectively reabsorb them right so you're not going to excrete anything right because this is excreted so you're not excreting anything uh, with that you're reabsorbing almost all the glucose because not all the transporters are being saturated yet 
okay it's when you start approaching 200 that uh, the transporters start getting overwhelmed now it's getting saturated uh, so that's why it's not getting you know uh, over here the filtered so that's why you start it starts showing up in the uh, urine okay so glucose transporter gets uh, saturated over here starts getting saturated over here and by the time it reaches 300 right so 300 right here uh, or 375 at the rate of 375 all transports are fully saturated so everything is saturated over there so nothing is going to get reabsorbed from this point onwards right that's why you're getting it like you know over here it's close to this but anyways uh, almost nothing is going to get more reabsorbed than this that's what it's saying okay uh, important to know things over here oh, hold on. important things to know over here is that plasma glucose uh, it start you start getting glucose in your urine after there's plasma concentration of more than 200 milligram per deciliter and uh, at 375 it gets fully saturated all the transporters okay normal pregnancy or uh, this is known as TM okay and that's right over there normal pregnancy is associated with increase in GFR with increase in filtration of all substances including glucose the glucose threshold occurs at lower plasma glucose concentration so normal pregnancy is associated with increase in gfr okay that's important to know you need to know that uh with increase in filtration of all substances including glucose so everything gets filtered a lot more there's hyper filtration the glucose threshold occurs at a lower level so the threshold over here is for this then it's going to get lowered like that instead so if you start getting more uh, say your plasma level is like 120 I guess it's going to start showing up glucose is going to start showing up in the urine as well okay uh, so normal pregnancy is associated with increase in GFR with increase in filtration of all substances including glucose the glucose threshold occurs at lower plasma glucose concentration which leads to glucosuria at normal plasma glucose levels. Sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitor, the ones flows in, right, I told you, because uh, they flow through the kidneys. Uh, it's a diabetic drug, uh, we read it over in an endo. Uh, it results in glucosuria at plasma level less than 200. So now, if you're taking these drugs, you'll start seeing glucose in the urine even before it reaches 200. Okay. Uh, glucosuria is, a, is an important clinical clue to diabetes mellitus. Okay. Uh, for that, uh, you don't look at this, and they're talking about this thing. Okay. Uh, sl Splayed phenomenon. So what is flame phenomenon? So it's when this threshold where it's fully saturated, right? Uh, TM for glucose is reached gradually, right? Gradually because uh, rather than sharply due to the heterogeneity of the nephrons. That is different uh, threshold points or saturation point for each nephron. And there are thousands of nephrons in your body, right? Or in your kidneys alone. Okay, so uh, it's represented by the portion of the titration curve between the threshold and TM. Okay, so between this and this point right here. So they might tell you why does it take, uh, why is there a curve between these lines uh, when they're talking about uh, saturation or a line that's, you know, not going straight up. And instead, it's going this way. It's because uh, there are different 
saturation points in each nephron and you have a lot of nephrons in your kidneys so you, all you can do is estimate it right and you don't have an absolute but you can't have an absolute because of that okay okay you finish that uh, nephron transport physiology okay so proximate convoluted tubule uh, early PCT contains brush border it reabsorbs all the glucose and amino acids and most of bicarbonate sodium chloride potassium and phosphate and h2o and uric acid this is the important one right here uh, also these uh, this is the only place where amino acids get reabsorbed and glucose as well uric acid gets absorbed mostly over here but it also gets absorbed down here as well okay Uh, isotonic uh, absorption okay so it keeps the concentration or osmolarity or osmolarity is the same between the tubules and the other one as well okay uh, the capillary so it's isotonic absorption it generates and secretes uh, NH3 uh, ammonia which enables the kidney to secrete more H ions. Okay. How does it do that? We'll look at that too. Um, PTH uh, inhibits sodium phosphate co-transporters, uh, which increases uh, phosphate excretion, right? PTH is also known as phosphate thrashing hormone, right? It uh, reduces that. So that's how it does it. It inhibits the sodium phosphate co-transporter. Then angiotensin II, it stimulates uh, sodium hydrogen exchange. So it increases sodium and H2O and bicarbonate reabsorption, permitting contraction alkalosis. Okay. Uh, 65 to 80% of sodium in H2O is reabsorbed over here. So we have the brush water right here. Um, SGLT right there. So when you have flozins or SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, it's going to block this. So you won't have glucose coming in and it will go through that over here. Okay, so normally it does that right there sugar, amino acids, and that, right? What does angiotensin do? It creates, uh, it acts on the sodium hydrogen exchange. So it takes in the sodium. And takes out the hydrogen, right? <clears throat> it increases sodium hydrogen and bicarbonate reabsorption. So sodium comes in wherever sodium comes in, water follows, right? And that the H will combine with HCO3, creating H2O, H2CO3, uh, and carbonic anhydrase will convert it to carbon dioxide and water. And then carbon dioxide and water gets readmitted into the tubule, uh, into the brush border, right? Uh, right, into the uh, tubule. So this is the tubule and this is the blood, I guess. That's what it is. Oh, wait, no. This is the urine. Okay. And this is the blood. And this is the tubule, the brush border. Okay, got it. Uh, important thing here to know, uh, sodium, uh, about 60 to 80% of it comes here. It is water permeable, okay? Because there are some parts that are not permeable to water. So this is water permeable. Uh, it takes in sugar and amino acid, uric acid, and 60 to 80% uh, of the sodium. And then we have thin descending, right? So that's this bit right here. Thin descending uh, loop of Henle passively reabsorbs H2O, okay? Uh, via medullary hypertonicity. It's impermeable to sodium. Uh, concentrating segment makes urine hypertonic. That means it makes it more concentrated. It makes the urine more concentrated. Why? Because you're taking in water out of the tubules into the blood, right? So when you take water out of something, uh, 
and see this is the why the sodium right there right and this is the tubule and you take water molecules out of it that means while there were four molecules in uh, say one liter of water now there are four molecules in 100 ml of water so it's more concentrated that way and that's called hypertonic right so that's what they're saying so passively reabsorbs water so when it reabsorbs water it makes the urine more concentrated by medullary hypertonic Tonicity impermeable to uh, passive reabsorbs H2O via medullary hypertonicity, uh, which is impermeable to sodium. Okay, so it's not through sodium that it um, takes in the water because it's impermeable to sodium. That's important to know that this area is impermeable to sodium. Uh, concentrating this segment, so this segment is getting concentrated now. It makes the urine hypertonic over here. Okay. Uh, not here. Uh, this is thick, but over here in the thin one. So now we are talking about thick ascending loop of Henle. That's this thing. You have apical urine on this side, blood on this side. Okay. Uh, thick ascending loop of Henle reabsorbs sodium, potassium, and chloride. Okay. So it reabsorbs this thing which gets inhibited by diuretics okay because wherever sodium goes water goes we do not want sodium going back in right why because it will prevent water from going back in so we want sodium to stay in the urine and that's why loop diuretics will act on this uh, transporter right there okay so it reabsorbs sodium potassium chloride indirectly induces paracellular reabsorption of uh, magnesium and calcium this is important so when this happens this is happening as well it's transferring from here through to the blood without going through this uh, because of the way uh, the gradient is flowing okay uh, the chloride ions are going in right so that's going to bring it back uh, it's going to keep the polarity going this way as well uh, and when you have potassium coming out over here that's gonna repel diggies into this as well because this is uh, yeah basically they don't need channels or anything they just passively go in and that's important to know okay uh, paracellular not intracellularly so indirectly induces paracellular reabsorption of cal uh, magnesium and calcium through the pos positive lumen potential generated by po uh, potassium backleak. So impermeable to H2O makes, uh, okay, so that's important. So we know it was passively permeable to this, and now it's impermeable to water here, but it is permeable to sodium, potassium, and to chlorides. Right, so when uh, now instead of water, this is going out, right? So now there's only a little bit left in 100. So there were four in one liter before, and now there's one in 100 ml. So now it's gonna, it's equally concentrated now, right? So it makes urine less concentrated as it ascends. About 20 to 20 percent sodium is reabsorbed here okay uh, so 65 to 20 80 was in proximal nothing in thin uh, and in thick 10 to 25 okay urine on this side uh, basolateral membrane or interstitium on this side uh, you have just a condylar tubule over there okay so in uh, and this is the distal tubule right here. Uh, early DCT reabsorbs sodium chloride, impermeable to H2O. Again, this is all still impermeable to H2O. So that makes ascending and distal both of them impermeable to H2O. Okay, so it, it reabsorbs sodium and chloride. It makes urine flu fully di dilute or hyper hypotonic, right? So 
if sodium goes out whatever was like that you know there was at least one left now this is also leaving so now there's only 100 ml of water left right so it makes urine fully dilute or hypotonic uh, PTH will cause increase in calcium reabsorption right um, by increasing calcium sodium exchanger okay. so calcium is going to go back in okay and this is the exchanger so that's where PTH will function it will get sodium to come out and calcium to go in and that's what the diuretic does right in diuretic you want to make more water and how do you make more water you, and one way is to bring uh, sodium in it because wherever sodium goes uh, water goes so sodium is going to come out of the interstitium right uh, so when sodium comes out water comes out but these this exchanger is important because uh, this exchanger works only if there's enough calcium there as well right so and this is important uh, that's the f mechanism of uh, thiazides it acts on this area and if you're using thiazide you have chances of getting hypercalcemia and you need to know why it's because of this area right here and this exchanger so sodium goes in and calcium uh, I mean sodium goes out and calcium goes in from the urine and that's how you get diuretic or you know diuresis Okay, five to ten percent of sodium is reabsorbed from here. Okay, so five or ten percent of go it goes from uh, the urine into this, but then it can come out if there's PTH, and have calcium go in from here to there. Okay. Uh, now collecting tubules. Uh, you have urine over here you have blood on this side right so urine on urine right here and right there and blood on this side sorry uh you have principal cells here principal cells are the ones with the aquaporins okay your alpha intercalated cells this is where aldosterone uh, attaches and where the bicarbonate exchanges with cal uh, chloride. Remember, they both are negative ions, so you know, they're everywhere, either by, as bicarbonate or as chloride. So if there is bicarbonate going out, then there will be chloride coming in and vice versa. When chloride is going out, bicarbonate will come in. Okay, so alpha intercalated cells are the ones with this and bicarbonate exchange and then you also have beta intercalated cells okay that's again where chloride is going in bicarbonate is going out okay uh, so alpha is the one that uh, makes bicarbonate go into the blood and beta is the one that makes bicarbonate go out into the urine okay uh, B for B, right? So you want uh, bicarbonate in the urine, uh, you look for beta intercalated cells, B for B. Okay, uh, these pumps are ATP and okay. So collecting tubules reabsorb sodium in exchange for secreting a K and H ions. Okay, so it reabsorbs sodium it's reabsorbing this uh, to take out potassium, right? So it secretes that. Uh, the sodium is coming in and potassium is going out, okay? Uh, and H ions as well. Where are the H ions? Right here. ATPs, right? Uh, so potassium is coming in. Uh, hydrogen ions going out here as well. So that happens with both of the, uh, well, the hydrogen ion only happens over here in alpha intercalated cells, okay. And it's regulated by aldosterone, right? Uh, aldosterone carries 
or causes uh, reabsorption of sodium and excretion of potassium, right? So it will cause hypokalemia and hypernatremia, I guess. Okay. So, okay, fine. So aldosterone, it acts on mineral corticoid receptors that leads to mRNA, which leads to protein synthesis. In principal cells, increase in alpycal uh, potassium conductance, increase in sodium and potassium pump, increase in epithelial sodium channels, ENAC activity, leads to lumen negativity, uh, causing potassium secretion. Okay, that's important. Uh, let's look at that again. So it acts as a mineral corticoid. So mineral corticoid does what? It increases uh, absorption of water, right? Uh, so it leads to mRNA and protein synthesis. Uh, in principal cells, this causes increase in apical potassium okay, conductance. So increase in sodium potassium pump, uh, increase in epithelial sodium channel or ENAC activity. Uh, you need to know the this ENAC, what that is. It's increase in um, epithelial NA channel. Okay, that just means this is the epithelial cell, right, and the channel for sodium on it. Okay, so it increases the activity of ENAC when that increases you have increased amount of sodium coming in okay this will cause lumen negativity right because all the positive ions that sodium has is getting pulled in so when positive ions uh, go out of the cell uh, the negative ones are gonna stay behind and that will cause negativity okay Uh, okay, uh, and this will cause potassium secretion as well. Okay, so okay. something there. In alpha intercalated cells, uh, there's lumen negativity, which will lead to increase in uh, hydrogen ATPase activity, which leads to H secretion, and that's what you have over here. Okay. Uh, this will lead to increase in HCO and calcium exchanger, uh, bicarbonate and calcium. So that thing right there. Okay. Uh, activity. What does ADH do? It acts on the V2 receptors. Okay. V2s are the one on the cells right here, uh, right there and V1 is usually found in the vessels. Okay, so ADH acts on V2 receptor, which leads to insertion of aquaporins H2O channels on apical sides. Okay, so right there. Uh, and UTI receptor, UT1 receptor, sorry. This leads to urea reabsorption, right? So that's why I was saying urea gets reabsorbed in proximal tubule and in collecting duct. And this is important. This happens when there's, uh, you know, severe dehydration. That's the only, that's the only time you'll have this. Okay. And when ADH alone is not able to do its thing just with the aquaporins, then it's gonna start uh, bringing in urea. Why does that happen? It's because just like uh, sodium, when wherever sodium goes, uh, water goes. It's similar to keep the osmolarity uh, it's gonna bring in uh, urea and that's gonna pull in water as well that's why urea gets reabsorbed in severe dehydration okay and it does it through ut1 receptor with that okay uh, so amelioride and trimetrin blocks this uh, spironolactone these are the ones with own in it or one in it, right? And that's the one that blocks the aldosterone. So that's easy to remember. One blocks one and the other one is on this side. So we'll do the, uh, 
these in the farming section as well okay but again diazide axide and distal convoluted tubule loop diuretic acts on thick ascending limb of loop of henle and you have sglt inhibitor to block out the glucose uh, receptors acetazolamide uh, inhibits this so acetazolamide has a mnemonic as well so it's pretty good it's like acetazolamide causes uh, acid uh, metabolic acidosis right so acetosis or something like that okay Metabolic or uh, causes acidosis in the urine. I don't remember at the moment. We'll figure it out when we get to it. Okay. Uh, Rena tubular defects. Okay. Uh, Fanconi's bagels. Uh, that's just you know. You imagine a Italian person doing the finger. doing the hand thing right <laughs> so this is what it is um, and that's what the this looks like right a little pinch so you can imagine that it happens over here uh, in the proximal convoluted tubule okay and then B is over here the barter syndrome and then you have G for uh, Gittleman syndrome and L for low syndrome and the same Oh, I have a note on this. The desmos uh, desmopressin, it acts on ADH uh, channels as well, right? It, it activates ADH. Remember, we were doing that in uh, endo when while we were doing the difference between nephrogenic and central DI. Right. So that also causes ure urea reabsorption. Okay. Just a note of that. I don't have any notes on this, okay. So, Fanconi syndrome, it's generalized. Uh, we're going to do defects, effects, causes, and notes. Okay. Uh, let me see if there's something for that. So generalized reabsorption defect in PCT. You know how majority of the things get reabsorbed in PCT? Well, in Fanconi's that doesn't happen. So there is increased excretion of amino acid, glucose, bicarbonate, and phosphate, and all substances reabsorbed by the PCT. Easy enough. Uh, effects, uh, metabolic acidosis, right? Because uh, all the bicarbonates are getting leaked out. So... If bicarbonate goes out, that's the one that determines the pH levels, right? So you, if you have bicarbonate, it causes alkalosis. If you don't have bicarbonate, it means you have acidosis. Okay, so metabolic acidosis, proximal RTA, uh, and renal tubular acidosis. Uh, so that happens because of this. Uh, hypophosphatemia because you have phosphorus leaking out and hypokalemia because you have potassium leaking out as well causes are hereditary defects uh, and Wilson's disease like uh, Wilson's disease or tri tyrosinemia glycogen storage disease ischemia multiple myeloma drugs for example ephosphamide cisplatin or cisplatin Tenofovir, expired tetracyclines, uh, important, and lead poisoning. Notes, growth retardation and rickets osteopenia, common due to hypophosphatemia, and volume depletion, also common. Because since everything is getting leaked out, you know, it's not going to get reabsorbed. 
because 65 to 80 percent of sodium gets reabsorbed and that's how water comes in from there right so if that's why you get water depletion because of that okay water retardation and rickettsia or osteopenia are common due to hypophosphatemia uh, so what happens is because of this uh, pth is not going to trigger and when you don't have pth triggering you won't have uh, vitamin d happening and deficiency of vitamin d causes rickets okay um barter syndrome okay putting that down here okay reabsorption defect and thick ascending a loop of Henle, so that's the thick ascending one. Uh, it affects sodium, potassium, and two chloride transporter, co-transporter, right? Actually, yeah. Uh, and this is the area where it's water impermeable in this area, right? So that thing right there. So right here, sodium, potassium, and two chloride gets reabsorbed here, but it affects the co-transporters over there. So B for bagel, right? Right there. Metabolic alkalosis happens here. Okay. Uh, if the defect is over here, okay, because uh, majority of the potassium is getting uh, reabsorbed over here however uh, sodium potassium and 2cl is not getting back in so what is that doing you gotta look at this for that so if this is not happening what's not gonna happen the sodium's not gonna go in and potassium's not gonna go out when that doesn't happen this thing does not go in either and if calcium doesn't go in uh, this thing is not happening. Where's the H ion then? Okay. Okay, I'm not too sure about the mechanism over there. How it causes that. Metabolic alkalosis. Uh, it will cause hypokalemia because potassium is not getting uh, really absorbed. Or hypercalciuria, right? Because now, uh, since this is not going in, it's not creating the. Uh, positive potential over here or like you know polarity so it's not going to push out the potassium out there so when it doesn't do that uh, it's not going to create the gradient for calcium to go in so if calcium doesn't go in it's going to stay in the urine and that's going to cause the hypercalciuria okay autosomal recessive it presents similar to chronic loop diuretic use okay Oh, right. I think it's because um, the sodium, since it's not getting reabsorbed here, that means uh, it's going to get sensed over here. Uh, that's where the macular densa is, right? So it's going to do that. And then when it gets, uh, you know, stimulated, activated and all that. So sodium is going to get uh, reabsorbed over here in exchange for the hydrogen ions over there. Okay, yeah. So when sodium gets uh reabsorb in exchange for hydrogen ions hydrogen ions leak out and that causes alkalosis right because there's imbalance between uh, bicarbonate and hydrogen now so there's more bicarbonate causing alkalosis okay uh, causes autosomal recessive and notes uh, present similar to chronic loop diuretic and use uh, now we are at Gilman this is reabsorption defect of NACL and DCT. Okay, uh, so NACL is not gonna go in. Okay, and if that doesn't go in, you're not gonna get these going in either, I guess, or you know, the potassium is not gonna come in uh, through ATP. Oh well, it's ATP. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, so reabsorption defect of any scale in DCT. So metabolic alkalosis, you yeah won't have magnesium coming in, you won't have calcium coming in, or even potassium. Uh, wait, you have hypokalemia, so. I guess potassium is doing that too. Not sure about the potassium. Okay, autosomal recessive. Uh, it presents similarly to chronic thiazide diuretic use, less severe than Barter syndrome. Okay, less severe than that. And then you have little syndrome, little at the end, because it got a little, little. Uh, gain of function mutation uh, leads to decrease in sodium channel degradation and increase in sodium reabsorption in collecting tubules. Okay, so sodium is going to get exchanged for all of these things. So you'll have uh, hypokalemia, metabolic acidosis, right? Uh, alkalosis, sorry. Uh, and if sodium is coming in, water is coming in, that's going to increase uh, blood volume, in leading to hypertension and aldosterone is going to decrease right because you already have water coming in so you won't have more mineral corticoids building up okay uh autosomal dominant oh right okay so if uh, nacl is not getting coming back in macular densa is gonna you know sense that and when uh, it senses it's going to do the whole ROS activation. And what does aldosterone do? It reabsorbs uh, sodium down here, right? And uh, it excretes potassium, right? So that's why you get uh, hypokalemia over there. Okay. Uh, decrease in aldosterone. Uh, autosomal dominant presents similarly to hyperaldosteronism, but aldosterone is nearly undetectable. Okay, because we already have increased sodium coming in, so you won't have that. But it presents similarly to this, so it ha that also does the same thing, right? Aldosterone is going to uh, reabsorb all the sodium. However, in this you won't notice so any aldosterone. So that's how you differentiate between little syndrome and hyperaldosteronism. And then you have same or serum of apparent mineral corticoid access. It's the same as mineral corticoid. Okay. Uh, it cortisol activates mineral corticoid uh, receptors. That's L O N beta H S D. It converts cortisol to cortisone. It inactive on these receptors. Hereditary uh, L O N beta H S D deficiency will lead to increase in cortisol, which leads to increase in mineral corticoid receptor activity. Remember, 11-BHCD is uh, weak mineral, no, not JSBC. Hold on, let's look at those. Okay, right here so uh, this one is weak right we talked about that it's 11 deoxycorticosterone just like that cortisol is also weak mineral corticoid right so when you have uh, deficiency of 11 beta hydroxylation uh, you'll have buildup of 11 deoxy cortisol but that is uh, inactive right that's what they're talking about Okay. So hereditary, no. this division will lead to increase in cortisol, HSD. We don't have HSD over here, but I guess we just remember that then, because deficiency of that. will do what? It will cause increase in this, right? 11 
deoxycorticosterone. So I guess that's what they're talking about when they're saying cortisol. Because that's the one that has increased amount of that. Because it yeah, converts cortisol to cortisone. Okay. Oh, okay. So this thing is going to be after cortisol. Okay, so right here. Eleven beta HSD. So that's the one that's converting this thing. Okay, got it. So cortisol into this, but when you have deficiency of this, uh, you have buildup of cortisol, and cortisol is a weak mineral corticoid. That's what they're saying. Okay. So one more time, uh, cortisol activates mineral corticoid receptors. Okay, because it's a weak mineral corticoid. So in 11-beta-HSD uh, converts cortisol to cortisone, and we saw that over here, cortisone, so 11-beta-HSD converts cortisol to cortisone, okay, uh, which is an inactive of, uh, it's inactive on these receptors. So hereditary 11-beta-HSD deficiency will increase cortisol, which increases mineral corticoid receptor activity, okay. Uh, it leads to metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypertension, similar to this stuff, right? Hypertension because it acts like a mineral corticoid. Uh, this because it acts like an aldosterone, same as aldosterone, right? So it trashes or like it excretes uh, potassium and takes in uh, sodium, reabsorbs sodium, and that leads to, you know, exchange of sodium for. Uh, hydrogen ion so that leads to metabolic alkalosis decrease in serum aldosterone level uh, because of that because cortisol tries to be the same as aldosterone and that's easy to remember right so remember that uh, autosomal recessive can acquire a disorder from glycoridinic acid presents in licorice uh, which blocks activity of 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase uh, this is important it could be autosomal recessive or it can be acquired from glycoretinic acid which is present in licorice okay so if a person is eating too much of this they will end up with this okay treatment is potassium sparing diuretics okay so they spare potassium uh, we'll read about that in Pharmac. Potassium sparing diuretics decrease in mineral corticoid effects or corticosteroids. Exogenous corticosteroid lead uh, decreasing endogenous cortisol production, leading to a decrease in mineral corticoid receptor activation. Okay. So once again, this um, potassium sparing diuretic. It decreases mineral corticoid effects or corticosteroids. Uh, you can give that. Exogenous corticosteroids will decrease uh, endogenous cortisol production, right? Because that's going to do what? So when you give more of this, this is going to inhibit ACTH. And when ACTH is inhibited, you're not going to get this. So you won't get this whole thing happening. Right? And that's how you treat that as well. Uh, important to remember, uh, if you just remember this whole thing and you know what gets absorbed and what doesn't know in these, then you don't have to bother memorizing each and everything over here because you know the mechanism now of all the effects. Right, so Fanconi over here, it looks like a hand of an Italian man named Fanconi. Uh, Water syndrome over here, Gilman syndrome over there. Uh, and little syndrome over here okay so butter is thick ascending gittle is uh, distal convoluted tubule and these two are collecting duct okay uh, relative concentrations along proximal tubule for this if you don't understand it and you just memorize these things right here you'll get the question right because they give you this without the names and then they ask you which one would is 
does this line represent or what does this slide represent of okay uh, but before that this is tubular fluid over plasma okay mm -hmm. and this is uh, percent of distance along the uh, PT okay or proxima tubule length I guess uh, so tubular fluid uh, over plasma if the okay so they're talking about the concentration along the proxima tubule compared to the concentration in the peri -capil uh, tubular capillaries right so you have uh, if the ratio is more than one that means uh, the concentration is more in the tubular fluid of X substance right then it is in uh, plasma right so plasma is the same anyways but there's more over here so that means it's going to have increased amount of solutes in the tubular fluid right that's what it means so tf over p is more than one means uh, when solute is reabsorbed less right so it's going less from tubular fluid this is a tubular fluid and these are the capillaries okay so that means uh, solutes are going less from tubular fluid and reabsorbed into the capillaries a lot less okay when solute is reabsorbed less quickly than water and okay or when solute is secreted okay or it could be secreted that means it's coming from capillaries into this you'll get uh, more of this or uh, when this is reabsorbed and less quickly than water into this okay uh, that also means the water is reabsorbed right here at this line, uh, the black line right here. Right. So anything more than that. Okay. Because this is one. That means uh, the solute is... Uh, just as permeable as the water so anything that's more than more permeable than water it's these things right here okay tf over p equals one when solute and water are reabsorbed at the same rate okay so that's this black line uh, that's going to be your sodium or really close to it is potassium uh, and if it's lower, uh, that means uh, the concentration is more in the plasma than it is in the fluid. That means when solute is reabsorbed more okay, from the this to this, uh, quicker than water. Okay, that's what it means, quicker than water. So these ones are slower than water to reabsorb, and this is quicker than water to reabsorb. So, uh, let's just remember the values, okay. So, wa on the water, it's sodium, and really close is potassium. And then you have a little curve right here for urea and chlorine. But then chloride gets saturated real quick. And then you get stable reabsorption of uh, chloride, sorry, not calcium, chloride. And then uh, urea takes a little longer than chloride to stabilize or saturate the thing. But yeah. So you have potassium, uh, second number, you have chloride, then you have urea. Then uh, with linear lines, uh, you have inulin, right, which equals uh, GFR, or creatinine, uh, which slightly overestimates GFR, right? Still a straight line for that. And then you have renal plasma flow uh, one, which is PAH or para amino hyperic acid or amino hyperic acid. Okay, so just remember that. And then if I remember the first one closest to the line was bicarbonate, and the last one uh, closest to the corner is glucose, and right in the middle is, are your amino acids. So just remember it like that. These two are curved. 
This one is the closest to the corner. Uh, this one is closest to this corner. And then two straight lines are inulin and creatinine. And the closest one to the sodium air is potassium. Uh, between inulin and potassium, you have urea and chlorine. Usually, they won't give you both of these in the option. They'll give you just one of these to represent one line over here. Okay. Okay, so you need to know what's happening. Uh, these get reabsorbed uh, slower than water. This one get fast in uh, faster than water and what this whole thing is. So tubular inulin increases in concentration, but not amount along the PT proximal tubule as a result of water reabsorption. Chloride reabsorption occurs at a slower rate than sodium in early PCT uh, and then matches the rate of sodium reabsorption more distally. Uh, where? It's going to be in uh, thick ascending and convoluted tubules, uh, just a convoluted tubule. Thus, its re relative concentration increases before it plateaus. Okay, so when it reaches the uh, thick ascending and there, uh, then it plateaus over there. So, in proximal tubule, it's gonna be you know like that. It's slower than sodium, right? Because where did we see that? Right here. So sodium. Majority of the sodium gets reabsorbed here, that's why it's fast. And then chloride starts getting reabsorbing over here. It doesn't reabsorb over here, right? That's why. And reabsorbs over here. Okay, uh, yeah, so chloride reabsorption occurs at a slower rate than sodium in early PCT and then matches the rate of sodium reabsorption more distally. Thus, it relative, its relative concentration increases before it plateaus. Uh, Ross, uh, important to understand this concept because it comes in this uh, recipe and also CVS. Okay. Uh, why recipe it's because of this thing right here okay uh renin angiotensin aldosterone system so ras activators how does it get activated there are three ways it can get activated one if there's decrease in bp or blood pressure uh, so renal bear receptors will pick that up uh, decrease in sodium chloride delivery so macular densa picks that up Right, so macular dense right there. Or increase in uh, sympathetic tone, the beta-1 receptor, right? Beta-1 was heart, remember? So if beta-1 is getting uh, stimulated, it's also going to stimulate the kidneys. Okay. It's okay. Uh, okay, so... The whole point of renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone is to do what? It's to increase uh, blood volume, right? To recruit sodium or uh, just by itself the water and increase it, okay? Uh, to increase uh, or to decrease osmolality or increase osmolarity. Anyhow, to increase BP, blood pressure, and blood volume. Okay, that's the whole point. Uh, so it's going to activate in, during dehydration, during uh, hypovolemic shock, or, you know, any in hypoxia, or hypoxemia, all of that stuff. It's going to activate this. Also, if you're leaking out more sodium for any condition before that. Okay. Uh, dial distal convoluted tubules right there now you have macular densa over here and then you have afferent arterioles and you have efferent arterioles just a glomerular cells uh, liver is gonna uh, send out angiotensinogen what does angiotensinogen do it converts renin into no sorry renin converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 and then with ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Okay. 
ace comes in from here okay and uh, from kidney both uh, important thing to know uh, angiotensin 2 you find that in here as well in the lungs okay uh, it's the only one that you'll find out of this whole rust system so if there's a question that says that uh, which of these are going to be found and more in pulmonary ves uh, venule than it would be in pulmonary artery uh, right so pulmonary artery is the one coming in so you won't find any angiotensin 2 in that but you will in pulmonary vein because angiotensin converting enzyme is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 okay and ACE also causes pretty kind of breakdown so if you have ACE inhibitors it's going to block this so you won't have any breakdown of predikinin and that will cause coughing okay so if you have a person who who's on all these medication causing dry cough the first thing you would do is check it's his medication for the angiotensin converting enzyme blockers or ace blockers right ace inhibitors okay so what uh, there are a couple of actions that angiotensin 2 has on angiotensin on the vessels it causes uh, vasoconstriction so angiotensin 2 receptor type 1 vasoconstriction this causes increase in bpa right on glomerulus what it does remember ace angiotensin constricts efferent so it's going to constrict efferent arterial causing increase in uh, ff or filtration fraction this preserves the gfr when uh, renal blood flow is decreased due to decrease in uh, BP okay uh, in kidneys it's going to increase uh, sodium hydrogen activity uh, leads to PCT cell okay proximal convoluted tubule to reabsorb sodium bicarbonate and water it permits uh, contraction alkalosis in this Okay, so it's going to bring in sodium in exchange for hydrogen. So you get alkalosis due to that. On the adrenals, what does it do? We already know about this one. It causes uh, increase in mineral corticoids or aldosterone, right? So aldosterone secretion does two, what? There are two things that does. On principal cells, it's going to create aquaporins, right? And on alpha intercalated cells, uh, it's going to bring in sodium or it's going to excrete uh, hydrogen, so increase in H ATP is activity. And that's it for that. Let's check up kilotin, right? So it pulls that out and it brings it is in, okay, and pulls in the bicarbonate. Those are okay. Which do I have? Five. All right. So renin angiotensin aldosterone system with renin. So the function of renin is, well, renin is secreted by just glomerular cells in response to decrease in renal perfusion pressure. So that just means decrease in, uh, you know, the renal blood flow or decrease in blood pressure, right? Uh, so when it detects decrease in that, uh, it's detected in art, uh, afferent arterioles. So this will increase renal sympathetic discharge and... Uh, or beta 1 effect and decrease NACL delivery to macular densa right uh, sympathetic is your flight or flight uh, fight or flight response so that will uh, vasoconstrict right but in here it's not alpha related it's beta 1 related okay so beta one was again just increase in renin secretion that's what it was nothing to do with alphas okay uh usually beta one is found in heart heart it increases heart rate and contractility but you have to remember it also increases renin secretion okay and decrease in sodium uh, chloride delivery to macular densa will also cause secretion of renin okay so two things right here uh, and then ace 
catalyzes conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 uh, located in many tissues but conversion occurs most extensively in the lungs. It's produced by vascular endothelial cells in the lung. Uh, so, easy to remember. Angiotensin 2, uh, it helps maintain blood volume because it has, uh, you know, right here, effect on alpha-1 receptors as well. Uh, helps maintain blood volume and blood pressure. Affects baroreceptor function, limits reflex bradycardia, which would normally accompany its pressor effects. Okay, so it limits that as well. Uh, ANP, BNP, that is the, from atria and ventricles in response to high blood volume, right? So it's released from atria, ANP, and ventricles, BNP, in response to increase in volume. It inhibits renin angiotensin aldosterone system, okay? Uh, so it relaxes vascular smooth muscles via CGMP, um, that's the one with nitric oxide, right? Uh, it leads to increase in GFR and decrease in renin, okay? So, GFR and decrease in renin, okay. <clears throat> it dilates afferent arterioles and promotes net uresis. Uh, so there's also aldosterone escapes uh, so escape mechanism right and that involves this and this uh, we'll talk about that somewhere else I think uh, if not it's basically you know uh, when you have RAS and all that it increases uh, blood volume and uh, then blood volume is going to increase secretion of this and then you have you know excretion of uh, sodium right because that's how it reduces this so how does it increase uh, you know how does it increase blood volume and reduce blood volume at the same time uh, it's because aldosterone also promotes uh, uh, ADH and all that stuff uh, so no, sorry, aquaporins, so it doesn't rely on sodium alone to increase reabsorption of water, right? Uh, we saw that up here. Uh, increase in, sorry, that was ADH. Yeah, so it increases that. Uh, we'll look into escape mechanism. We need to know that, and I'm kind of not remembering correctly. So we'll look at that. Uh, ADH vasopressin primarily regulates uh, regulates vasopressin, right? So primarily regulates serum osmolality. Also, uh, response to low blood volume states uh, stimulates reabsorption of water in collecting duct. Also stimulates reabsorption of urea in collecting ducts to maximize corticopapillary osmotic gradient. Okay, uh, know about that. Aldosterone primarily regulates ECF volume and sodium content. Increase in release in hypovolemic state and responds to hyperkalemia by increasing uh, potassium excretion. Right, so it reabsorbs this and excretes this in uh, hypovolemic states. Okay, uh, I'm gonna look up uh, all those. Escape mechanism. The process of aldosterone escape invokes several mechanisms. In addition to increasing renal perfusion pressure, the resultant volume expansion decreases proximal sodium reabsorption and increases sodium delivery to distal uh, nephrons of. Mm, Okay. It's 
called hyperaldosteronism. Okay. Mechanism to which the body tries to deal with excess of mineral corticoid. Prolonged mineral corticoid can access can be due to hyperaldosteronism. Excess mineral corticoid. Okay, so this escape mechanism is because uh, it happens in the cyclus hyperaldosteronism. So we don't need to worry about it here then. But Let's look at it anyways. Recall, I guess. So mechanism through which body deals, uh, tries to deal with access of mineral corticoid. Uh, prolonged mineral corticoid access can be due to hyperaldosteronism. Access mineral corticoid causes increase in any retention. Water retains uh, osmotically uh, increasing that, I guess. Okay, so water retention causes osmotic osmolarity to increase. And ECF volume increases as well. Water retention causes decrease in osmolarity though. Okay. Uh, ECF volume increases. As ECF volume increases, blood pressure is raised, which is increased beyond a point. Body adapts a mechanism to deal with the excess, the ANP and BNP. So release of ANP uh, inhibits sodium intake, right? Uh, so sodium excretion increased and water follows despite the excess uh, mineral corticoid uh, present right okay and that's how you get that okay so it was nothing to do with ADH ECF volume decreases and blood pressure is still normal because of that okay so it's the important thing is right here so sodium excretion increased volume uh, sorry, water follows despite the excess mineral corticoid present. Okay. So that's the escape mechanism. Cool. Uh, going on. So here you gotta know about ACE. Uh, gotta know about renin, where it's coming from. Right, it's coming from juxtamellular glomerular cells. Uh, what the function of macula densa is. Right. It detects uh, sodium chloride or sodium in the blood. Okay, uh, the mechanism of angiotensin two, especially the one on this and over here. Yeah, angiotensin two over here, and basically all of them. You gotta know angiotensin two. Okay. Uh, also, uh, ADH. We didn't talk about that. So angiotensin two comes in. And it stimulates uh, the posterior pituitary to release ADH. Remember, ADH is made in the hypothalamus. It's only stored in posterior uh, pituitary. Okay, so it comes in, and then uh, ADH will, you know, cause aquaporins and reabsorb H2O. Uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus. It consists of mesangial cells, and we look at looked at that what that looks like right uh, and under electron microscope it consists of mesangial cells uh, if not let's just look at them real quick okay so it should be somewhere here uh, right there MC mesangial cells uh, so it would be somewhere here we don't need to know about it uh, like we don't need to be able to figure it out where it is right right there but what we need to know is where the photocytes are endothelial cells are and uh, glomerular basement membrane okay uh, so it consists of mesangial cells uh, just a glomerular cells modified smooth muscle of afferent arterioles and the macula densa Sodium chloride sensor located at the uh, distal convoluted tubule. Uh, that's where it is. Uh, that's where the sodium gets detected. Just a glomerular cells. Uh, so why is it over there? Basically, because uh, majority of the sodium gets reabsorbed in proximal convoluted tubule, right? And then a little more at the uh, thick ascending uh, loop of Henle, right? Or tubule. So 
if majority of the sodium is already reabsorbed, but you're still seeing a lot of sodium in the distal convert tubule, then that means uh, it's going to get leaked out because only if, what, 2 to 5% of it gets reabsorbed in DCT, right? So all the other ones are going to get secreted outward out, or excreted out. So that's why, uh, that's where it detects it. Uh, JG cells uh, secrete renin in response to decrease in renal blood pressure and increase sympathetic tone or beta 1. Uh, Megala densa cells sense decrease in sodium chloride delivery to DCP, uh, which increases renin release. And the renin will, you know, do all that stuff and uh, cause angiotensin 2 to come in and angiotensin does what? ACE, angiotensin convert, uh, converting enzyme or sorry, uh, angiotensin 2 constricts efferent, right? So efferent arterial uh, vasoconstriction, uh, which leads to GFR increase. Uh, JGA maintains GFR via renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Uh, Beta blockers and decrease blood pressure, right? Because uh, that's it acts on beta one. Uh, so when it block gets blocked, right? Uh, renin's not gonna get released. So if renin doesn't get released, you're not gonna have increase in sympathetic tone either. Okay. So beta blocker decreases blood pressure by decreasing cardiac output and inhibiting beta-1 receptor on the gestaglomerular apparatus uh, causing decrease in renin release. Okay. Uh, kidney hormone functions. Uh, pretty easy. Uh, by now we should know like at least most of them. Uh, erythropoietin, it gets released by the interstitial cells in the pretubular capillary bed in response to hypoxia. Right. So we already looked at this up there but quickly right it's these things right here the pericapillary tubular and where it relies that's where um, EPO gets secreted from the bed into those these capillaries and then they carry on towards uh, the bone marrow and then it gets stimulated there right We get it. Don't need to go into it uh, in details. Released by interstitial cells. That's important in the peritubular capillary bed. That's important. In response to hypoxia. That's important. Right. So it stimulates RBC proliferation and bone marrow. Administered by uh, administered for anemia secondary to chronic kidney disease. It increases risk of hypertension. Right. Uh, so that's why uh, it gets uh, like the this thing senses uh, decrease in BP, right? Uh, so when there's increase in BP, all of this gets a uh, thing. So it's very sensitive to the amount of pressure coming in. And that's why, you know, uh, there's it, gets, it regulates erythropoietin as well. It's able to do that. But say you giving you're giving exogenous erythropoietin. Now the kidney can't control that, right? So you're bound to have hypertension because even after you have uh, enough amount of um, you know red blood cells, uh, erythrocytes, and erythropoietin is still going to continue doing its action because it's not regulated anymore by the kidney, uh, right? And you would do that, you know, you would give exogenous erythropoietin in chronic kidney disease. So, uh, concept there to remember. Uh, uh, how does it increase it? Well, erythropoietin increases uh, erythrocytes, right? So erythrocyte increases what uh, plasma volume, uh, right? And that will increase hyperten cause hypertension. Uh, calci uh, calciferol or vitamin D, right? Uh, this is uh, these get excreted or gets converted actually rather 
by one alpha hydroxylase and PCT, so it converts cholecalcidiol into calcitriol. Right, so PCT cells convert 25 hydroxy uh, OH vitamin D3 to one, which is the active form, 25 OH2 or calcitriol vitamin D3. So calcitriol is the active form. Okay, increases calcium absorption in small bowel. Okay, so what does vitamin D do? It increases reabsorption of calcium and potassium uh, phosphates in the intestine. Or small bowels and increases reabsorption of calcium in the renal tubules however it doesn't have any action on uh, phosphate in the renal tubules so when there is increase in PTH known as uh, parathyroid hormone or for uh, phosphate thrashing hormone that's how you reduce uh, phosphate in the body by increasing vitamin D so calcidiol gets converted to calcitriol by 1-alpha hydroxylase. This is also found in what? It's found in one of the cells, the macrophages, right? So in sarcoidosis, there's increased amount of these being secreted uh, from macrophages, which converts, uh, you know, inactive vitamin D to active vitamin D. And that's why you get increase in uh, vitamin D, active vitamin D in uh, sarcoidosis and that causes hypercalcemia and sarcoidosis as well okay uh, prostaglandins paracrine secretion vasodilates afferent arterioles to increase uh, renal blood flow okay uh, remember PDA so prostaglandin dilates afferent arterioles so paracrine secretion of uh, will vasodilate afferent arterioles to increase RBF uh, NSAIDs block renal protective prostaglandin synthesis, right? So if you give NSAIDs, that's why you shouldn't have, you know, chronic NSAIDs given to a person, especially while they are like, you know, having coffee and stuff as well. So if you take coffee with NSAIDs uh, for a long amount of time, you can, you know, cause ischemia in your renal medulla. Okay, so uh, vasodilate won't, vasodilation won't happen with uh, NSAIDs. So NSAIDs block renal protective prostaglandin synthesis, which will constrict, cause constriction of afferent arterioles and decrease GFR. Okay. Uh, this may result in acute kidney injury in low renal blood flow states. Okay. Uh, then you have dopamine, which is secreted by proximal tubule cells. Uh, it promotes natiuresis uh, at low dose and uh, dilates interlobular arteries. Remember, that's the longer ones. So interlobar were the bigger ones, and the longer name is when it goes longer into the tubules. So it dilates interlobular arteries, afferent arterioles, and efferent arterioles as well. So basically, it dilates everything. Okay. Uh, increase in RBF because remember dopamine there are two types D1 and D2 D1 is excitatory and D2 is uh, inhibitory right uh, RBF uh, increase in RBF little or no change in GFR at higher doses uh, acts as vasoconstrictor So that's why it has both the effects. Okay, uh, hormones acting on kidney. Uh, ANP, so ANP is secreted from uh, atria due to increase in blood volume, right? Uh, so you'll find it in hypertension or right heart failure or something like that. Okay. Uh, Atrial net uretic peptide secreted in response to increase in atrial pressure causes indirect afferent arterial dilation through inhibition of norepinephrine, causes increase in glomerular filtration rate and increase in sodium filtration with no compensatory sodium reabsorption in distal nephron. Net effect is any loss and volume loss, and that's how it, you know, reduces um, blood volume or blood pressure okay uh, angiotensin 2 
uh, it's synthesized, uh, synthesized in response to decrease in blood pressure, causes afferent. Okay, so this thing affects this one right here, afferent arterial. Okay. Uh, angiotensin two affects uh, everything you're seeing too. Okay, right here too. So synthesized in response to decrease in angiotensin. Uh, sorry. Uh, in response to decrease in blood pressure, it causes efferent arterial constriction, which leads to increase in GFR and increase in FF or f uh, filtration fraction, right? Because this one will cause uh, increased resistance because of constriction of that. So that will make the blood stay here longer and you'll have, you know, more GFR because of that and filtration fraction but with compensatory sodium reabsorption in proximal and distal nephrons. Net preservation of renal function, so increase in filtration fraction in low volume state with simultaneous sodium reabsorption, both proximal and distal to maintain circulating volume. Okay. Um, parathyroid hormone secreted in response to decrease in plasma calcium. Uh, an increase in plasma phosphate or decrease in plasma activated vitamin D uh, causes increase in calcium reabsorption, decrease in phosphate reabsorption and PCT um, and increase in vitamin D active form production. So it increases calcium and phosphate absorption from gut via vitamin D. Uh, we have aldosterone. Aldosterone acts right here. Uh, it's secreted in, uh, you know, principal cells and alpha intercalated cells, right? Uh, so it's secreted in response to decrease in blood volume uh, via angiotensin two and increase in plasma potassium causes increase in sodium reabsorption and increase in potassium secretion, uh, increase in H secretion as well. Okay. So sodium is going to get reabsorbed uh, in exchange for potassium and hydrogen ions. Okay. Um, and at last, we have ADH, vasopressin. It's secreted in response to increase in plasma osmolarity and decrease in plasma volume or blood volume. Right. So when you have uh, more concentrated uh, sodium compared to the amount of water, right? or when you have decrease in blood volume as well. It binds to receptor of principal cells causing increased number of aquaporins and increases H2O reabsorption. So this is how you control the osmolarity of the plasma because it doesn't take in sodium, it only takes in the water. Okay, so yeah. Increase in reabsorption of urea and collecting duct to maximize corticopapillary osmotic gradient. Remember I told you in severe dehydration, it also uh, reabsorbs urea in the collecting duct via UT1 receptors, right? Uh, to create the cortical papillary osmotic gradient. Uh, then it acts just like sodium, wherever urea goes, water goes, kind of thing, okay? Uh, potassium shifts, so what shifts potassium into the cell, uh, right? When that happens, it causes hypokalemia because you won't find potassium in the serum, right? Because it's inside a cell. So hypoosmolarity will do that. Okay, it shifts potassium out uh, into, the, I mean, in into the cell. Uh, alkalosis, okay, so low potassium, okay. So what happens is uh, it gets exchanged for, uh, you know, serum hydrogen ions uh, and potassium ions, okay? So you have a cell and you have alkalosis, right? So alkalosis is when your H ions, uh, you have bicarbonate, increase amount of bicarbonate and decrease amount of uh, hydrogen ions, right? So to overcome the alkalosis, what the body does is it sends the K ions inside and brings the hydrogen ions outside, okay? 
it brings the ions, hydrogen ions outside but then this also gets leaked out and gets converted into other stuff uh, or it gets you know gets exchanged for sodium uh, to increase the blood volume or something right so that's why it happens in alkalosis uh, then you have um, beta adrenergic agonists okay increase in sodium potassium ATPAs uh, insulin hold on I've got a okay. so increase in adrenergic agonists okay so that's um, beta adrenergic agonists so increase in sodium potassium ATPAs Uh, that will cause hypokalemia. Okay, shift into that. Uh, uh, they do test you on this, but I can't think of an example right now. Insulin, uh, increase in sodium potassium ATPase. Okay, so easy to remember this one. Insulin makes or shifts potassium in to the cell. So if uh, beta-1 agonist uh, is going to make, or beta agonists are going to make uh, potassium shift inwards, then beta blockers are going to make it go outwards, right? So not really beta blocker, but yeah, okay, beta blocker too. <laughs> uh, digoxin, it blocks uh, the sodium potassium ATPase, right? So if sodium doesn't go out, it doesn't get exchanged for calcium, so calcium is going to stay in the cell for a longer time. The uh, and SER calcium, right? And that's how that works. So potassium is going to stay out in that case. Uh, hyperosmolarity. So if there's hyperosmolarity, the potassium is going to stay out, just like uh, sodium. Lysis of uh, cells like tumor lysis syndrome. We looked at that, right? I'll actually go back and we'll look at that just for a second. right here right so it increases um, potassium decreases calcium uh, through increasing phosphate so that causes release of uh, PTH as well actually hmm. uh, and increases uric acid as well so this will cause uh, formation of crystals causing acute kidney injury and all that stuff but for potassium you know it increases that causing muscle weakness and arrhythmia and ECG changes okay okay so crush injury and rhabdomyolysis as well uh, for rhabdomyolysis I have uh, note on it so just quickly rhabdomyolysis risk factors are crush injury uh, prolonged muscle uh, activity inactivity I guess or activity uh, seizures marathon running okay so like that so prolonged muscle activity like seizures or ma marathon running or even drug medication use like statins amphetamines and heroin Etiology is myocyte necrosis, release of intracellular content, or myoglobin. Kidney injury, uh, heme-pigmented, uh, pigment-induced acute tubular necrosis. Lab findings are increase in creatinine kinase, myoglobinuria. Uh, so positive for blood, but not RBC on uh, microscopy. Acute kidney injury and electrolyte abnormalities, so that will lead to increase in potassium, uh, increase in phosphate, and decrease in calcium. 
urine analysis are going to show protein, blood, uh, right, but no WBC or RBC. Okay. Uh, for uh, acidosis, it's going to occur in acidosis where uh, this happens. Again, it's similar to this, but at this point, what's going to happen is that uh, since you have potassium inside and you have acidosis, the body reacts and it tries to contain it by sending the hydrogen ions into the cell in exchange for potassium coming out. Okay, and that's how you have acidosis. Um, how you have hyperkalemia and acidosis. Okay, now beta blockers will uh, again cause that. Uh, it's just the mechanism of it. I'm not remembering the mechanism right now, but it acts on beta-1 receptors in the heart. Uh, high blood sugar, insulin deficiency. Okay. Uh, so if insulin brings it in, uh, insulin dis uh, deficiency will cause it to stay out. Uh, succinylcholine, increased risk in burns and muscle trauma, hyper Hyperkalemia do labs. Okay, so succinylcholine will also cause hyperkalemia. Don't need to remember this if you just understand most of the mechanisms I told you. So important one is beta blocker. You need to know that. This one, you don't really need to know. Know about digoxin and osmolarity. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's go that bigger. Electrolyte disturbances. Uh, electrolyte low serum concentration, high serum concentration. So for sodium, when you have low serum concentration of sodium, you'll have uh, nausea, malaise, stupor, coma, and seizures. Uh, right. So since you have seizures, uh, if you heard uh, Goldian or Goldian audio notes or lecture notes uh, he says uh, sodium causes CNS symptoms right all the S's so CNS symptoms by sodium okay uh, if it's high serum concentration it's going to cause irritability stupor and coma so stupor and coma no matter low or high uh, and then you have potassium you have U wave and flattened P wave on ECG, uh, arrhythmias, muscle cramps, spasm, and weakness. Uh, this is important, and so is this, the ECG findings. Okay, uh, if it's low, if it's high, uh, you have wide QRS and peaked P waves instead of flat on ECG. Uh, arrhythmias and muscle weakness happens here as well. Uh, for calcium, you have titany uh, in low serum concentration, okay, uh, seizures, QT prolongation, uh, twitching, uh, which is Schoestek sign or spasm like Trousseau's sign, right? So basically, if you tap the uh, jaw on the side, uh, it's going to cause uh, twitching of the mouth, right? Or if you... Uh, apply a sphygmomanometer or you know the BP cuff for the blood pressure machine and you turn it on and then uh, soon enough they will start spasming the hand will start spasming so that's the Trousseau sign this happens because of calcium uh, low serum concentration of calcium okay uh, and if it's high you get you know stones bones groans thrones uh, psychiatric overtones like uh, in primary hyperparathyroidism. Magnesium, uh, titany, torsades the pointis, hypokalemia and hypocalcemia when magnesium is less than uh, this. So for magnesium, it's similar to calcium. It causes titany. It causes torsades the pointis okay, and hypokalemia. Uh, and during high concentration, you have decrease in DTRs. Uh, I think that's dorsal root reflexes or distal. Let me see what that is.
deep tendon reflex never mind right so deep tendon reflexes decrease lethargy bradycardia uh, hypotension cardiac arrest and hypocalcemia phosphate uh, that's uh, low serum of that is going to cause uh, bone loss osteomyelasia okay uh, and rickets uh, if you have high serum concentration, you will have renal stones, metastatic calcification, and hypocalcemia. Okay. Okay, let's try this out. Okay, let's go through this. So, CR, uh, inappropriate secretion of ADH. What does ADH do? It increases reabsorption of water, right? It doesn't let it uh, go through to the urine, so you'll have increase in blood pressure. Uh, because of this, you'll have uh, plasma renin will be reduced or decreased. Uh, aldosterone is not going to be activated so reduced uh, it has no effect on mg uh, urine calcium it doesn't have any effect on that either yeah okay so primary hyper aldosteronism uh, what does aldosterone do it increases uh, blood pressure or water right mineral corticoid so it increases blood pressure uh, it's going to decrease plasma renin because uh, you already have aldosterone that's like the third step so a decrease of that aldosterone is going to increase right that's the whole point of this uh, serum mg mg doesn't have any effect on it calcium uh, it's going to cause reabsorption of sodium in exchange for calcium isn't it uh, you'll have increased calcium, maybe no, nothing, yeah, nothing, okay, because uh, that would be if it has acted on uh, distal convert tubule, but only acts on the collecting ducts, so no action on that. Uh, renin secreting tumor, that's going to cause increase in this as well, right, because renin keeps secreting, uh, ROS keeps happening, increases the blood volume. Uh, plasma renin increase that's the primary thing so red uh, aldosterone is going to increase as well serum magnesium doesn't have an effect on it doesn't have an effect on calcium either okay uh, barter remember barter was where and thick ascending and thick ascending does what uh, it does sodium calcium and chloride right so reabsorption of that so serum calcium is going to increase for this one, right? That's what it was. Uh, what else are you going to get? Blood pressure, it's going to reduce because sodium is not going to get reabsorbed, right? Oh, no change on it, okay. Uh, if there's no change in blood pressure, no change in plasma renin, oh, it increases. Oh, right, because uh, distal convert tubular is going to sense that there's increased amount of no, uh, sodium coming in now, right? And if it gets detected there, renin gets released. So that's why you have increase in renin. Uh, increase in renin will cause increase in aldosterone. Okay. Uh, magnesium, it's going to, serum magnesium should be decreased or no change. Okay, no change. It's going to get decrease in Gilman then. Decrease in Gilman, right? Because of the um, polarity or the gradient, uh, you know, it's going to get decreased in here. So what happens here? Uh, sodium gets reabsorbed for calcium. Or, I mean, uh, sorry. Calcium gets reabsorbed for sodium, right? But now that's not going to happen. So you'll have increased amount of calcium going out. Or decrease hold on what was Gittleman gotta check out 
uh, reabsorption defect of sodium and calcium. So if you don't have sodium and calcium coming in, you won't have calcium coming in either through that and magnesium. Okay. So decrease in that and that. Uh, what's happening to blood pressure? Uh, it's not going to have any effect on it. Okay, uh, what's happening to plasma renin? If no effect on that, ideally wouldn't have any effect on this, but sodium is still going to get leaked out. It's not going to get reabsorbed here, so I guess it's going to increase. If that increases, aldosterone increases. Okay. okay. And literal or same, right? So that's your same as menlocorticoid. So that's going to uh, increase blood pressure in this, but low syndrome means nothing comes in or right or does it keep taking it in i'm getting confused now hold on before we do that let's look at it so cortisol activates uh right so it's 11b uh hsd okay so that means uh you have cortisol cortisol acts like a glucocorticoid so you'll have increase in bp okay increase in that will cause decrease in renin Increase, decrease in renin will cause decrease in aldosterone and uh, what happens to this no effect and no effect okay. uh, Gettleman's uh, acid base physiology okay so metabolic acid base disorder causes um, bicarbonate alteration Respiratory acid base disorder causes PCO2 uh, alteration. Okay, uh, so what it's saying is that in metabolic acid or acidosis or alkalosis, we uh, look at HCO3, the levels of that, and in uh, respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, we would look at CO2 levels on this. Okay. Uh, Let's put up a block here. Uh, I'll just go over this thing first before we look at these. Okay, so it should be easier after that. Okay. All right, so what happens is uh, the pH is uh, increase in pH happens when there is decrease in CO2 in the lungs at least. So pH in lungs get increased if there is decrease in CO2, uh, right? And if there is increase in CO2, the pH decreases. So CO2 is the one that uh, basically regulates the acidity Right, so increase in uh, CO2 increases acidity and decrease in CO2 decreases the acidity. So when I say decrease in acidity, I mean alkalosis, right? So one more time, uh, increase in CO2 will cause increase in uh, acidity. That means it decreases pH, right? Because acidic pH is when it's decreased. And decrease in CO2 will cause alkalosis or uh, decrease in uh, acidity or increase in pH and increase in pH is alkalosis okay in uh, metabolic acidosis or alkalosis it's HCO3 so increasing HCO3 causes uh, increase in pH uh, which means there's metabolic alkalosis decrease in HCO3 means that there is decrease in uh, alkalosis which means there is increase in acidity right so there will be decrease in pH so decrease in uh, HCO3 will cause decrease in pH which is acidity okay hopefully I didn't confuse you guys uh, so what happens is uh, our body tries to keep it at equilibrium right um, keeps the balance of pH so uh, if there is uh, increase or decrease in the levels of CO2, uh, according to UWorld, 
uh, these are the levels right here. So CO2 needs a uh, normal one is 33 to 45, right? So if it's less than 33, uh, that means there's decrease in CO2. That means um, it's going into alkalosis, right? So if there's uh, increase in CO2, partial pressure of CO2, which is more than 45, it's going into acidosis. So respiratory acidosis then, right? Uh, and when any of that alteration happens, the body tries to keep an equilibrium. So it's going to balance it out by either secreting, uh, excreting HCO3 or reabsorbing HCO3, right? So during acidosis, it tries to up the reabsorption of SCO3. And during alkalosis, it tries to decrease the reabsorption and increase the excretion of HCO3. And vice versa, increase in HCO3 will cause uh, metabolic alkalosis. That means the body is going to try to retain uh, CO2 to cause respiratory acidosis to compensate for it, right? And vice versa as well. So decreasing HCO3 causes metabolic acidosis. That means it tries to get, uh, as compensation, the uh, body is going to try to hyperventilate and get rid of the CO2 to de reduce the uh, CO2, which will cause uh, increase in pH or, you know, decrease in, uh, I mean, increase in, yeah, decrease in acidosis causing alkalosis, right? So in metabolic acidosis, uh, body tries to do respiratory acidosis, right? And in metabolic acidosis, uh, the body tries to do respiratory alkalosis, vice versa. Okay, now that we know that, and these are the normal values, uh, we'll look at it later. Uh, in metabolic okay. acidosis, what happens? Uh, metabolic acidosis, the pH, right? It's acidosis, so pH is going to decrease, right? Uh, so when there's decrease in, uh, there's reduced uh, HCO3 in this, right? Uh, so what's going to happen as a compensation, right? So the red ones are compensatory. Uh, so I told you already, if uh, acidosis is there, then body's going to try and do what? It's going to do respiratory alkalosis in return. So alkalosis happens when uh, CO2 is reduced, right? So PCO2 is going to reduce, right, as a compensation to cause respiratory alkalosis. Uh, what's going to happen to bicarbonate uh, in acidosis is going to reduce, right? Because that's how you get that. So basically, they'll give you uh, values and then you look at the values. So first step you do is you look at the values of um, PCO2. Either this is going to be normal or the bicarbonate is going to be normal. Okay. And then you got to figure out which one was the compensatory uh, one. Okay, so it's going to be either this or this that got compensated. Uh, another clue is that if it's, um, you know, metabolic, it's going to be right away. But if it's something to do with uh, respiratory alkalosis or acidosis, the compensation takes around a week to happen. Okay. Okay, going on to metabolic... Uh, yeah, so it does compensation by hyperventilating. So there will be carbon washout when you went, ventilate because diffusion carbon dioxide is much faster than uh, you know diffusion of oxygen so you'll get uh, wash out much faster than you'll get hypox uh, I mean you know increase in partial pressure of oxygen okay uh, metabolic alkalosis uh, that is uh, what what will happen to pH Increase in pH is alkalosis, right? So increase in pH. So metabolic alkalosis happens how? When there is more HCO3, right? In metabolic alkalosis or in the body. So you'll have increased amount of that. So as compensation, what's going to happen? The body is going to try to do uh, respiratory acidosis to compensate for metabolic alkalosis, right? How do you get that? You get that by increasing in CO2, right, carbon dioxide. How do you do that? You retain it. So how do you retain it? 
uh, it's called hypoventilation instead of hyper, right? So CO2 increase as compensation, uh, HCO3 is increased and you do hypoventilation. And these are immediate effects, okay? And respiratory acidosis, you have uh, what to the pH? Uh, acidosis is when you have increased amount of uh, CO2, right? So it could be because of uh, your respiratory muscle paralysis or you're in respiratory depression due to overdosing on drugs or you have uh, myasthenia gravis or polio or MS, ELS, I don't know. All these reasons that are going to uh, retain carbon dioxide in it, right? So acidosis is reduction in pH, right? So reduced or decreased. And then uh, PCO2 is going to be increased, right? And as a compensation of respiratory acidosis, body's going to try to balance it out by doing metabolic alkalosis. And how do you get metabolic alkalosis? You have increase in HCO3, right? So you increase it. Uh, so how do you increase it? You increase the renal reabsorption of HCO3. And this is delayed. And by delayed, they mean it's going to take at least like a week, anywhere from four to seven days to do that. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the exact days, but anything more than like, I guess, three to four days is going to be delayed. Okay. Uh, respiratory alkalosis. Uh, so alkalosis, that means pH is going to be what? Uh, more than this uh, range or less than this range? It's going to be more than this range, right? That's what alkalosis is. So it's going to be more than 7.45. So it's going to increase. Uh, what about PCO2? So it's respiratory alkalosis. How do you get alkalosis? It's when you have reduced amount of CO2, right? It gets uh, reduced in this. So... Yeah, so you'll have decreased amount of PCO2. And as a compensation, uh, what does the body try to do to balance it out? It's going to try to create uh, respiratory acidosis, uh, metabolic acidosis, right? So how do you get metabolic acidosis um, in contest to HCO3? Uh, you get reduced amount of HCO3, right? So decreased reabsorption of this and increased excretion of HCO3. So you, the levels of serum HCO3 will be reduced as compensation. So renal, uh, decrease in renal bicarbonate reabsorption. This is also delayed, okay? Okay, so uh, Henderson-Hasselbeck equation, you don't need to know this, so I'm not gonna go over that. Uh, predicted respiratory compensation for a simple metabolic acidosis can be calculated using the Winters formula. Okay, uh, if measured uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is more than the predicted partial pressure of carbon dioxide, it means that there is concomitant uh, respiratory acidosis. If the measured PCO2 is less than predicted PCO2, there is concomitant respiratory alkalosis. Okay, uh, that's just basically what we did here, increase and decrease. Uh, so if there's increase amount of this, then the predicted one, predicted ones are these, All right? So if PCO2 is more than this, it's going to be uh, acidosis, right? And if it's less than this, these values, it's going to be alkalosis. That's all that's saying. Uh, PCO2 is equal to 1.5. This is a constant. Uh, multiplied by the HCO3. Uh, so whatever value they give you for HCO3, you plug it in, right? And then you have the, and then plus eight, uh, plus minus, plus in uh, increase in pH, minus in decrease in pH, right? Depending on acidosis, alkalosis, whatever. Okay, uh, two. And that's how you get the PCO2 and then whatever the value you get, 
uh, you put it in here and then you figure out if it's increase or decrease okay uh, and that's how you figure out if it's uh, compensatory or not uh, most of the time you don't need this you can just tell which one's compensatory and which one's not uh, even without it so it's cool but just keep that in the head like back of your head 1.5 times bicarbonate plus 8 plus 2 or minus 2 if it's uh, acidosis okay uh, acidosis and alkalosis so uh, the pH here uh, they're using 7.35 and 7.45 right so that corresponds to this okay so say you have more than uh, a pH that's more than uh, 7.45 that means you have alkalosis right then you got to figure out if it's metabolic alkalosis or metabolic as uh, sorry respiratory alkalosis right so you got to figure out if it's uh, metabolic or respiratory alkalosis okay how do you figure that out if you have pco2 that's less than 36 mmhg right uh, they're using 36 here we have 33 for u world okay so 33 uh, sorry yeah if it's less than 33 it's gonna be uh, respiratory alkalosis okay but if you have normal range in pco2 for pco2 but more uh, increased range for bicarbonate which is 22 to 28 so more than 28 you have metabolic alkalosis okay uh, when would you have respiratory alkalosis when you have carbon washout right when carbon is going out and you know reducing the amount of carbon dioxide built up in the lungs that's when you have this so that happens during hyperventilation right so hyperventilation that can happen due to anxiety or panic attack uh, hypoxemia for example high altitude because high altitude you have less oxygen saturation or like you know less oxygen in, in the atmosphere so you'll have less oxygen and saturation and parietal pressure of oxygen is going to be less as well uh, salicylates okay so early hyperventilation for that tumor will cause uh, hyperventilation and pulmonary embolism as well and also pregnancy because you need to you know oxygen demand is increased in pregnancy because 80% of the oxygen is going to get diverted to the fetus first and then the rest uh, but say you have metabolic alkalosis right if the bicarbonate is increased then you check the urine chloride okay uh, so chloride is given right here 95 to 105 sometimes they give it sometimes they don't if they give it they want you to differentiate between these two but if that's not given it's gonna be any of these okay uh, so if you check the chloride and it's more than 20 or less than 20 okay so if it's more than 20 uh, chlorine uh, that means it's because of hyperaldosteronism, Barter syndrome, or Gilman syndrome. Okay. Because uh, that also, you know, causes your negative chloride ions. And bicarbonate is also negative ions. I'm skipping on the mechanism why it's saline, saline resistant. But just, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out if it's any of these okay if you have more chlorine in the urine it's going to be because of this if you have less chlorine in the urine less than 20 then it's because of vomiting uh, recent uh, loop on uh, thiazide diuretics and antacids why because what happens when you vomit you get rid of stomach acid what's stomach acid made of H right so that's H ions are usually as uh, the ones that cause acidity right or acidic pH right so you're losing the acidic pH causing hydrogen ions what's that attached to Cl because it's HCl that is uh, stomach acid so you're using uh, losing the you know Cl from the vomit so you won't see it in the urine 
but you're still losing it, right? So that's how you're getting metabolic acid ketosis for because of that alkalosis because of that. Uh, recent loop and thiazide diuretics. Okay, and antacids. Antacids similar. It, you won't get you know chlorine coming in to your stomach acid and all that from the parietal cells of the stomach. Okay. Cool. On to acidemia. The acidosis, uh, usually this is a more popular one because it has this thing, the anion gap that you need to check. Okay, so acidosis, uh, so you have pH that's less than 7.35, uh, right? So what's the next step? You got to figure out if the acidosis is because of respiratory causes or metabolic causes. How do you check that? In respiratory, if there's increase in CO2, you have respiratory acidosis if you're decreasing hco3 you have metabolic acidosis okay so if you have increase in pco2 uh, more than 44 right or 45 according to this now uh, if there's ever a discrepancy between the fa and uh, u world always listen to u world and not fa okay uh Okay, so more than 44, uh, then you know that it's respiratory acidosis. And respiratory acidosis happens when you're retaining carbon dioxide because of paralysis, obstruction, or anything like that, right? Uh, or overdose on pills and drugs and, you know, respiratory depression. So hypoventilation due to uh, airway obstruction, uh, acute lung disease, or chronic lung disease, opioids or sedatives or weakening of respiratory muscles right so all of these causes uh, reasons will cause retention of carbon dioxide or uh, hypoventilation uh, if it's uh, metabolic acidosis right then you're gonna have bicarbonate more than uh, sorry uh, less than 22 right or 20 here but 22 here because that's what uh, that is what represents the thing uh, alterations in this for metabolic acid based disorders right uh, so less than that you figured out that it's metabolic acidosis the next step uh, for metabolic acidosis you got to figure out one if they give you all these values uh, which they usually will but if they don't then it could be any one of these causes but if they give you this that means they want they're testing your knowledge on you know if you can figure out which one it is out of these okay usually if you just remember all of these and this even without doing this you'll see that four out of five are going to be from normal and iron gap if the correct answer is increase and iron gap right or vice versa yeah if four out of five uh, options are from here and one is over here then the one that's here is going to be the answer okay but anyways, you figured out it's metabolic alkalosis, acidosis, sorry. Um, the next step would be to check uh, anion gaps. How do you check that? You'd put plug in the cal uh, chloride and bicarbonate values, and you add them up, and you subtract it out of uh, the value they gave you for sodium, okay? And it's going to be between 8 and 12. Okay, It's not going to be less than 8 because that's impossible uh, to have. Okay, so if you have a value that's in between 8 and 12, then you have normal anion gap, okay? And if the value is more than 12, it, you have increased anion gap, okay? So sodium minus the sum of chlorine and uh, bicarbonate. Why chlorine bicarbonate? Because they both are negative ions, and you're subtracting the negative ions from the positive ion, which is sodium. Uh, so if you have increased anion gap or normal anion gap, the way I remember the mnemonics for these is, uh, you know, old people are pretty, uh, stuck up or they're pretty hard ass, right? So they don't move around much, uh, in their beliefs and stuff. So what they were believing before is what they want to believe right now. Cause that's normal for them. So normal anion gap is hard ass. And hard as that's how I remember that. And you know, 
if you have increase uh, increase in grades or marks uh, you get a gold mark so increase in anion gap is gold mark uh, remember it however you want to but don't mix those up okay so H for hypercholeremia and hyperalimentation uh, Edison's disease renal tubular acidosis that's an important one to remember because we are doing renal and that's the one that causes that uh, renal tubular acidosis is different than renal failure because renal failure is the one causing increase in anion gap okay uh, diarrhea right and uh, acetazolamide uh, spironolactone and saline infusion why would you have uh, this uh, normal anion and diarrhea it's because in diarrhea you also lose sodium ions right uh, along with the bicarbonate ions so the gaps not gonna you know you have reduction in this and this so it's gonna stay the same uh, right okay uh, acetazolamide it causes uh, metabolic acidosis right so acid acetazolamide that's how you pronounce that uh, causes alkalosis of the urine I think uh, let me look at that up. I'm, this is the second time I'm saying that, but I'm not really sure. Okay, okay so mechanism this is this uh, limited bicarbonate. This. Yeah, so it alkalizes the urine, so it causes metabolic acidosis. Acetazolamide causes acidosis. That is metabolic acidosis. Okay, back to hard ass. Okay, and uh, spironolactone and saline infusion. This is an important one too. Okay, so... Once again, hypercholeremia, hyperalimentation, Edison's disease, renal tubular acidosis, diarrhea, acetazolamide, and spironolactone, and saline infusion. Uh, we'll put a thing on that. Uh, goal mark, G for glycols, ethylene glycol, propanyl glycol. So this is usually found in uh, antifreeze. Uh, so it's going to be in someone you know, who was depressed for a long time, came in, uh, emergency department, uh, and they're having a uh, depressed breathing or, you know, all this, they give you all these more uh, levels of serum levels for all this. You figure out uh, everything and then you're like, okay, they give you glycol, oxyproline, they give you all of these for the thing. And you're gonna be between methanol and something else, uh, right? So how do you know it's this? Uh, the only way you know this is that you, if you know that it's an antifreeze and antifreeze is like one of the causes, like, you know, most used uh, thing to commit suicide with. So ethylene glycol is going to be there for someone who commits suicide in the question stem or attempts to commit suicide, right? So glycols, ethylene glycol and propylene, uh, propylene, Lenine glycol. Well, I'm getting zoned out, sorry. Oxoprolin, uh, chronic acetaminophen use. L lactate, lactic acidosis. D lactate, exogenous lactic acidosis. Methanol and other alcohols. Aspirin, late effect. Uh, renal failure and ketones. Diabetic, alcoholic, and starvation. One more time G for glycols, O for oxyprolin. Uh, that's from chronic acetaminophen use, L-lactate, uh, which is lactic acidosis. Um, you'll have this when, you know, uh, you have low oxygen, right? Because in glycolysis, that's how that happens. Uh, or when you have inhibition of PDH or pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, that also causes an increase in lactic acidosis because then the 
ATP is coming from NAD, NADH. Okay, uh, or energy, right? Uh, D lactate, which is exogenous lactic acid, uh, acid. Uh, methanol, and other alcohols. Uh, aspirin, or late effect. Uh, renal failure and ketones. So, renal failure, again, not the same as uh, whatever was here. So, we'll do those now without looking. Try to just, you know, think along uh, while we do this. So H4 was for what? Hypercholesteremia and hyperalimentation, right? Uh, and that A was for Addison's disease. Okay, R was for renal tubular acidosis. Uh, D was for diarrhea. Uh, A was for, oh crap, I forgot that one. S was for spironolactone, and other S was for saline infusion. This A was for, let's see, acetazolamide, right? Okay. So, take a look at that, and then on to this. Uh, G was for glycol, uh, so ethylene glycol or Prolinine uh, glycol. Right. O was for oxyproline from chronic acetaminophen use. L lactate and D lactate. L lactate uh, lactic acid, D lactate exogenous lactic acid. M was for methanol. Uh, A was for aspirin. R was for renal failure. Q was for ketone. Diabetic ketoacidosis is in the name. Lactic acidosis is in the name as well. Right, so then you don't have to bother figuring out if it's acidosis or alkalosis. Then you just got to figure out why it's happening. Okay, so alcohol, starvation, and diabetic causes ketones. Okay. Uh, okay, let's look at this chart now. They give you this chart, and then, hold on. Let me do this. Put it here and here, here. Close your eyes, don't look at this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they'll give you a chart like this, they give you everything, and then they'll tell you what the levels are. So if the levels for HCO3 is low, right, and um, the pH is also low, what does that mean? So if pH is low, that means it's acidosis, right? Uh, and if they're giving you HCO3 is low as well, that means it's metabolic acidosis, right? So this should be metabolic acidosis, okay? If they're giving you that pH is low, uh, but uh, bicarbonate is high, what does that mean? So bicarbonate is up here more than uh, 28 right so anywhere more than here uh, so this is where your carbon uh, dioxide comes in right so carbon dioxide if it's low uh, in this line or something like that I guess okay by uh, carbon dioxide doesn't really I don't know how to read that but you'll get it when they give you in a question so they'll tell you that uh, bicarbonate is high and pH is low, so it's going to be respiratory acidosis, right? Because bicarbonate is normal or increased. Uh, so that could be because of compensation, right? So respiratory acidosis. Okay, uh, say the pH is increased and uh, bicarbonate is increased. What does that mean? pH is increased. So that's telling you it's alkalosis, bicarbonate is increased, that's telling you it's because of metabolic alkalosis, right? So that's going to be up there. And then if they're telling you pH is increased but bicarbonate is decreased, what's that telling you? 
it's because uh, PCO2 is pretty high right up here uh, for the thing so that's going to be your respiratory alkalosis yeah so that leaves this two areas right uh, we haven't done that so let's just look at it okay if the levels are over here it's called mixed acidosis and the levels are over here and it's called mixed alkalosis they do not test you on it so you don't really need to worry about it but it's basically uh, in the middle or like it's compensated already that's why it's like that okay so if the compensation has already occurred these are the values you'll get that uh, pH is less but the uh, plasma levels are like in the middle it's from 22 to 28 that means it's trying to compensate it's going to be like on the higher end of 28 like uh, of the range over here and this is going to be like the pH is for alkalosis is going to be on the lower end or something like that for bicarbonate okay or yeah that's when you get mixed alkalosis okay I'm done with that uh, renal tubular acidosis okay so this is distal renal tubular acidosis type 1 proximal renal tubular acidosis type 2 and hyperkalemia uh, tubular acidosis which is RTA type 4 okay so they give you these right here cool uh, there is a nice little video by dirty medicine that goes through this and he gives you basically a way to remember these if you don't want to you know just bother understanding the concept you can just memorize the way he tells you and you'll get the questions right with that too but we'll try to understand it okay uh renal tubular acidosis how much time do i have still have time okay uh renal tubular acidosis distal renal tubular acidosis rta type 1 Okay, where does it happen? Inability of alpha intercalated uh, cells to secrete H uh, ions. So no new bicarbonate is generated. So this causes metabolic acidosis. Okay. Uh, so this happens in collecting tubule then, doesn't it? Let me check my notes. Never mind, it happens in uh, this uh, So, let me draw the thing. Proximal tubule, descending, ascending, uh, distal convoluted tubule, and then collecting duct over here. Okay. So, type 1 happens here, type 2 happens over here, and type 4 happens over here okay so it's the inability of uh, alpha intercalated cells to secrete H uh, ions okay so the H ions are not you know getting released from alpha intercalated cells because of RTA1 okay so it's using the carbonic anhydrase to make H2O uh, H2CO3 it gets split into bicarbonate and H, and H is not able to go out. Okay, and this is causing, you know, H causes acidosis, so uh, it's going to lead to metabolic acidosis. The urine pH is going to be more than 5.5 because you don't have H ions in that, so it's going to be more alkalosis than it is acidosis, right? Uh, normal pH of uh, urine is what? I don't know. Anywhere from that to that? No. Uh, 
Uh, okay, whatever it is, it's you know more than five point five. Okay, it's, it's gonna cause there's no H ions in it. Okay, uh, what's gonna happen to serum or K? It's gonna be decreased. Okay. Uh, Okay, because if H is not going out, that means K is not going to come back in. Okay. So K is going out in the urine, right? So that's why you have decrease in K. Causes are acetaminophen, B, toxicity. Uh, sorry, not acetaminophen. It's amphotericin B. Oh, wow. Okay. Amphotericin B toxicity, analgesic ne uh, nephropathy, congenital anomalies, obstruction of urinary tract autoimmune disease, for example, SLE. Okay. Uh, association is there's increased risk of calcium. Uh, okay. So increased risk of calcium phosphate, kidney stones uh, due to increase in urine pH and increase in bone turnover related to buffering okay yeah I think I'm gonna go with the dirty medicine route and just memorize the values but let's get through this and we'll look at the dirty medicine one okay so increased risk of uh, calcium phosphate kidney stones okay due to increase in uh, urine pH so since it's alkalosis and increase in bone turnover related to the buffering. Uh, then you have uh, proximal. So this is distal tubular acidosis, right? So it happens in distal convoluted tubule. Now we have proximal. That happens in proximal tubules okay, or RT2. So what happens here is there's a defect in PCT bicarbonate reabsorption. So there's increase in excretion of bicarbonate in the urine causing metabolic acidosis again. Uh, urine can be acidified by alpha intercalated cells in the collecting duct, but not enough to overcome the increase in bicarbonate excretion. So, urine pH, it could be less than 5.5 when plasma bicarbonate is below the reduced re reabsorption threshold, but it could be more than 5.5 when filtered bicarbonate exceeds more resorptive threshold. Again, serum potassium is decreased. Uh, so you have this and this bicarbonate is not getting you know reabsorbed so it's going to go out uh, each is going out okay. and in alpha intercalated it's doing this and each is going in and that okay. makes no sense to me but at the moment because my brain is slow uh, cases, uh, Fanconi syndrome, that's proximal tubular, right? Uh, disease, uh, multiple myeloma, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, okay? If you have inhibitors like that, it's not going to convert, uh, it's not going to do this thing right here. Convert H2CO3 into carbon dioxide and H2O. So since that is not happening, the H ions goes into the urine. And then here it gets increased as well. Okay. Uh, association increased risk of hypophosphatemic rickets in Fanconi syndrome. Uh, hyperkalemic tubular acidosis, RTA type 4. Uh, hyper, hypoaldosteronism or aldosterone sterone resistance. Okay. So if you have low hypoaldosteronism, Right. What does aldosterone do? It reabsorbs sodium and it excretes potassium, right? So at least we know the serum potassium is going to increase. If in any uh, question, if they give you that there's increase in serum potassium and they're hinting to RTA, you know that increase in potassium only happens in RTA type 4. Okay, And that's because of hypoaldosteronism or uh, aldosterone uh, resistance which causes increase in hy uh, or hyperkalemia, which leads to decrease in uh, NH3 or ammonia synthesis and PCT, which leads to decrease in ammonium excretion. Okay. 
so here you will have a pH that is less than 5.5. It's variable though. Causes are decrease in aldosterone production. For example, diabetic, hyporeninism, ACE inhibitor, ARB, NSAIDs, heparin, uh, cyclosporin, adrenal insufficiency, or aldosterone resistance. Uh, for example, potassium sparing diuretics, uh, nephropathy due to obstruction and PMP SMX. Okay. So RTA prevents this aldosterone, so aldosterone gets inhibited. So you won't have, you know, the age uh, combining to the ammonia. Okay. All that. So potassium is inhibited by that and that is not going to go so if a k is not in there then nh3 is not going to be made if nh3 is not going to be made nh4 is not going to be made uh, by combining to another hydrogen ion down here from the alpha intercalated cell okay let's look at the dirty medicine one Uh, so proximal that 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 uh, so he's going to tell you that type 1 happens here type 2 happens there type 4 happens there uh, to make a chart like this so potassium calcium and pH okay and then you have to remember 214 okay 214 isn't he's going to put it down there because it goes from 2, 1, and 4 if you go from right to left, right? So 2, 1, 4, where the potassium levels are low, low, and more. 2, 1, 4, low, low, more. And then for calcium. Okay, so these are the even ones. Okay. So even numbers are normal, and the odd one is high. So in... Uh, so if you just, you know, as soon as you go in and just draw this chart on the thing, that will help you too. So you won't have to guess uh, for the exam. But yeah, so 214, low, low, more. Calcium is normal, high, normal. Two uh, even ones. So that's two and four. Calcium is going to be normal for those two. Okay. But potassium is high for this one. And then the pH is going to be... Uh, for the even one, it's going to be less than 5.5, and for one, it's going to be more than 5.5, okay? And then, does it make uh, stones? So, calcium is normal here, so no stones for that. Calcium is normal here, so no stones for that. Uh, calcium is high, and the pH is high as well, because... Uh, it makes stone and alkalosis uh, environment or alkaline environment, right? So there's stone in that. <clears throat> so if you figure out it's type 1, 2, or 4. So again, 2, 1, 4, low, low, more, normal, high, normal, low, high, low, no, yes, no. Okay, it rhymes. Uh, then they're going to ask you what uh, causes this, right? So... Type 4, it's usually going to be SLE or sickle cell. Uh, Sjogren or rheumatoid arthritis for this. But I think they changed it up now. Okay. Because uh, we just read that SLE is for this, right? Uh, which is type 1. And here he said SLE is for type 4. So type 1 for that. Uh... We'll just go over the causes one more time. Amphotericin B, toxicity, analgesic ne ne nephropathy, congenital anomalies, obstruction of urinary tract, autoimmune disease. For example, SLE over there. Okay. Uh, for type 2, it's Fanconi, because uh, we know where proximal tubular is, so we know that it's going to Fanconi attacks there, or disease occurs there. Uh, multiple myeloma and carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Important one is Fanconi over here. Over here, it's uh, autoimmune disease. Okay. And over here, uh, unless they're like, you know, going through some kind of surgery or something and then they have 
analgesic nephropathy because of that, and hyperkalemic tubular acidosis. It's okay. uh, the causes here are decrease in aldosterone production, for example, diabetic hyporeninism, ACE inhibitor, ARP, NSAIDs, uh, heparin, cyclosporine, adrenal insufficiency, or adrenal resistance, and this, this. So here, mostly it's because of something to do with aldosterone or potassium sparing uh, diuretics and nephropathy due to obstruction or PMP SMX. Okay. Uh, remember this chart and you should be good enough to get to your answer because of this. So 214, low, low more for potassium. Then comes the calcium. With the even ones, those are normal for pH is going to be less than 5.5 and no stone formation for that stone formation only happens for one okay and Fanconi have uh, sorry not Fanconi one is uh, autoimmune one or estimate of uh, sorry again and for tericin B toxicity uh, on to pathology uh, we have 10 minutes we should be able to get through this casts uh, presence of cast indicates the hematuria that hematuria pyuria is of glomerular or renal tubular origin bladder cancer uh, kidney stones will lead to hematuria and no casts Not bigger. okay okay so this is important if you have a cancer or uh, bladder cancer or kidney stones they lead to hematuria, but there won't be any casts, okay? Uh, if you have acute uh, cystitis, you will have pyuria, so WBC, but again, no cast, okay? Uh, so presence of cast will do what? It indicates that uh, hematuria or pyuria is of glomerular or renal tubular origin, okay? So it's happening in loop of Henle or the glomerulus. Anything outside of that, you won't get any casts formation in bladder and kidney stone you'll get hematuria and in acute cystitis you'll get pyuria so if you have rbc casts uh it's usually because of you know glomerular tubular origin so uh, glomerular nephritis okay so rbc casts because of glomerular nephritis or hypertensive emergency these are important to remember because that can give you a, uh, the answer right away you might not even have to go or reading the whole question if you sometimes that's all they ask you and they give you the options and if you see this and you read the last line of the question and if you're comfortable you can just pick it uh, glomerulonephritis and hypertensive emergency causes rbc cast wc cast uh, that happens because of some kind of inflammation right so tubular interstitial inflammation or acute pyelonephritis so uh, inflammation of the that uh, because of infection or transplant rejection okay that will also give you WBC cast and that's what it looks like uh, type A looks granular like that okay uh, not granular but like because granular would be this so a clumped up you know that and WBC would look like that. Uh, granular, this is an important one to know uh, from the picture because uh, if you see that, it's called the muddy cast. Uh, it's because of acute tubular necrosis. It can be muddy and brown in appearance. Okay, so I need to know that one. Fatty cast or oval fat bodies. Uh, this happens in nephrotic syndrome. It's associated with Maltese cross sign. Uh, easiest one to uh, figure out because if this is the type of photo they'll give you and if you see this it's nephrotic syndrome and it's made of fatty casts uh, this is a important one vaxi cast because they'll give you and you won't understand what it is and then you'll remember oh yeah vaxi cast look like that but then you won't remember what caused it it's caused in end stage uh, renal disease or chronic kidney disease. Okay, both of these chronic kidney or renal, end stage renal disease. Vexicast. Uh, sorry, that's not Vexicast, that's Highline. 
So XCast, what does that look like? Okay, so that's what Vexicast looks like, and you need to know that it looks like this. Okay, so that's a horrible picture. Okay, so example A is highline uh, and granular, B and uh, C are highline and muddy, and D e is just highline and coarse granular. So that doesn't help. Okay, so Vexi we know now. And then there's something called Highline Casts. The, these are non-specific, but it's because of uh, light chains or something like that. So, or this thing, okay. So non-specific can be normal finding with dehydration. This is important. Exercise and or uh, diuretic therapy form via solidification of TAM, horse fall, mucoprotein, uromodulin, secreted by renal tubular cells to prevent UTIs. Okay, so it's a normal finding. Uh, okay, let's look at more pictures of this. Okay, so that's a highland cast. That's, this is a highland cast. Let's look at it here. Highland cast. Cool. Okay. Uh, you need to be able to identify these casts. And f if you can do that and remember these, because it's easy to remember. RBC happens because of hypertension and glomerulonephritis. Actually, let's do this. So, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Let's do that and then we'll take a break. So RBC, it's because of glomerulonephritis and hypertension, right? Um, WBC is because of inflammation, so pyelonephritis, uh, transplant rejection, and uh, tubular interstitial inflammation, right? Granular cast, uh, this was important because of muddy cast, and muddy cast is in acute tubular necrosis, ATN. Fatty cast, it's uh, fatty, uh, Maltese cross, and uh, nephrotic syndrome. Right. Uh, vexy cast, uh, vexy casts are, uh, what was it? Uh, end stage renal disease and uh, chronic kidney disease. Right. And then highline cast, it's normal finding, um, but you can see it in, during diuretic use, dehydration, and all that, and also because of temps fall on uh, horse something. Uh, so what is that? We need to look into that, don't we? Tem horse fall mucoprotein, or duromodulin. So what is that? Uh, also is this a, a domain containing glycoprotein that in humans is encoded by this? Major protein of the normal urine and it's the primary component of vaccine nephron and this has been localized in thick ascending and this and then that's tubular. Okay. What is the associated in this? Okay, inner disease of Okay, cool. Let's take a break here now. Uh, finished this uh, cast in urine yesterday and we are on to nomenclature of low medullary disorders. Um I usually just skip this because this ends up confusing you. Um, but so I'm going to do that. I'm just going to skip that. You don't need to know that stuff. Uh, on to glomerular diseases. Okay. Uh, so in nephritic syn uh, syndrome, you'll see RBCs and a little bit of uh, this wedge cells, uh, which are proteins. Okay. So RBCs and... Uh, a little bit of protein, whereas in nephrotic, you'll see proteins and a little bit of RBCs. And then when you have uh, nephritic nephrotic syndrome, where you have both. Okay, so nephritic, it's uh, glomerular inflammation uh, that leads to uh, glomerular basement membrane damage, right? So this is a glomerular capillary with the basement membrane right there. 
Okay, these are the endothelial on the inside and podocytes on the outside. Okay, and urinary brown space over okay, Bowman's space. Okay, so glomerular inflammation and GBM damage, which leads to loss of RBCs into urine. Okay, so RBCs in the urine. Uh, this leads to dysmorphic RBCs and hematuria. Now, uh, the presentation you have is uh, hematuria, RBC casts in urine, and decrease in GFR, which leads to oliguria, azotemia, uh, increase in renin release, uh, hypertension, proteinuria. Okay, so all of this stuff. Proteinuria often in the subnephrotic range, less than 3.5 grams per day, uh, but in severe cases, maybe in nephrotic range. Okay, uh, have to remember that because there are times where you'll see uh, proteins uh, in the urine, and you're going to think that it's nephrotic, but it ends up being nef uh, nephritic. Okay, uh, these are the examples. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry about that for now. Uh, nephrotic syndrome, podocyte damage. So how do you get uh, um, protein in your nephrotic, I mean, uh, in your urine, right? In nephrotic syndrome. Remember, uh, protein, which is albumin, is negatively charged. And so is this uh, layer right here. Okay, uh, so it's impossible for protein to actually go through the podocytes because they only allow less than... Uh, 40 to 50 uh, what was it microgram to leak through right and endothelial allows only anything less than 100 but uh, now that you're seeing this that means there's uh, some problem here in the podocytes right so when there's problem with the podocyte that's when you start getting uh, protein leaking through in your uh, urine okay so podocyte damage impaired charge barrier uh, leads to proteinuria okay uh, it's simple right over nephritic it was uh, basement membrane right so loss of RBCs in urine and here you have proteinuria so massive proteinuria more than 3.5 grams per day with uh, edema hypoalbuminemia uh, I've mispronounced that but I'm gonna move on Increase in hepatic lipogenesis and hypercholesteremia. Okay, you'll have frothy urine with fatty casts. If you have that, it's usually this, but you can also have frothy urine in other cases as well, like uh, dehydration, uh, glucosuria, like in diabetes. Okay, but for steps, it's going to be this. Uh, if you see frothy urine, it's nephrotic with fatty casts. Associated with hypercoagulable state due to antithrombin 3 loss in urine. Okay. So you have, uh, you'll have hypercoagulable state basically. Because now you don't have antithrombin to stop, you know, balance out the clots or clotting or coagulation cascades. Okay. Uh, loss in urine and increase in uh, risk of infection. Loss of immunoglobulin Gs as well. Because that's also a protein, right? In urine and soft tissue comprise of edema. Uh, you have that. Uh, don't need to worry about that right now. Nephritic and nephrotic syndrome. Uh, severe glomerular basement membrane damage. Leads to loss of RBCs into urine. Plus impaired charge barrier. Which leads to hematuria. Uh, plus proteinuria. Okay. So severe in here you have uh, damage of that which leaks out the RBCs into urine and you have the charge barrier as well so the podocytes are damaged here as well uh, and that leads to proteinuria right so you have hematuria and proteinuria nephrotic range proteinuria more than 3.5 grams per day and concomitant feature of nephritic syndrome um, what did we learn from here? Uh, the classic presentation, if you have blood in your urine, it's going to be nephritic. If you have protein in your urine, it's going to be nephrotic. How do you remember that? Protein has an O. Nephrotic has an O in it. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so you just remember that, and then you'll figure out that the uh, 
RBCs are nephritic, uh, proteins are nephrotic. Okay, uh, and if you have blood and uh, protein, it's going to be nephritic, nephrotic. These are important, so we'll look at the examples for these. Okay, so it can occur with any form of nephritic syndrome, but it's most common with uh, diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, DPGN, or membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis, or MPGN. Okay, DPGN and MPGN. Uh, what does diffuse mean? We'll look at that now. Uh, it means more than 50% of glomeruli are involved. Okay. And uh, membranous is thickening of glomerular mem uh, basement membrane. Okay. Uh, cool. On to nephritic. Uh, just a sec. Uh, nephritic syndrome. So I for inflammatory process. Cis. Okay. I have notes on this, so we'll look at those when we do this. Okay. Where are my notes at? Right here, okay. So when you get a question and you're, it's about this glomerular disease, uh, first thing you ask is how much protein is in the urine, right? If it's less than 3.5, it's going to be nephritic, right? And if it's more than 3.5, it's going to be nephrotic. So for nephrotic, uh, what you will see is hypo, uh, hypo, that should, oh, in, uh, in blood, you'll have hypoalbuminemia, right? But you'll have hyperlipidemia. Why? It's because liver overcompensates for kidney losing substances. Okay, so that's why you have hyperlipidemia. You'll have hypogammaglobinemia, right? IgGs are lost, and hypercoagulability. Why? Because you have antithrombin three loss in it, right? Uh, for these, you have focal segmental uh, glomerulosclerosis. Uh, minimal change disease, membranous nephropathy, diabetic glomerulonephropathy, and amyloidosis. We will look at those, so if you don't have to bother memorizing those right now. Okay, just understand what you will see in uh, nephrotic syndrome. You see all the loss of that, and you'll see hyperlipidemia. Why? Because liver overcompensates for kidney-losing substances. If the proteinuria is more than 3.5 grams per day, you have nephritic syndrome. Uh, so you have, uh, you'll see hypertension edema, uh, hematuria, and ecanthosis. Those are your burst cells and spur cells. Uh, Throne-like cytoplasmic projections are like the buzzwords for those. Uh, oliguria and azotemia. Okay. For this, you'll have post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, immunoglobin A, nephropathy, Alport syndrome, and membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis. Okay, so we already know this. Uh, this is the basement membrane right here. On the inside, where the blood is, you'll have uh, endothelial cells, right? And on the outside of the vessel, you'll have podocytes. Okay. Okay. Uh, post strep. So we'll read this one, and then we'll read the book. Uh, We'll go one by one. Okay, so post streptococcal glomerulonephritis or PSG. Okay, it's three letters. So PSG. It's usually uh, the children uh, that it happens in. Okay, so usually children about two to four weeks after group A beta hemolytic strep infection. Okay, group A was which one? Strep hygienes, right? Um, Type 3 hypersensitivity reaction is three letters, it's type 3. Or you can just remember the mechanism. It's when uh, after the immune uh, produces immunoglobulins and then there is antigen antibody complex. They go and get try to get filtered out, but they get settled in the kidneys uh, on the membrane, right? So that's how you end up with this. Uh, 
complex in there and then it does stuff there uh, inflammation and all that stuff because of uh, the complex okay uh, anti streptococcal antibodies so you'll have ESO positive or ESO titers uh, however you need to remember this there will be decreased serum uh, complement 3 levels right or C3 it's type 3 uh, serum C3 is decreased uh, so PSG or you can remember it as PS3 like PlayStation 3 why because there's type 3 hypersensitivity reaction it occurs three weeks after the infection this is important um, this is usually what the thing is going to tell you that it's after a few weeks uh, that this person is starting to have symptoms or this child uh, so ASO is positive right anti streptolysin uh, titer so that's three letters there's decrease in C3 so C3 and you'll see lumpy bumpy okay so lumpy bumpy is the type of uh, fluorescence or like uh, an electron microscope the thing you see on the basement membrane uh, it's gonna look lumpy and bumpy okay uh, so instead of why you just remember it as lump 3 and bump 3 okay uh, it's described as enlarged hypercellular uh, glomeruli okay uh, so that would be the buzzword if uh, if you want to remember that so enlarged hypercellular uh, hypercellular because uh, it's getting inflammation uh, and there's inflammation in that area right in the glomeruli so that's going to cause it to get big anyways so not that hard to remember that you'll have buzzwords like lumpy bumpy or granular or starry sky appearance uh, sub epithelial humps okay so when they say sub epithelial humps remember this was the basement membrane right uh, this is the uh, epithelial cells now so anything below the epithelial is known as subepithelia, right? So this is the subepithelia. It's between the basement membrane and podocytes. You see this thing because we just saw this is what uh, it looks like, right? So that's the normal. There's nothing be in between uh, the podocyte and basement membrane. But here you're seeing something in there, uh, okay? And You'll have effacement of podocyte. That's what it's called when they're moved around. It's called effacement of podocyte. This is the urinary space. Uh, so what you're seeing here is subepithelial hump-like immunocomplex deposit. Okay. So in if immunofluorescence, this is what it will look like. It looks like granules, right? Little granules, and that's why it's called granular or starry sky appearance. Okay, so lumpy bumpy is due to immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, and C3 deposition along glomerular basement membrane and mesangium. And that's why you have decreasing C3 in the serum. Okay, because that gets uh, stuck over there as well. Okay, uh, let's read the book now. Let me move that. We don't need that for now. Okay, so infection associated glomerular nephritis, they uh, changed the name for this. It used to be known as post streptococcal uh, glomerular nephritis, but now it's known as this. Uh, still the same thing though. Formerly called post infectious glomerular nephritis, uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction associated with hypocomplementemia, right? So C3 due to consumption. Uh, Children, most commonly caused by group A streptococcus, uh, right? We know that now. Post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. It's seen in approximately two to four weeks after a pharyngeal or skin infection, right? Uh, just remember three, because we are doing three. Uh, positive strep uh, serology, so ASO titer is going to be positive. Uh, usually resolves spontaneously. Adults, uh, so this was in children, right? But what about adults? If it happens in adults, in addition to group A streptococcus, it can also be caused by staphylococcus, okay? And that's why they changed it to infectious associated glomerular nephritis. This bit wasn't in the last one. Uh, seen during infection, 
infection site is variable, but uh, usually not upper respiratory tract. Okay. If it's uh, the infection was strep throat or something, it's going to be this one. But if it's nothing to do with upper respiratory tract, it's going to be Staphylococcus. Must be identified on culture as no serology test is available. So that's easy, right? They'll tell you it's uh, coagulase positive, gram positive, and probably beta hemolytic, right? May uh, and catalase positive too. May progress to renal insufficiency. Okay. So in light microscope, you'll see glomeruli enlarged and hypercellular. We know what that means now, right? So that's what that is. Uh, immunofluorescence, right? It looks like a granular, scary, uh, starry sky appearance, lumpy bumpy. Okay, it's due to immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, and uh, C3 deposition along the glomerular basement membrane and mesangium. Okay, uh, and that's why you get that lumpy bumpy. So you'll have two times. You'll either have this or you'll have linear. Uh, that you see oh, Then I show it. We'll see it when it comes. It's usually an IgA nephropathy. I think uh, They didn't say it but okay uh, So granular appearance or lumpy bumpy appearance. Okay, so these are the buzzwords for this It's due to IgG IgM and C3 deposition uh, along the GBM and mesangium in electron microscope, you'll see subepithelial immune complex humps. Okay, so we should be good to go with this now, right? IgA, let's look at this before we read. Okay. Uh, so here we have IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger's disease. Berger disease is uh, different than uh, it's different from the Bourgier disease or Berger disease that was uh, vasculitis, right? The vasculitis one was what it's, it happens because of smoking and uh, there are microthrombi and you know when they walk. Uh, they get gangrene on the distal limbs or like fingers or toes uh, and it gangrenes and all that. So how do you treat it? Oh, you just stop smoking. If you stop smoking, it goes away and it starts healing. Uh, so that was a vasculitis. Uh, I think medium vessel vasculitis. Uh, and IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger disease. This is different. That one was with the U. This is with no U in here. Think of this as the renal version of IgA vasculitis, right? Uh, normal C3 levels. So IgA was which one? Uh, we'll go look at that. Hold on. Vasculitis. So uh, that one is the other one, and IgA was Hanok. Hanok Schloin, yeah. So Hanok Schloin was the IgA one. Uh, it's the one with the purpura on the buttocks or legs, and that's the giveaway for this one. And it happens in Berger disease right there. They give you that over there. Okay, so once more, uh, also known as Berger disease, uh, think of this as the renal version of IgA vasculitis. Uh, you have normal C3 levels in this. Uh, there's increase in serum IgA levels though. Okay. 
Um, so what will you see? You'll see asymptomatic microhematuria following GI respiratory infection. Okay. Now in this, uh, in the question stem, they'll explain, you'll figure out that it's this, and then they'll have this one, uh, thing where they say that this person has recurrent hematuria okay that's actually a buzzword for this uh ig and nephropathy if you anywhere they mention that this person is having you know uh symptoms like uh a year ago they had a similar symptom and now they're having this symptom or like every two months they're having this or you know they had it like three years ago then every year they have been having it Anything that seems like it's recurrent hematuria is going to be IgA nephropathy. Okay, that's a buzzword. But it could be asymptomatic microhematuria following GI or respiratory infection as well. Uh, described as mesangial IgA deposition or mesangial proliferation. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this is similar to uh, what we saw before, the lumpy bumpy. But that one was uh, IgG and IgM. This is uh, this. Okay. And here you have mesangial proliferation. For these, they're not going to give you a photo or they're not going to mention like what they see. Or they will. Okay, they will, I guess. But I don't think I came across them telling us that there's mesangial proliferation. Because that could be anything. Uh, and most, uh, most of these do that. So that's very vague. That's not going to be a giveaway. Okay, so let's read this. Ig and nephropathy burger disease, episodic uh, hematuria that usually occurs concurrently with respiratory or GI tract infection. IgA is secreted by mucosal lining. Okay, so that's important. So episodic hematuria, that's recurrent uh, hematuria, that usually occurs concurrently with respiratory or GI tract infection. They might give you that. They might not give you that. You know, they might just say that this person had similar symptoms last season as well or something like that. IgA is secreted by mucosal lining. This is important to remember. Renal pathology of IgA vasculitis or henlock schloin purpura. Uh, light microscope, mesangial proliferation. And in immunofluorescence, you'll see IgA-based immuno immune complex deposits in mesangium in electron microscope you'll see mesangial immune complex deposition same thing everywhere light microscope immunofluorescence and electron microscope you'll see the same thing okay uh, rapidly uh, progressive concentric glomerulonephritis okay let's see that one Rapidly progressive. Okay. So, uh, rapidly progressive is known as the crescent glomerulonephritis as well. Okay, so you can think of it like rapidly crescent glomerulonephritis or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So, the crescent, it comes from the uh, this... Uh, presentation of the whatever this is right so uh, you'll see it like that uh, we'll look at photos for this uh, let's do that Okay, so you see how this thing right here is different than this bit right here, or it's more like right there. You see a little crescent shape right there, right here. Oh, this one's better. So you see the crescent shape right there? Right. Mm. 
that's not a bad one. If it were to do uh, immunofluorescence, you would see something like that, and then this. Okay. Um, this is also crescent. Okay. Posse immune, again, same thing over here. Let's see if Bing has better pictures. Okay. That's too zoomed in. Uh, I think you got the idea though, right? So that's what the crescent looks like. Okay. So the crescent is actually made up of macrophages, monocyte, glomer, uh, parietal cells, fibrin, uh, complex 3B, or complement uh, 3B, and pro plasma, protein, all that stuff, okay? It refers to rapid progression of kidney disease uh, days to weeks, actually comprised of various individual diseases which are diagnosed based on immunofluorescence. In fluorescence, okay? So there are uh, four different diseases that come under this. So if there's crescent, then it's going to be four of, uh, one of these four, okay? And they all can be differentiated. It's quite easy, but for that, you need to first figure out if it's crescent or not. They might just tell you it's crescent shaped, something else like that in the Bowman's capsule. Okay. Uh, there, there's a rapid progression, so within days to weeks, okay. Actually comprised of various individual diseases, and these are uh, one, good pasture. So in good pasture, uh, the way I remember it is that, you know, a pasture is like a farm. It's flat, you know. If you go to Midwest, all you see is like farmlands and it's all flat. Um, and at the edge of it, it's a long, like a straight line, right? So it's linear. So from pasture, you remember it's basement membrane and it's linear there, okay? So immunofluorescence will be linear. It's a type 2 hypersensitive reaction. Uh, why? Because the um, antibodies are against the basement membrane. So anti-GBM and anti-alveolar antibodies. So you'll have it not only in kidneys, but also in lungs. And if there are symptoms that are both in kidneys and lungs, it's going to be that. And, uh, it affects type 4 collagen. Uh, and symptoms are kidney hematuria plus lung. So hemoptosis. So you'll have hematuria and hemoptosis as good pasture syndrome. Okay. Or if they don't give you that and give you rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, it's you pick that then. Uh, then there's glomerulogranulomatosis uh, with polyangitis. Okay. Uh, negative or posse immune. Okay. So what does that mean? It doesn't really have a meaning. It's just a term for this. Okay, so immunofluorescence is what we need. Okay, so this is what you will get. Okay, this is different than the lumpy bumpy one that we saw, right? It's linear. Okay. So negative or posse immune. I think that means that you won't see anything. We'll see. We'll read about it. So you'll have small and mid-sized vasculitis, uh, the Wechner's uh, granulomatosis, okay? Uh, so that was your granulomatosis with polyangitis, right? Uh, or Wechner's granulomatosis. And then there was another one that was uh, eosinophilic uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis as well. Uh, so this one, that one was MPO ENCA and P ENCA one. And the one without the eosinophils is C ENCA, right? Well, we read about that. Uh, so Wegner's, uh, okay, so 
I messed up there. So C Anka and P3 Anka, PR3 Anka is what you will see if it's this one. Uh, you'll have hematuria, hemaptosis, and rhinosinusitis, right? Because C, of course, when you draw a C in uh, C Anka, that's what you get. Okay. Uh, and then you have uh, eosinophilic one as well, actually. So microscopic polyangitis. This is also negative or posse immune. Uh, that was P MPO and PNCA, right? Eosinophilic granulomatosis. Small vessel uh, necrotizing vasculitis. It's similar to Wegener's, but no nasal or and no granuloma uh, formation. Okay. Uh, that was the thing about that one. Uh, actually, let's go look at that. Uh, real quick, six twenty. Vasculitis, right? So this was the C anka that you draw a C going through the nose, lungs, and kidneys. Uh, so C anka and the uh, upper respiratory tree, lower respiratory and renal for that one. For this one, it was MPO anka and P anka. Uh, you don't get granulomas in this. Is that it? Necrotizing vasculitis with eosinophils. NG. Okay. And uh, kidneys posse immune. Uh, Glomerulonephritis. I need to figure out what that means. Well, that doesn't really help us. Uh, a diffuse uh, proliferated glomerulonephritis, but instead of diffuse, you can, uh, you know, pronounce it like diflupus, uh, right? Not right, but uh, instead of diffuse, just say lupus proliferated glomerulonephritis, because this happens in lupus. Uh, you get granular, uh, uh, I guess yeah. immunofluorescence, uh, DPGN or PSGN. Okay, so diffuse prolif uh, proliferative glomerulonephritis or uh, what was this one? It was something. You get wire loops uh, thickening of capillaries. Okay, so let's go back to six twenty. So that's DPGN and membrane of proliferonephritis. Oh, post streptococcal, okay. Uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, right? Okay, so this is the buzzword. They'll say there's wire loops thickening of glomerular uh, capillaries, it's associated with SLE. And this is important because if you figure out it's SLE, it's going to be lupus for proliferative uh, glomerulonephritis or diff lupus. Okay. Uh, it's described as fibrin or macrophage based concentric uh, expansion, concentric formation in Bowman space. Okay. Uh, in good pasture, you have linear, right? So the linear is like this. That's what it looks like. Uh, we already looked at that. Uh, it's nice and smooth, okay, up in fluorescent. And I just wrote that like, I just drew that like a wire loop and it has DPGN on it. Because if they say there's a wire loop of um, glomerular capillaries, it's going to be that. Let's read this and see what this one says. So rapidly progressive or crescentic uh, glomerular nephritis. It's poor prognosis. Uh, rapidly deteriorating renal function, days to weeks. Uh, light microscope, you'll see a crescent moon shaped uh, like that shape. Uh, crescents contain fibrin and plasma proteins, for example, C3B, with glomeroparietal cells, monocytes, and macrophages. Several disease uh, processes may result in this pattern, which may be delineated 
with uh, immunofluorescence. So if you have linear immunofluorescence uh, due to antibodies to glomerular basement membrane and alveolar basement membrane, right? Uh, I told you pasture is like a farm and it's linear and it's uh, like on the floor. So antibodies against basement membrane of the kidney and the lungs as well. Okay, so good pasture syndrome. You'll have hematuria and hemaptosis. This is a type 2 hypersensitive reaction that's just antibody to antigen. Right. Uh, okay. Reaction. Uh, treatment is plasma pheresis. Okay. So let's have a look at what that means. It involves removing blood through a needle or catheter and circulating it through a machine where the blood is separated into red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma. Cool. Uh, so if it's negative immunofluorescence, uh, that's what it means. Uh, so it doesn't show up. So Or Pashi immune. So no uh, immunoglobulin or uh, C3 deposition there. Uh, so no complexes there, right? So you won't see anything there. So if it's negative or they say pos immune, it can be two things, right? Uh, so to differentiate between them, they'll tell you uh, which ANCA it is. And for ANCA, they won't say C ANCA or P ANCA. They'll use the full name, the anti-nuclear cytoplasmic antibody or whatever. Right. Anti-neutrophil, not nuclear. So anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. They'll use that. Okay. Then what's Pianka? Perinuclear anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And then you have MPO, that's myeloperoxidase, I think. Uh, it's myeloperoxidase, unless um, we see something else for that. Okay. So negative immunofluorescence, posse immune, no uh, immunoglobulin or C3 deposition will happen there. Uh, so granulomatosis with polyangitis. Okay, the way they say this is that in immunofluorescence, there is no change. That's what they say, or there is no abnormalities in the immunofluorescence. Okay. Uh, but under my uh, electron microscope, they found that there is uh, C -anca or P -anca there. Okay. So granulomatosis with polyangitis, that's Wech uh, Wechner's. Uh, so you'll see P3 -anca or C -anca. Eosinophilic glomerulo metosis with polyangitis uh, that's uh, your MPO or PNK or microscopic polyangitis right so MPO NK or PNK however instead of you know linear you have granular immunofluorescence in uh, tricentric uh, glomerular nephritis it's going to be your post streptococcal glomerular nephritis or uh, DPGN okay so DPGN is this, and then uh, PSGN is this one, okay? Infectious, this one. And uh, so DPGN is also, you gotta remember, it's nephrotic nephritic syndrome, okay? Uh, so diffuse proliferative uh, glomerular nephritis. Let's read about that. Do I not have it? These are all part of that. I guess DPGN was just that one line I had. Right here. So wire loop thickening and glomerular it's associated with uh, lupus. Okay. So often due to SLE, think wire lupus. Okay. Or wire loops because it you'll see wire loops there okay uh, and that's these things uh, 
you see a little wires looking like that and there's a loop over here okay i guess that's what it is often due to sle think of wire loops lupus uh, dpgn or and mpgn often present as nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome concurrently okay uh, light microscope wire looping of capillaries and D. Uh, if uh, sorry <laughs> not if in immunofluorescence you'll see granular there and in electron microscope you'll see subendothelial sometimes subepithelial so below the endothelium and uh, below the epithelia or intramembranous within the membrane uh, basement membrane you'll see immunoglobulin G based immune complexes often with C3 deposition okay so let's see if we can figure out what this looks like okay diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis DPGN is a term used to describe a distinct uh, well we know that we're looking at wire loops Okay, so I guess that is wire looping, but that also looks like this thing right here, doesn't it? And that's something else. That's membrane proliferative. So no wire loop there. Okay, so oh, okay, I get it. It makes sense when you look at this one so for this you need to know what wire loop looks like so So something like this, right? When you uh, loop it around like that uh, on your fingers or something, and that's what it ends up as, right? Uh, something like this, and then you tie it up. So what you get are like these little round things at the end of it, right? And I think that's what they mean by wire loops. Okay. So that's what you're seeing here, a little loop like that with the wires, okay? that and then like that so these are the wire loops okay uh, and some of them you don't see it but here now that you know what you're looking out for uh, you'll see it like that the wire loops right this is a tough one but you see a little bit of wire looping right here Okay, uh, cool. This is like the first time I figured that out. Uh, uh, often due to SLE, think wire lupus, DPGN and MPGN often present as nephrotic syndrome. We read that over here. Nephritic nephrotic syndrome, uh, DPGN and MPGN. Okay. Uh, in light microscope, you'll see wire looping of capillaries. In immunofluorescence, you'll see granular Right, so let's look at that. Uh, you'll see granular anywhere where there is deposition of immune complex. Okay, so that's what granular looks like. Okay. And you need to know what linear looks like. So this would be linear right here. This is granular. So. Uh, this is linear you see straight lines happening right there right versus granular okay so that's linear that's granular linear oh 
that also looks linear to me. I think linear is really easy to figure out is the granular one. That's hard. Let me just see this in linear as well. <laughs> we saw that in linear as well. Okay, this is granular. Okay, so it's gonna be discontinuous, uh, right? You're not gonna see this is granular. You're not gonna see a uh, straight line or linear lines. Because uh, where, how do you get the straight lines? It's when you have antibodies against the basement membrane. That's how you get complexes there being made, right? Antigen antibody, where antigen is the basement membrane and antibody is the immunoglobulin G or M. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's move on to another important thing here is SLE causes dip lupus, right? Or lupus proliferative uh, glomerulonephritis or wire lupus or wire lupus or wire loop. Okay. Uh, Elport syndrome. This is an easy one because it sounds like airport, right? So that's how I remember it. Airport has a tarmac. Tarmac is, uh, you know, linear. It's like the ground. Also, basement membrane. Okay, so good pasture is basement membrane. So is L port. Okay, uh, so in airport, it has a tarmac. If you know what tarmac is. Uh, these are tarmacs. Okay. So basement membrane right there. Okay, uh, where was I? Right there. So glomerular, you will have splitting and thinning due to type four collagen defect of the glomerular basement membrane, right? We had the same thing in the good pasture. It was uh, against the basement membrane and it had like a affected the type four collagen over there as well. So, so far similar things, but here, the symptoms are different. There you had hematuria and hematitis. Here we have sensory neural deafness, glomerular nephritis, and lens dislocation or retinopathy. So can't see the plane, can't pee on the plane, and can't hear the plane. That's how I remember it. But I think the actual ones like can't see a bee, can or something like that, I don't know. So can't see the plane, can't pee on the plane because glomerular nephritis. Uh, sensory neural deafness uh, is can't hear the plane and sense lens dislocation is can't see the plane. It's described as basket weave or alternating thinning and uh, thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. Okay, basket weave uh, is silly. I added this into it. Uh, basket weave because you uh, use it as a carry on in the plane, a basket as a carry on on the plane. Okay, so basket weave or alternating uh, thickening and thinning of the glomerular base membrane. Okay, so uh, again, you have endothelial cells right here. Okay, it's messed up and you have podocytes over here. Uh, that's messed up as well. But the main thing is that this glomerular basement membrane, some places it's thick, some places it's thin, right? So that's how you get the thick thickening and thinning of the glomerular basement membrane okay uh, or the basket weave pattern so Elport syndrome you don't have a photo here let's look at a photo before we go on Okay, so this is L port. Um, you have foot podocytes. This is glomerular basement membrane, and this is the endothelial cell. So as it goes along, it decimates, right? And so now you have thin here. It's thicker here, thin here, and really thick here, and it's like thin and thick over here, right? So that's the basement membrane right there. Uh, these are your endothelial cells, okay? And this is your foot podocytes over here. So when you see that, that's what it's called. Uh, one more photo. 
right so that's thin over there and this is thick over here the basement membrane uh, and this would be your endothelia and these are your photocytes okay that's fancy uh, I think we got it but they also call this uh, basket weave pattern okay because it's thinning and thickening uh, seven minutes okay uh, last one for nephritic. Uh, Membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis. It's MPGN. It's associated with uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis B. Uh, easy to remember. Hep C and Hep B or Hep B and Hep C makes MPGN. Okay. Uh, most likely nephritic syndrome to con coexist with nephrotic syndrome. So it's going to be predominantly nephritic. But it will have a little bit of uh, proteinuria, more than 3.5 uh, grams per day. Uh, type 1 and type 2, there are two types. So type 1 is immunoglobulin mediated, associated with SLE. And then you have complement mediated type. It's associated with immunoglobulin G antibodies that stabilize C3 convertase, also known as dense deposit disease. Both types have uh, decreased C3 complement, just like you found in uh, PSGN, right? Or infectious glomerulonephritis. So you will have decrease in C3 complements uh, in both of them, uh, both types. Uh, it's also uh, associated with intravenous drug abuse, right? Uh, Described as tram track appearance on glomerular basement membrane. Uh, you have thickening and splitting of glomerular basement membrane as well. Uh, we know what that means now. Mesangial ingrowth with a glomerular double contour. Uh, this is just a mnemonic to remember it. The way I remember these is because there is tram track uh, appearance. or And you get that because you have like a straight line. Right. Uh, uh, so this is the basement membrane like this, right? So what's happening is that there's splitting of this. So then you get like splitting in some places and some places it's, uh, you know, like that. Uh, so that's what the thing looks like. So that's why thickening and splitting because then you have some. Like, so it's split like that. Actually, wait, I can do a better job. So that's what the happening. That's what's happening to the basement membrane. So you get two tracks, right? So it looks like two tracks turning into one, and that's where you get the tram track appearance. Um, okay, so I get two MPGs on the tram track. Uh, two for two types. Uh, one is immunoglobulin mediated. One is complement mediated. Immunoglobulin is SLE. Complement is uh, IgG and C3 uh, complex. Okay, MPG, uh, so two miles per gallon, or MPG is MPGN. Trim track is characteristic finding. Track equals track marks on somebody who uh, engages with IVDA, right? So someone who takes uh, syringes, with uh, drugs with syringes. Uh, so two for two types of MPG, okay? I, that's my way of making a tram. It's when I was making it, I just remembered like, okay, so MPG, it's going there, it's a tram, and it's a bad place, right? So it has all of these splitting and uh, stuff on it. And, you know, when you're doing uh, drugs like this, you have chances of getting hep C. And that's why hep C and hep B up here probably won't help you. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's that. Let's finish up with this. How much time do we have? Four minutes. Uh, MPGN is nephritic syndrome that often co-presents with nephrotic syndrome. Type 1 may be secondary to hepatitis B or C uh, infection. May also be idiopathic. Subendothelial immune complex deposits with granular uh, immunofluorescence. We know why that happens uh, when something is deposited between the podocytes and uh, basement membrane. It creates a lumpy bumpy, uh, which is called granular, which makes a granular appearance, right? 
However, if they lump, say lumpy bumpy, that's because of post trap glomerulonephritis. Uh, type 2 is associated with C3 nephrotic factor, right? Uh, immunoglobulin G autoantibody that stabilizes C3 convertase, persistent complement activation. So you have decrease in uh, serum C3 levels. Intramembranous deposits, also called dense deposit disease. Both types are mesangial ingrowth, with leads to, which leads to GBM splitting. Uh, tram track and, uh, right on H and E and pass. Uh, so E stain, uh, pass stain, sorry. Okay, so that's uh, what it looks like. Okay, so uh, two minutes. Let's quickly look at that. Uh, the darkening, the dark lines that you're seeing, that's the splitting. It's because the light cannot penetrate through between them. So the, you're getting a shadow shaped uh, thing. Okay, so that's actually the splitting of the basement membrane. That's why it's dark there. Okay, so that's, if you see something dark, it's uh, because it's splitting there and the light can't go through. Uh, in light microscope, okay. Uh, but in immunofluorescence, it actually looks better, right? You can see the thickening and thinning or splitting at least. It's splitting here, right? So it's splitting there. You don't, don't really need to figure out if you can see it or not, as long as you know why it happens, okay? Uh, after the break, Nephrotic syndrome. So with the O, remember proteinuria has a O. So nephrotic syndrome, massive proteinuria, more than 3.5 grams per day. Okay, uh, let's read about it first. Okay, so minimal change disease. Uh, it's the most common syndrome in uh, children. So if it's a child with some kind of proteinuria um, and there's absolutely no evidence of anything happening in immunofluorescence or light microscopy or anything, it's because there's very minimum change that's happened to the glomerulus, right? That's why it's called minimal change disease. So it's most common in children. It's associated with recent infection and immunization. Rarely associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's described as negative immunofluorescence uh, or effacement of fusion of foot podocytes. Right, so the foot podocytes are going to get fused together. Okay, and if, since there is moving of it, it's called effacement. Right, so effacement or fusion of foot podocytes. Normal appearing glomeruli. Now, children are minimal age. And tend to have small feet, right? So uh, the glomeruli appears normal. That's important in that. Okay, uh, let's look at this. Okay, so minimal change disease, also called lipoid nephrosis. Okay, uh, most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. Often primary, which is idiopathic, and may be triggered by a recent infection immunization or immune stimulus so four eyes of minimal change disease rarely may be secondary due to lymphoma for example cytokine mediated damage primary disease has excellent response to glucocorticoids so in light microscope uh, glomeruli seems normal lipid may be seen in proximal tubule cells Immunofluorescence, that's negative, right? So uh, it was right here as well. Where was it? Was it in here? Negative immunofluorescence, right? Uh, and electron microscope, uh, effacement of foot podocyte uh, or podocyte foot processes. Okay. So uh, this is the basement membrane right there, right? This is the epithelial cells. Uh, and this is the foot podocytes. So you see the fusion over there of it. Okay. Uh, 
Let's see if we can find more. Uh, the foot parasites are really moved out of the way now, right over there. But you see these, uh, they're fused together now. There's the basement membrane. This is the endothelial cells. Okay, uh, they're fused together, right? Uh, over there. Okay. Uh, for this, they'll say that uh, there was nothing seen on immunofluorescence, and it's going to be a child, and nothing else is like that. So it's going to be, and they'll tell you there's proteinuria, right? So you know it's nephrotic if they tell you there's proteinuria, and they'll tell you that uh, in lab, uh, on the labs, uh, you'll see negative for RBCs in urine. So you know it's nephrotic. When it's nephrotic, it's a child, it's going to be this minimal change disease, okay? Uh, if they might ask you what's happening, it's uh, effacement of parasite foot processes. That's what's happening, okay? Uh, focal segmental uh, glomerulosclerosis. It's most common nephrotic syndrome in adults, okay? Uh, it's seen in African American and Hispanic populations. It's associated with sickle cell disease and HIV. It's described as hyalinosis and segmental sclerosis. Okay. Uh, this is important. Okay, and I made a note about this uh, as well. Uh, you'll see something similar to this in uh, hypertension as well, but that's going to be in the arteries. Lean arteries, so you gotta, you know, don't just jump at the buzzword. Okay. Uh, so hyalinosis and segmental sclerosis, or effacement of foot parasites. So this is similar to this. However, this is going to be only in children, and this is only going to be in adults. You won't see this in children. Okay. Uh, Non-specific IgM C1 or C3 deposition in the mesangial matrix. So epithelial or endothelial and basement membrane and parasites parasites get fused together in this as well okay let's read uh, higher prevalence in black people uh, can be primary idiopathic or secondary to other conditions for example hiv infection sickle cell disease heroin use obesity interferon treatment or congenital malformations Okay, uh, this is the important one, right? Uh, the HIV and sickle cell disease. Uh, primary disease has inconsistent response to steroids. So that's how you differentiate between these two. Okay, also that there's, you know, segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis, whereas here in like microscopy, you have normal glomeruli. Uh, primary disease has inconsistent response to this and may progress to chronic kidney disease. Light microscope, uh, and you will see segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis. That's this. This is uh, sclerosis and hyalinosis. Right. Uh, in immunofluorescence, you'll often see negative immunofluorescence, but may be positive for non-specific focal deposits for IgM, C3, or C1. Immunofluor uh, electron microscope, you'll see effacement of food pro um, processes similar to minimal change disease. Okay. Uh, focal was what? Right here. That's less than 50% of glomeruli involved, right? That's why you only see 50%. Less than 50% of it getting sclerosed and hyalinosed. Um, membranous nephropathy, uh, also called membranous glomerulonephritis. So you know, need to understand that even though it says nephritis, this is a nephrotic syndrome, okay? Because over here, it's all nephritis, right? See nephritis, nephritis. So this is the one where it's membranous glomerulonephritis, 
but it's part of nephrotic syndrome, okay? Uh, it can be primary, for example. Actually, let's read this first. I forgot about that. Membranous uh, nephropathy, also known as membranous glomerulonephritis. Primary is uh, antibodies to phospholipase A or NPPLA2R, okay? Uh, also known as membranous glomerulonephritis, primary antibodies to phospholipase A1, also known as NPPLA2R, or secondary, uh, it can be due to infection like HCV or HPV, it can be because of autoimmune disease, which is SLE, uh, or medications like NSAIDs, penicillamine, or gold. Described as spike and dome appearance and subepithelial deposits, of subepithelial deposits. And this is the buzzword, uh, spike and dome, because it actually looks like a spike and dome. For that, you need to know what that looks like or what that is, right? So it's mostly like, you know, those clubs and at the end of the club, it's like this, that's called spike and dome. Okay. I can't find it right now, but anyways. Uh, spike and dome appearance on subepithelial deposits. You have thick end, uh, basement membrane and capillaries. This is a mnemonic for it. I'm a proud member of spike and dope club. Right, so I for infection, M for medication, A for autoimmune disease. Proud, P is for phospholipase A1 antibody, membrane. Member is for membranous nephropathy of the spike and dome club. Okay. Uh, I think this was, um, most of these were from like uh, dirty medicine as well. Okay, so. Light microscope, it's uh, diffuse and capillary of glomerular basement membrane thickening. Uh, okay. And immunofluorescence, you see granular due to immune complex deposition. So uh, spike and dome appearance, this is what it means. Uh, in the basement membrane, you'll see depositions and it looks like spike and dome. See, that looks like a club right there, doesn't it? Uh, immune complex deposition and thickened basement membrane. Immune. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's look at this now. Uh, also called membranous uh, glomerulonephritis. It can be because of uh, primary, for example, antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptors. Okay, it's A2. I think I wrote A1 here. A1, but it's A2. Uh, anti PLR A2, right, or secondary to drugs, for example, an NSAIDs, penicillamine, gold, infection, HBC, uh, HCV, and syphilis, SLE, uh, autoimmune, or solid tumors. Increased risk of thromboembolism, for example, DVT, uh, renal vein thrombosis. Primary disease has poor response to steroids may progress to chronic kidney disease okay uh, so here uh, light microscopy diffuse capillary and glomerular basement thickening if there is thickening of glomerular basement membrane uh, and it is uh, nephrotic syndrome you figure that out then it can be either this or it can be either this for this there are other symptoms than this so most of the time if there's thickening it's going to be membranous nephropathy okay uh, so diffuse capillary and glomerular basement ne membrane thickening uh, Immunofluorescence granular due to immune complex deposition and electron microscope They'll give you this uh, most of the time spike and dome appearance of sub epithelial deposits okay. So this is pretty tough to look at so let's see if we can find a better image of that. Okay. 
okay this is the basement membrane it's thick right these are your epithelial cells and these are your food processes right? uh, and here you have stuff inside of it that don't look like dome these one do so these are like spikes and domes I guess so domes and spikes I guess that's what they meant okay these are domes I don't see the spikes here okay the foot processes are fused here okay this is the basement membrane those are domes and a little bit of spikes on top of it right uh, I think we got it okay uh, then we have amelodosis uh, kidney is the most commonly involved organ systemic amelodosis actually again I forgot so amelodosis systemic amelodosis most commonly affects the kidney may be associated with uh, tuberculosis, multiple myeloma, rheumatic arthritis, etc. AA protein is associated with chronic inflammation. AL protein is associated with uh, multiple myeloma. Okay, uh, That's important because they might tell you which one it is and that will give away uh, what type of uh, dis uh, etiology it has. Right, So if they say uh, it's AA it's going to be because of inflammation or chronic inflammation and if they say it's AL that can only mean uh, plasma cell dichreosis multiple myeloma uh, M spike right uh, okay so Congord stain shows Congo red not Congord so Congo red stain shows uh, this I guess okay Described as apple green bifringens under polarized light. It's due to amyloid deposition in the mesangium. Okay. Uh, kidney is the most common involved organ, systemic amyloidosis, associated with chronic conditions that predispose to amyloid deposition. So we read about this in uh, immune uh, chapter, immuno chapter. And, uh, how, wherever this. Uh, AL or AA, wherever it uh, gets deposited, it creates, like if it gets deposited in pancreas, it creates, uh, you know, you'll get diabetes if it gets in the head. And someplace there, uh, it gives you Alzheimer's. Uh, so if it goes in kidneys, it gives you this. Okay, so the uh, condition that predisposes to amyloid deposition, for example, AL amyloid or AA amyloid or prolonged dialysis uh, light microscopy Congo red stain shows apple green on bifringens under polarized light due to amyloid deposition in mesangium okay for this they won't show you a photo I don't think so uh, they'll just talk about it in these words and those will give it away anything to do with AL or AM you know or Congo red is going to be amyloidosis. Um, then you have diabetic globulonephritis. For this, uh, okay. So most common cause of ESRD, and actually, wait, let me do this first. I hate Quizlet. I can't find anything in these.
Okay, I guess we'll have to do with this thing right here. Hyper focused. Okay, so just overall, this is the natural history of diabetic nephropathy, right? So when someone with uh, diabetes, uh, you know, newly developed diabetes comes in, they'll have albumin. Uh, they won't have that much albumin leaking, right, in the urine. So they won't have that much protein urea. Okay, so it's still under 50 over here. Uh, the GFR, however, is going to increase uh, initially up to like five years. So if you have increase in GFR, so normal GFR, as you know, is 100. So if it goes above 100, it's increased. Okay. So if they tell you GFR is like 100 and something or, you know, creatinine is increased in urine and decreased in serum or anything that, you know, points to hyperfiltration, you're in hypofiltration stage of diabetic uh, nephropathy. Okay, that's the first stage. It's called hyperfiltration stage. Okay, you, know, you have glomerular hypertrophy and increase in GFR. Okay, so these things will happen. So this is what you'll see in the light microscopy or electron microscopy or whatever. Okay, so, or they'll just explain it that there's glomerular thickening, right? And I told you, if it, there is glomerular thickening, it can be two things. It can be membranous nephropathy or it can be diabetic nephropathy, right? Uh, but you can figure out what what else is happening from, uh, like, which one it is from the other things that they give you. The second stage is uh, GFR comes back down to 100. However, now you have increase in albumin urea. Okay, now it's going up, going to go above... Uh, that low plateau it was at and this is called incipient diabetic nephropathy you have mesangial expansion okay uh, glomerular basement membrane thickening so that's already here anyways glomerular hypertrophy but here you have uh, mesangial expansion glomerular basement membrane thickening this is about the basement membrane thickening like the membranal membranous uh, nephropathy uh, you'll have arteriolar uh, hyalinosis as well, okay, uh, and that's like the one we saw in focal segmental uh, nephropathy, right? Focal or which one was it? Yeah, focal segmental, the sclerosis and hyalinosis, right? Okay, so moderately increased albuminuria, uh, moderately increased than it was here, and you'll have hypertension. Right. So for hypertension, that's why uh, this is what happens. You have intimal thickening and luminal narrowing of the renal arterioles with evidence of glomerular sclerosis. OK, so there's a compensatory medial hypertrophy and fibrointimal proliferation, which leads to endothelial damage, which gives you highline arteriosclerosis. Uh, and if you're in the last stage, or not last stage, but like the third stage of diabetic nephropathy, that's called overt diabetic nephropathy. Here, this is the easiest stage to figure out because it has mesangial nodules, which are called Kimmelstein Wilson lesions or tubular interstitial fibrosis. That's what it's, you know, that's what it is. Uh, overt proteinuria, now you can see it goes above 100 all the way to 150 and actually can go all the way up depending on what stage it is and how long you have had it you can have up to like i think i've seen a case where it was up to uh, eight thousand right so i've seen a case where there was like eight thousand instead of hundred um but yeah chronic kidney disease that's what they had um so end stage renal disease, that's it. We'll keep going there, and GFR decreases. Okay, uh, and then if it's like an adult, usually their GFR is not gonna be hundred, right? It's gonna be around like 70, 80, or maybe like sixty seven. Uh, that's still considered normal in an uh, elderly. So, but you know, for steps, it should be hundred that we look at. Uh, so nephrotic syndrome and decrease in GFR. Cool. Let's read this now. 
So most common cause of end stage renal disease in high income countries like uh, USA, usually associated with evidence of diabetic complications, uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, and gastropathy, right? Uh, uh, none and this is an important one not for this but like when you're doing GIT questions uh, they test you on that non enzymatic glycation of the vascular basement membrane leads to highline uh, ar arteriosclerosis which causes hypofiltration at the efferent arterioles and subsequent microalbuminuria it's described as mesangial sclerosis or Schimmelstein uh, Wilson nodules uh, so, uh, those we'll look at what those are. Uh, light microscopy, uh, sclerotic eosinophilic nodules with a central acellular regions. Okay, so let's look at what those are before we go forward. Uh, that's what it is right there. So you have Kimmel and Wilson right there. Okay, so that and that, or that and that, right? So those kind of nodules you'll see. It doesn't have to be in twos. I'm just doing twos because it's easier to remember that way. Okay. Uh, they won't say Kimmelstein uh, Wilson nodules. They'll tell you what it is. So those are called mesangiosclerosis. Okay, so that's what they'll say. Sclerotic eosinophilic nodules with a central acellular region. They can call it like that as well. Okay. So this, if you had this as the thing, and just pretend like I'm a good artist, then this is your highline thickening of arterial, right? We know what uh, atherosclerosis looks like, right? There's arteriosclerosis. Right, and then there is malignant or highline, right, where you see the onion, uh, it looks like an onion, right. Uh, layer of the onion, okay. So highline is this, and this is hyperplastic or malignant. Okay, so that's how you differentiate between the highline and hyperplastic, okay. So, uh, this is highline thickening, okay. Nodular highline deposit, uh, mesangial matrix leads to mesangial expansion. This is the thickened basement membrane right there, okay. So, nodular thickening over there or mesangial. And th that's going to be your Kimmelstein-Wilson nodules over there. There are, uh, there, there are one or more highline nodules within the lobules of glomeruli surrounding peripherally by granul uh, glomerular capillaries with thickened walls. So I drew Owen Wilson and uh, Jimmy Kimmel over here and uh, diabetes uh, test over there and you have Kimmelstein Wilson nodules. That's how you remember that. Let's read about it. Diabetic glomerulonephropathy, most common cause of uh, ESRD or end stage renal disease in the United States. Hyperglycemia leads to non enzymatic glycation of tissue proteins, leads to mesangial expansion. Glomerular basement membrane thickening and increase in permeability. Hyperfiltration happens, uh, glomerular hypertension uh, with and uh, increase in GFR. Leads to glomerular hypertrophy and granulo, uh, glomerular scarring uh, or glomerular sclerosis. Leads to further progression of the nephropathy. Uh, in light microscope, you'll see mesangial expansion or uh, glomerular basement membrane thickening. And you'll see eosinophilic nodular 
glomerular sclerosis, also known as Kimmel-Steinwilson lesion. So I guess those are, this is what it is. Okay, so that right there. And uh, what we saw over here for the diabetic nephropathy, the three stages, that's important to remember. And that's how you'll figure out the difference um, between this and this. Okay, because if it's thickening, it could be this and this because there's thickening and albuminuria. That's all you see. But if they tell you it's between like uh, first year and then the second, then you'll see hyperfiltration as well. Whereas here, you won't see hyperfiltration. So no increase in GFR here. But if there's increase in GFR, then it's going to be this one, right? Okay, uh, done with that. On to kidney stones. Uh, kidney stones, uh, it can lead to severe complications as hydronephrosis, pyelonephritis, and acute kidney injury. Obstructed stone presents with unilateral flank tenderness, cloaky um, pain radiating to groin, hematuria, treat and prevent by encouraging fluid intake, radiolucent stones, I can't see you, cysteine and uric acid. Okay, we don't need to worry about that. It can lead to severe complex, uh, complications like hydronephrosis, pyelonephritis, and acute kidney injury. That should be obvious by now, right? Obstructed stone presents with unilateral flank tenderness. This is the buzzword that you hear. If you hear unilateral flank pain, it's going to be kidney stones or, you know, pyelonephritis or something like that. Uh, something to do with kidney, if you hear that. Uh, cloaky pain uh, radiating to groin, that's for sure going to be kidney stones. And hematuria, right? So that's going to be your kidney stones as well. Uh, for hematuria, I think there was something else to it too, right? Where did we see that? Oh, right, right here. So bladder cancer and kidney stone, they both cause hematuria. Okay. But no cast. Uh... Okay, um, treat and prevent by encouraging fluid intake. Uh, that's okay, radiolucent. Stones, okay, so basically there are radiolucent and radiopaque stones. So radiolucent ones are the CU ones, so that's cysteine and uric acid ones. Okay, all the other ones are going to be radiopaque. Okay, so content precipitates with x-ray findings. Uh, CT findings, uh, uro, urine crystals, and notes. Calcium, uh, you have calcium oxalate, uh, hypo uh, citrinuria. So for these, I'm just gonna uh, go ahead and draw stuff. If it helps you, it helps you. So you write ox, uh, and when you do X, like that. You draw an envelope or a box around it, right? So in ox, you draw a box, and that's actually what it will look like, right? So the X and a box around it, okay? Uh, but the way they say that, it's uh, shaped like an envelope or dumbbell shaped, okay? I don't know where that came from, but yeah. So it precipitates with calcium oxalate, and that's important, okay, for calcium. Uh, and it happens in hypocitrinuria, citrinuria. Uh, it's radiopic, uh, x-ray and CT. Uh, urine crystals shaped like envelope or dumbbells. Uh, no, uh, calcium stone most common, 80%. Calcium oxalate more common than calcium phosphate stones. Uh, that's important to remember. So you have calcium oxalate more than calcium phosphate stones. Okay. Uh, it can result from ethylene glycol. Remember, this was in which one of the anion? Was it in normal or increased? It was in increased uh, gap anion, right? The one with gold mark and G was for, you know, gold mark. You get that if you have increase in grade, so increase in anion gap. 
uh, G was for glycols, so ethylene and propylene glycol. So ethylene glycol, well, I told you, it's antifreeze. It's going to be in someone who's tr trying to commit suicide. Right, so you'll find that in that as well. So antifreeze ingestion. Vitamin C overuse. Okay. Hypocytriuria. It's associated with decrease in urine pH. That's important to remember. Malabsorption, for example, Crohn's disease. That should be easy. Remember, uh, what happens is uh, in Crohn's disease, you don't get, uh, you know, you don't absorb stuff in the ileum, so fat doesn't get absorbed. So you have vitamin, uh, fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, and the calcium now binds to the fat, so the oxalate gets reabsorbed somewhere else, and then it travels through the blood, goes to the kidney, and you. Uh, they find calcium in the kidney as well, so then they'll form stones over there in Crohn's disease. Okay, uh, you get vitamin, uh, fat soluble vitamin deficiency, also uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. After three years, because your liver has three years of storage for vitamin B12. Uh, treatment is thiazide, citrate, and low sodium diet. Uh, calcium phosphate increase in pH so radio opaque uh, radio opaque again and these time these are wedge shaped okay treatment is low sodium diet and thiazides um, they don't really test you on the treatment at this point I don't think they test you heavily on that but they will test you on how it's made and how the whole thing happens or why would you find stones over there or why is there a formation of stone Okay, so it precipitates uh, calcium stones will precipitate with calcium oxalate and hypocytraturia or calcium phosphate. Okay, uh, so this happens uh, when there's increase in pH or in alkaline environment. Okay, and that's also why you get uh, stones in the tubules, right? Uh, when you're leaking out all the H ions, remember we were reading about that before, and you get stones there because of uh, alkaline environment. Okay, then you have AM, uh, am I, ammonium magnesium phosphate or AMP, right? Uh, also known as AMP, right? So these are AMP machines. And the way I remember it's like, you know, amp is metal. Right, so. Rad and metal. <laughs> right. Uh, and when you're thinking metal, you're thinking of, you know, those rock and roll fingers, finers. So these things, right? And if you put that on your head, it looks like staghorn or, you know, which is also pretty uh, metal. Not plants, plants aren't metal. <laughs> uh, these things, right? And that's basically what true white looks like. They usually give you, uh, you know, something like this, and then you sort of figure out that it's true white stone, okay. And it's called staghorn or true white. It happens because of this. Let's see if we can figure it out in CT scan. Okay, no. Basically why it looks like that is because of the pelvis. It has a pelvis, you know, separates, goes into like, uh, 
so you have your tear coming in and then it goes into like this like that, that and like that right so uh, this gives a shape of like a stag horn right so it happens in increased uh, pH again alkaline okay it's true white is that what I tried yeah that's what I wrote it's true white okay it's radiopaque and radiopaque and yeah it's metal right it's red like undertaker and coffin so struvite s sarco uh, sarcophagus sarcophagus i think that's how it's pronounced sarcophagus uh, that's what the coffin lid looks like okay it accounts for 15 percent of stones caused by infection with urease positive bugs okay now for example proteus mirabilis uh, Mirabilis, uh, Staphylococcus, Sephrophyticus, and Klebsiella that hydrolyze urea to ammonia, which leads to urine alkali uh, alkalinization. It commonly forms staghorn calculi, so that's, oh, there you go. Okay, so staghorn calculi, your pelvis and calluses at the back over there. So that's how it forms the thing. Okay, uh, yeah, so treatment is eradication of underlying infection and surgical removal of the stone. Okay, because uh, you can imagine it's going to be hard to, you know, just melt that away and, you know, with all the fluids, just hope that this thing gets leaked out of your urethra because that will hurt. You don't want that. So you got to remove it uh, surgically. Okay, so we know about uric acid and cystine that they're radiolucent, right? Faintly radiopaque, so radiolucent as well. Uh, and these both uh, acid, so it happens in acidic environment. And cysteine is also acidic environment. Uh, uric acid, uh, it's rhomboid like that. And this is basically the kind of color you'll see in the picture as well. like, I don't know, uric acid color or urine color, or, yeah, uh, rhomboid or was that? About 5% of all stones risk factors decrease in urine volume, uh, arid climate, and acidic pH. So that's why you should keep yourself hydrated to avoid getting uric acid stone. Strong association with hyperuricemia, like gout, often seen in diseases with Increase in cell turnover, for example, leukemia. Treatment is alkal uh, alkalinization of urine uh, uh, and allopurinol. Right. It inhibits xanthone oxidase, also fibroxystat, right. and then you have raspberry case uh, that makes it into allantois. Uh, Allen, what was it? It was something like that. Uh, cysteine is a uh, decrease in pH. Fair. Okay, I'm going to have to. It's going to bother me now. Was it allantoin? Allantoin is something else. It's not allantoin. Oh, oh it is allantoin. Okay. Am I thinking of Alan Toys? Is that why I'm messing up? Yeah, okay. So that's why I was messing up. Okay, back to this. Uh, cysteine, decrease in pH, faintly radioopaque, uh, moderately radioopaque, and it's going to be hexagonal. If you see hexagons, it's cysteine, that's all. And majority, a majority of the time, the question is going to be about what else is uh, this person going to be deficient in. It. They're going to be deficient in cola, so C for cysteine, O for ornithine, L for lysine, and A for arginine. 
So any of these, okay? Or it could be, you know, whatever this makes. So her uh, hereditary autosomal uh, recessive condition in which cysteine reabsorption, uh, pro reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule transporter loses function, causing cysteinuria. Transport defect also results in poor reabsorption of ornithin, lysine, and arginine, or cola. Cysteine is poorly soluble, thus stones form in the urine. Usually begins in childhood, can form staghorn calculi. Sodium cyanide uh, nitroprusside test is positive. Uh, they might give you that, so if they give you that... Uh, it's basically a giveaway for this. Uh, 16 stones have six sides. So, 16 or 16, and that's how you know it's a hexagon. Okay, uh, treatment is low sodium diet, alkalinization of urine, uh, chelating agents, for example, triophoranine, uh, penicillamine, if refractory. Okay, done with stones. Hydronephrosis. Uh, distension, dilation of renal pelvis. Uh, so you see it right there. Uh, it's bigger. So dilation of renal pelvis happens or calluses. And that's what you're seeing over here. Uh, usually caused by urinary tract obstruction. For example, renal stone, severe BPH, congenital obstructions, locally advanced cervical cancer, or injury to ureter. Other causes include retroperitoneal fibrosis, vesicoureteral reflux. Right. So basically, what's happening is anywhere along the line of from uh, urethra to uh, kidneys, uh, if there is an obstruction, you know there will be blockage of the flow of the urine. So there will be backup of urine, uh, and that will cause the hydronephrosis buildup of urine in the kidneys. Right, so renal stone can do that. If there's severe BPH, that will do that. You know, all of these will do that, and that's what it is. Uh, dilation occurs proximal to site of pathology. Okay, so proximal is towards the kidney. Uh, so wherever the obstruction is, from there to the kidney, that's where the dilation will happen. Uh, serum. Now, creatinine becomes elevated in obstruction because now uh, CK is getting, you know, it's not trying because of hydrostatic pressure, right? Hydrostatic pressure is going to increase. Well, what's that going to do? It's going to cause the gradient to shift towards the capillaries, right? So serum creatinine cannot get filtered as freely as it was before. So serum creatinine becomes elevated if obstructed, in, if obstruction is bilateral or if, uh, Patient has an obstructed solitary kidney. Leads to compression. So why does that happen? Uh, so if it's bilateral, that's obvious, right? If both the kidneys are affected, it's going to happen. But what about uh, if there's only one kidney, right? Uh, that's functioning and the other one is, uh, you know, obstructed. Then what's happening is all the blood is getting shifted uh, before it was getting split between the two. Now, there's increased amount of blood pressure in the renal arteries on the one that's not affected, right? So, increased artery causes hypertension of the uh, renal arteries. That's going to cause intimal hypertrophy, right? And that's going to cause uh, arteriosclerosis eventually, causing, and that can lead to renal arteriosclerosis, right? Uh, leads to compression and possible atrophy of renal cortex and medulla. Okay. And yeah, so that makes your kidney useless. Urinary incontinence. Mixed incontinence has features of both stress and urgency incontinence. Okay, this is pretty important. They test you on uh, your knowledge on these three things. Okay. Uh, mixed incontinence has features of both uh, stress and urgency incontinence. Okay, uh, so there's stress, urgency, and then overflow incontinence. So in stress, 
uh, it's because of obesity, pregnancy, vaginal delivery, or prosthetic surgery. Okay, so what happens is the outlet in there's an outlet incompetence. Okay, so uterine hypermobility or intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So this sphincter right here, which keeps the urine from flowing outwards, uh, there is incompetence over there or uh, deficiency of that. Uh, leads to leak with increased intra-abdominal pressure like sneezing or lifting. Okay. Uh, and there's a positive bladder stress, uh, stress test. Uh, directly observed leakage from urethra open upon coughing or vasalva maneuver. Okay. Uh, so associations of BCD, pregnancy, vaginal delivery, and prostate surgery uh, treatment is so if you don't know what this is kind of like you know when you're lifting weights you put on a belt and while doing a squat and when you're doing a squat with the belt on that's sort of like a muscle uh, vessel while maneuver okay uh, treatment is uh, pelvic floor muscles strengthening so kegel exercises uh, weight loss and Pisseries. Pisseries? Okay, a thing over here I would like to add that Levator any muscle complex. So weakness of this muscle is going to cause that, right? So the pelvic floor muscle is the levator any muscle. Okay, so uh, if you strain that, uh, this will, you know, not leak out anymore. Pelvic floor muscle straining, also known as Kegel exercise, uh, weight loss, and I'm not sure what this is. A small soluble block that is inserted into the vagina to treat infection or as a contraceptive, an elastic or rigid device that is inserted into the vagina to support a uterus. Okay. Uh, then there is urgency incontinence, okay, so it happens in UTI, right, so infection that causes this. So what happens is there is a detrusor overactivity. It's, these are the detrusor muscles, right, um, they're the one that contract and void the bladder. Uh, leak with urge to void immediately. Right, so you have to go even with a little bit of fluid, you gotta go. Okay. Uh, treatment here again, Kegel exercises, bladder training, like timed voiding and distraction or relaxation techniques. Anti muscarinics, for example, oxybutynin for overactive bladder, remember OB for overactive bladder, and mirabicrone, right? There was something about that as well that I made. Let's go look at it. Um, my bladder, yeah, it's my bladder has grown. So growing the capacity of bladder, I believe that's what it was. Right, me bladder has grown. So um, B3 receptor relaxation of detrusor smooth muscle increase in bladder capacity. Uh, get uh, now on to okay so remember this is uh, incontinence urgency incontinence even with a little bit of fluid you gotta go it's because of this uh, and it happens because of UTI uh, with stress incontinence when it leaks with uh, sneezing or lifting it's because of obesity pregnancy or vagina delivery or prostate uh, surgery uh, it's called stress incontinence. And now overflow incontinence here. It only happens when you don't go. And because you don't have the signals that tell you that the bladder is full. Okay, so incomplete emptying. Uh, detrusor under activity this time. Or uh, outlet obstruction. Uh, so if there's some obstruction here, then also it's going to fill up. 
So it leads to leak with overfilling. So increased post void residual on catheterization or ultrasound. Association is polyuria, for example, diabetes, bladder outlet obstruction, and uh, for example, BPH, and uh, spinal cord injury. Okay, and that's the one with the signal. Treatment is cath catheterization, uh, relieve obstruction, for example, alpha blockers for BPH. Acute cystitis, uh, inflammatory of urinary bladder, uh, presents as suprapubic pain, dysuria, urinary frequency, urgency. Systemic signs, for example, high fever, chills uh, are usually absent. Risk factors include female sex, short urethra, sexual intercourse, indwelling uh, catheter, diabetes mellitus impaired bladder emptying the important one here is this one uh in female is because of short urethra okay uh cause it's gonna be equal that is the most common one but in someone who's sexually active it's gonna be this seen in sexually active young women equal is still more common in this group as well uh so here they'll tell you that it's novo bias in uh what was it Sensitive, I think. Cephalopithecus is. Negative. Uh, no, Cephalopithecus is negative. And epidermis is the one that's no bias and positive. Or sensitive. Okay. Uh, Klebsiella. So, third one is Klebsiella, and then fourth one is Proteus mirabilis. The staghorn one. Urine has ammonia scent or, you know, the staghorn is because of AMP. Ammonium monophosphate or magnesium. Ammonium magnesium phosphate. Okay. You have the same ones over here as well. Protease, uh, streptocephropithecus, and Klebsiella. Just not E. coli. Okay. Uh, so labs are going to be positive for leukocyte esterase. Right, that's going to tell you it's E. coli, uh, so is nitrates. Indicates presence of uh, enterobacteriaceae. Sterile pyuria, pyuria with uh, negative urine cultures could suggest urethritis by Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia trichomatis. Okay. So if uh, these are negative, py pyuria with negative urine cultures, uh, it going to that's a suggestion that it's uh, urethritis uh, and it's caused by gonorrhea or chlamydia or you know co-infection of those treatment antibiotics uh, this is the first line and you have to know this for UTI it's TMP SMX or you give uh, nitroferentoin okay that's second line if there's some kind of allergy to sulfur drugs or something then you give nitroferentoin but this is uh, the first line, TMP SMX. Uh, pyelonephritis, okay. Uh, acute pyelonephritis, uh, you'll see neutrophils infiltrate renal interstitium. Okay, so that's what it looks like. There's hyperemia. Uh, affects cortex with relative sparing of glomeruli or vessels. It presents with fever, flank pain, costal vertebral anger tenderness. That's what you will see, and that suggests something to do with kidney anyways. Nausea, vomiting, chills. It causes, uh, the causes include ascending UTI, so E. coli is most common. Hematogenous spread to the kidney, so that's through the blood. Uh, presents with WBCs in urine, or with or without uh, WBC casts. So if you get casts, that means it's something to do with the kidney, right? Or you won't get casts. If it's outside of kidney. Uh, CT would show uh, strided parenchymal enhancement. Okay. So you see these stras. Uh, that's what they're talking about. In acute pyelonephritis. Uh, risk factors include indwelling urinary catheter. 
So how would you prevent something, uh, uh, UTI that's caused by urinary catheter? The f best thing you can, like the options are going to be you, you know, uh, replace it every seven days or, you know, something like that. But the uh, best thing you can do is, you know, take it out as soon as uh, you don't need it. That's what you should do to prevent uh, UTI. Risk factors include indwelling, uh, urinary catheter, urinary tract obstruction, vesicoureteral uh, reflux, diabetes mellitus, uh, pregnancy, progesterone, mediated less than or decrease in uterine tone, and compression by gravid uterus. Okay. Uh, complications include chronic pyelonephritis, uh, renal papillary necrosis, uh, we'll read about that, perinephric abscess with possible posterior spread to absent psoas muscle or urosepsis. Treatment is antibiotics. Uh, in chronic pyelonephritis, the results of recurrent or inadequately treated episodes of acute pyelonephritis typically requires predisposition to infections such as vesicoureteral reflux or chronically obstructing kidney stones, coarse asymmetric corticomedullary scarring, blunted calluses, okay. um, tubules uh, can contain eosinophilic casts resembling thyroid tissue. Okay, and that's called thyroidization of kidney. Uh, Xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. This is rare. It's grossly orange nodules that can mimic tumor nodules. It's characterized by widespread kidney damage due to granulomatous tissue containing foamy macrophages. It's associated with protease infection. Okay. Uh, moving on. Acute kidney injury. Oh, this one is uh, pretty tough. Let's see. So I got a mnemonic for this to remember which drugs uh, this gets affected by. I'll send it. Let's look at this. Okay. Uh, okay, let's look at this. Okay, so when it's pre renal, it means uh, something before kidneys. Intrinsic renal means it's inside the kidneys, and post renal, it means after kidney. Okay, so the etiologies are going to be according to that. Okay. Uh, so pre-renal, it's going to be because of, uh, so what's happening, there is acute kidney injury, right? So something is hurting the kidney and it's something uh, acute. So hypoperfusion or something like that. Okay, that could also cause it. So usually hypoperfusion is what causes pre-renal azotemia. So for that, you need to know what azotemia is. That's abnormally high levels of nitrogen in the blood. Okay. It's characterized by abnormally high levels of nitrogen containing compounds in the blood. Okay, so it's cardiogenic and or hypovolemia. This could be because of diuresis, diarrhea, or dehydration. Okay, so hypovolemia or decrease in cardiac output, decrease in effective circulating volume, like heart failure or uh, liver failure. Okay, uh, so uh, pathophysiology is gonna be, there's decrease in renal blood flow because of hypovolemia. Uh, this will call, lead to decrease in GFR, right? Uh, that's relative to the renal blood flow. Uh, so 
that will lead to increase in reabsorption of sodium and H2O or sodium and water, right? Um, renin and all that will do that, aldosterone will cause that. And in severe, remember dehydration said um, there is reabsorption of urea as well to pull in the water because of urea as well. Okay, so since um, there is less water and more substance, it's going to be increase in osmolality, right? So osmolality is increased, so that's more than 500 over there. Uh, and that should be pretty obvious because hypoperfusion means what? There's decreased amount of liquid. That would mean there's increased amount of solutes, right? Uh, so urine sodium uh, is going to be decreased because most of it is getting reabsorbed, right? So less than 20. Uh, what's the lab value for sodium? Was it like 20 to 32 or something? Uh, 136, okay, 132, yeah. that was 132, okay, so 136 to 145, okay, uh, in serum, how about urine, did they give it there? It varies with diet, okay, so we don't have a value for that. So, you know, it's going to be something less than 20 because most of it is getting reabsorbed because of hypovolemia, right? Hypo perfusion. FENA, remember that was uh, the amount that it's secreted and over the amount that was filtered, I think. Well, let's look at that. fractional uh, excretion of sodium. So, yeah, how much is excreted and how much was filtered, right? So that's going to tell you what, how much of the uh, Na was reabsorbed, right? So that's what's going to, no, that's not what it tells you. How much got excreted basically, wait, so how much was filtered? Divide how much was excreted from it. I'm lagging on my math skills right now. My brain's tired. Hold on. Let me catch up to it. So, filter. So, if you have coffee, you filter the coffee. And then, uh, you drink out of the cup. So, what's left? It's how much coffee was left in the cup, right? That's F neck. F E N A. This is the fractional excretion of sodium. Let me just Google it. Okay, so it's only about the sodium. It's not about anything else. So less than 1% uh, is getting excreted, basically. Uh, this means the uh, kidney is fine if it's less than 1%. Okay. Uh, serum BUN, if it's more than uh, 20, because we have a value for that as well. Uh, urea nitrogen. urine nitrogen serum so 7 to 18 that's the normal range uh, you have it in your body so anything more than that and here we have more than 20 right 7 to 18 and more than 18 is 20 so that means uh, something's wrong with the kidney over there okay uh, makes sense pre-renal azotemia so azotemia that's where the nitrogen is coming from BUN uh, over creatinine 
ratio but creatinine is usually 100 anyway so whatever you have on top is usually what you will have here uh, intrinsic renal failure so that's going to be inside of the kidneys right so intrinsic is going to be glomerular nephritis or renal tubular acidosis ischemic or toxic and interstitial nephritis so fever rash or eosinophilia okay uh, so tubules interstitium let's look at this one So tubules and interstitium, uh, acute tubular necrosis, ischemia, and nephrotoxins. Okay, uh, acute interstitial nephritis, glomerulus, acute glomerular nephritis, vascular vasculitis, malignant hypertension, or uh, TTP HUS. Okay, these are the ones that are going to be tougher to remember because all of these are kidney related. So you know these are intrinsic. Uh, renal failure because this is what they're going to test you on these things uh, or else they'll give you this and then you just have to figure out what this is right it's either or so you know remember the causes pathophysiology is in acute uh, tubular necrosis patchy necrosis there's debris uh, obstructing tubules and fluid backflow occurs which causes Increase in hydrostatic pressure, uh, leading to decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Okay, uh, since there is a decrease in uh, glomerular filtration rate, that means the water is not going to, uh, you know, constant uh, uh, dilute the urine. So, uh, right, yeah. So it stays in the body. So urine odds. Wait, no. What happens is GFRs decrease. Okay, so urine. They're talking about urine. So it can. Right, that makes sense. Uh, osmolality is low here because there's fluid in there. Okay. Because it's not about it's not able to filter stuff. So hydrostatic pressure is increased. So fluid can get through, but not the substances, because anything above that line that we looked at, you know, potassium, chlorine, uh, urea, and then you add inulin and all that stuff on it. So anything above it is not going to go out. But anything below it, like glucose, bicarbonate, and there was something else, amino, amino acids, all those things will get filtered out, okay. So that's why you have decrease in osmolality, right? And urine NA is going to be more than 40, okay? Because water and sodium, they have same uh, filtration rate when we were doing that. The chart that I, we were looking at, right? I'll go to it. So, you know what I'm talking about. I think I wrote past it. I think I wrote like past it. This thing right here. Okay, so osmolality is based on the sodium, so that's where water is one to one, right? So anything below it will get uh, go into it, into the urine, but these things won't go into the urine. Okay, uh, okay, and FNAC excreted and filtered or filtered and whatever is left over. So you have a lot of sodium that goes out, so more than 2% of it. And then serum BUN, uh, you don't have nitrogen buildup because, you know, most of it is getting leaked out anyways. Uh, so that's less than 15 compared to the creatine, right? So you have a bigger number at the bottom because... Uh, this one 
gets filtered out slower than urea and then nitrogen okay so less than that uh gotta memorize it if you have a hard time memorizing uh you know understanding it then just memorize it and you're pretty good to go uh post reno okay so post reno is gonna be because of obstruction in the bladder <laughs> i don't know why i made the eyes over there but obstruction in the bladder or uh because of stones or something or because of uh prosthetic hyperplasia right uh so stones bph neoplasms or congenital anomalies okay uh pathophysiology obstruction outf outflow obstruction so bilateral uh urine osmolality varies depending on how much obstruction there is uh, everything varies urine sodium fena and serum urns uh creatine okay uh Acute interstitial nephritis. For this, the way I remember it is this thing. A uh, doctor prescribed uh, me some sulfa drugs and I got pain in my kidneys. So I took some diuretics and NSAIDs. With NSAIDs, I took some PPIs. Now, after all this, I got some infections. So I look for penicillin. I took some penicillin and cephalosporine. So my family was like, yo, do we need to get checked or do we have the infection as well? So I gave them some refam pin for prophylaxis. Okay, so fam for family, right? So you got sulfa drugs, diuretics, NSAIDs, PPI, um, penicillin, cephalosporine, and refam pin. Okay, so acute interstitial nephritis, also called tubular interstitial nephritis. Acute interstitial renal inflammation, pyuria, classically eosinophils, and azotemia occurring after administration of drugs that act as haptins, inducing hypersensitivity. For example, diuretics, NSAIDs, penicillin derivatives, proton pump inhibitors, rifampin, phenolones, and sulfonamides, less commonly may be secondary to other processes such as systemic infections. For example, mycoplasma or autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome, SLE, and sarcoidosis. Okay. Uh, associated with fever, rash, pyuria, hematuria, and costal vertebral tenderness, but can be asymptomatic. Okay. Uh, it's important to know this because all of this stuff is going to get mixed up. Uh, during the question when you're trying to remember this acute kidney injury acute interstitial nephritis acute tubular necrosis and uh renal papillar necrosis as well uh okay so uh, understand it so remember five p's p for diuretics pain free for NSAIDs You know, penicillins and cephalosporins, proton pump inhibitors, rifampin, and sulfa drugs. So once more, so doc prescribed me some sulfa drugs and I got pain in my kidney, kidneys. Uh, so I took some diuretics and NSAIDs. With NSAIDs, I took some PPIs. After all that, this, I got, uh, got some infection. So I took some penicillin and cephalosporin. So my family was like, Yo, do we have infection? So I gave them some rifampin for prophylaxis. Okay. So if the question stem says that this person was taking one of these because of an infection, and then they started having some kind of, uh, you know, increase in CRP and all that, lab, those lab values, right? Or, you know. Uh, it's gonna be this so this is basically what you see uh, but they don't give you something that's easy so acute interstitial renal inflammation pyuria classically eosinophils and azotemia occurring after administration of drugs okay uh, inducing hypersensitivity so for these questions uh, you need to practice with uh, question banks um, that's how you'll get good at identifying what it is just memorization won't be 
enough for these. Uh, acute tubular necrosis. This is an easy one if they give you muddy brown appearance or cast, granular cast, because we already know that granular cast is only ATN, right? So if they give you that, then good, because if they don't, then it gets harder. So most common cause of acute kidney injury is, let me see if I have some kind of note here. I do. Uh, let's read that after though. So most common cause of acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients spontaneously resolves in many cases, can be fatal, uh, especially during initial oliguric phase. So there's increase in FENA, right? fractional excretion of uh, sodium. So there are three stages. Uh, okay, for, before that. Key findings are granular casts. Those are granular casts, like uh, often muddy brown in appearance. Like that. There are three stages. There is inciting event. Okay. Uh, this is the initial oliguric phase then you have the maintenance phase which is uh, okay so this is the oliguric phase okay. uh, last one to three weeks uh, risk of hyperkalemia metabolic acidosis uh, uremia and then you have third which is the recovery phase or polyuric uh, where you pee a lot so first inciting event second uh, you don't pee Third, you start peeing again, and you have BUN and serum creatinine falls. Uh, risk of hypokalemia and renal wasting of other electrolytes and minerals. Can be caused by ischemic or nephrotoxic injury. Uh, ischemic is secondary to decreased renal blood flow, for example, pre-renal azotemia. Okay. Uh, Right, so you need to know this. So it can be caused by ischemic or nephrotoxic injury. If it's ischemic, it's going to be secondary to a decrease in renal blood flow. Okay, so that could be because of hypovolemia, right? Prenatal azotomia, that's that one. That, those are the causes for that. It results in uh, death of tubular cells that may sludge into tubular lumen. Okay, and that's what you're seeing over there. Uh, not gonna help you though. <laughs> uh, proximal tubules and thick ascending limbs, limb are highly susceptible to injury. Okay, so this is important. Why? Because these are the parts where they're more, you know, in the medulla. They're in the medulla and they're more prone to ischemic damage, right? Like the watersheds, but it's not watershed. Remember. So PT and thick ascending limb of the medulla. Uh, they are highly susceptible to injury. And if it's nephrotoxic, it's secondary to injury resulting from toxic substances, for example, aminoglycosides, radio contrast agent. That's an important one. So for this, they'll say that this person went under some kind of procedure and then he started, you know, having these things. Uh, so that should give you a clue that it's ATN that this person went because that procedure to before you do it you do a radio contrast CT scan or something okay uh, lead cisplatin and ethylene glycol myoglobinuria like rhabdomyolysis for example hem uh, hemoglobinuria uh, proxen tubules are particularly susceptible to injury in this as well okay in the note I have ATN changes will lead to loss of epithelial cell polarity which occurs early due to alteration in the actin cytoskeleton okay uh, so you can have uh, in stage 2 you will have blunting of wait stage 2 or just blunting of apical microvilli loss of cell cell adhesion, redistribution of integrants, and redistribution of sodium potassium ATPase. Okay. 
it doesn't make sense to me right now so we'll just ignore that okay uh, know the three stages uh, know the causes and know how to identify it okay uh, diffuse cortical necrosis this is uh, acute generalized cortical infraction of both kidneys likely due to combination of vasospasm and DIC it's associated with obstetric, uh, obstetric catastrophe, uh, for example, or catastrophic, catastrophes, catastrophes, uh, for example, placental abruption and septic shock. I think I'm getting zoned out again, sorry. Uh, pep renal papillary necrosis, this is an uh, important one as well. This and this one. So what happens here is there's sludging of necrotic renal papillae, like that, uh, you get, which leads to gross hematuria, maybe triggered by recent infection or immune stimulus, right? So this is similar to like other shit that we have been reading about. So that's not gonna help you uh, with this, right? Because that could be nephro uh, nephritic syndrome as well. You get hematuria in that too because of infection or immune stimulus. So how do you identify it? Uh, it's associated with uh, these things. So when you see these things, uh, think about this. All the other times it's going to be something else. Okay. So if uh, there is sickle cell disease, acute pyelonephritis, uh, analgesics, for example, NSAIDs or diabetic uh, DMs or diabetes mellitus. So said papa with papillary necrosis. Okay. Uh, very important, very easy, but very important. Uh, consequences of renal failure. So what happens when you have renal failure? There's decline in renal filtration, which can lead to excess retained nitrogenous waste products and electrolyte disturbances. Consequences are mad hunger. So metabolic acidosis, right because you have a buildup of all the waste products uh, dyslipidemia especially increase in uh, triglycerides uh, high potassium uremia and uh, sodium h2o retention because of heart failure uh, right so heart failure and pulmonary edema and hypertension so all of this will cause decrease in stroke volume and decrease in stroke volume sends signal to the brain to tell you that Yo, you need to, you know, get more water in here because heart ain't pumping enough of it. So that's why you pain stuff. Uh, growth retardation and developmental delay. Uh, erythropoietin deficiency. Uh, this is an important one. We talked about it. Renal osteodystrophy. Two forms of renal failure. Acute, uh, for example, ATN. And chronic, for example, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and congenital anomalies. Incremental reductions in GFR define the stages of chronic kidney disease. So that's important. That's how we know uh, which stage you are at um, because of GFR. Okay. Normal phosphate levels are maintained during early stages of uh, CKD. Okay, Because remember, you need kidneys to excrete uh, phosphates uh, okay but eventually you're gonna have build up of phosphate and ckd okay so normal phosphate levels are maintained during early stages of ckd due to increased levels of fibroblast growth factor 23 so this is important uh, they'll ask you what causes normal levels of phosphate levels and uh, you know kidney failure uh, it's this FGF23 or fibroblast growth factor 23, which promotes renal excretion of phosphate. So FGF23 fights phosphate. Uremia is a syndrome resulting from high serum urea. It can present with uh, pericarditis, encephalopathy seen with esterexis, uh, anorexia, nausea, pronounced European or European. P for pericarditis, encephalopathy, anorexia, and nausea. Uh, but anyways, you should just know. You don't have to bother memorizing it. 
just know what happens uh, when you don't have a ki uh, don't have kidneys, right? Uh, renal osteodystrophy, hypocalcemia, hypo hyperphosphatemia, and failure of vitamin D hydroxylation associated with chronic kidney disease, which leads to secondary hyperparathyroidism uh, or tertiary hyperparathyroidism if secondarily, uh, secondary poorly managed. High serum, so what was it? So hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and failure of vitamin D hydroxylation associated with chronic kidney disease. Second one is due to increase in uh, first one is due to increase in PTH. Second one is due to decrease in calcium, and third one was because of increase in phosphate. I think. Right. Uh, high serum uh, phosphate can bind with calcium, uh, which causes deposition of it, uh, the complex into the tissue. This decreases serum calcium, which leads to uh, also decrease in uh, activated vitamin D will cause decrease in intestinal calcium absorption, right? So it causes subperiosteal thinning of bones. Okay. Sorry, uh, renal cyst disorder. So ADPKD or autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, numerous cysts in cortex and medulla. So you need to know that. It's right here. It's going to be cysts in cortex and medulla, both causing bilateral and large kidneys, ultimately destroys kidney parenchyma. Presents with combination of flank pain, hematuria, hypertension, urinary infection, Progressive renal failure in approximately 50% of the adult uh, individual. And 50% of individuals, okay. Mutation in PKD1, so polycystic kidney disease 1. Uh, encoding polycystine protein, 85% of cases, chromosome 16. Or PKD2, which is 15% of cases, uh, and this happens in chromosome Four, so four times two is eight actually uh, so four times four is going to be 16 right so two times four like that. not two times four but four times four but you have two fours there uh, complications include chronic kidney disease and hypertension caused by increase in renin production Associated with berry aneurysm, mitral valve prolapse, um, benign hepatic cyst, and diverticulosis. Uh, berry aneurysm is an uh, important one. You got to remember association with uh, PKD. Okay. And this. Otherwise, they just tell you uh, that there was a mutation in this. So then they'll ask you what happens to on the surface of the kidney so there's going to be cyst in the cortex and medulla uh, destroyed uh, parenchyma okay treatment is if hypertension or proteinuria develops treat with ace inhibitors or arbs wow so those are your prills and your stre star sartans sartans there you go Okay, uh, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, uh, mutation in PKHD1, uh, encoding fibrocysteine over here. Okay, we had polycystine over here, and here we have fibrocysteine for autosomal recessive. Cystic dilation of the collecting ducts, so uh, we know we don't, but it's this thing so dilation of the cystic ducts uh, collecting ducts okay uh, often presents in infancy associated with congenital hepatic fibrosis significant oliguric renal failure in utero can lead to 
Potter sequence. Concerns beyond neonatal periodic include period include systemic hypertension, progressive renal insufficiency, and portal hypertension from congenital hepatic fibrosis. Okay, and we have autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease, also called medullary cystic kidney disease. It causes tubular interstitial fibrosis and progressive renal insufficiency with inability to concentrate urine. Medullary cysts usually not visualized smaller kidneys on ultrasound and poor prognosis. Simple versus complex renal cysts. So simple cysts are filled with ultrafiltrates, so uh, they're anechoic or on ultrasound. So you don't see any echoes over there or lines over there, so that's anechoic. These are simple cysts. Very common and account for majority of all renal masses found incidentally and typically asymptomatic. Okay, so it's gonna be something that they were looking for, like something in the stomach, but then uh, they saw kidneys and then they found it out. So it's gonna be an incidental finding. Complex cyst is uh, including those that are separated enhanced or have solid components on imaging require follow-up or removal due to possibility of uh, RCC, renal cell carcinoma. Okay, uh, renal disease, uh, how much left? Okay, two more pages. Renal oncocytoma, um, benign epithelial cell tumor. Renal oncocytoma, benign epithelial cell tumor, arising from collecting ducts, uh, arrow in A, right there, point to well circumscribed mass with central scar. Large eosinophilic cells with abundant mitochondria without perinuclear clearing. Uh, okay, so oncocytoma, there's no perinuclear clearing like that. Uh, versus chromophobe renal cells carcinoma. Presents with painless hematuria. This is the buzzword for this, painless hematuria. Uh, flank pain and abdominal mass. Often resected to exclude malignancy, for example, renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so it's benign cell tumor. Okay, so yeah okay arising from that, that that large eosinophilic cells abundant mitochondria this is important uh, without perinuclear central clearing okay and painless hematuria painless hematuria large eosinophilic cells with abundant mitochondria are and it's benign epithelial cell tumor right so that you gotta get rid of it so it doesn't go into you know turn into renal cell carcinoma then you have nephroblastoma, also called Wilms tumor. Uh, okay. Uh, most common renal malignancy of early childhood. Right. So, uh, ages two to four. I'm just trying to remember. Uh, you gotta differentiate this with something else as well. Uh, I can't recall right now because my mental function is declining. But, um, so one of these is the one that crosses the midline and the other one doesn't cross the midline. Maybe they'll tell us here. So most common renal malignancy of early childhood, ages two to four, contains embryonic glomerular structures, most often present with a large palpable unilateral flank mass. Okay, so it looks like that. Uh, and or hematuria and possible hypertension. Can be associated with loss of function mutation of tumor suppressor genes, WT1, so Wilms tumor one or Wilms tumor two or WT2, on chromosome 11, so W11ML's tumor, that's how you remember that. Uh, this is what they'll test you on, so maybe part of several syndromes, right here. One is Weger complex, right, so you have Wilms tumor, and Rydia, this is absence of virus. Uh, let's look at what that looks like. OK. 
Uh, general urinary malformations, range of developmental delays. Okay, so Weger complex, Wilms tumor, and radia, they will give you this. Uh, genital urinary malformation and range of developmental delays. Then you have Denny's trash syndrome, so Wilms tumor, diffuse mesangial sclerosis, early onset nephrotic syndrome, dysgenesis of uh, gonad, so male pseudohermaphroditism, uh, and WT1 mutation. Okay. So with uh, pseudohermaphroditism, this is uh, the way I remember this is uh, dress. Uh, I think of it like dress and cross dressing at Denny's. Okay. So, or Danny does cross-dressing, right? So, male with pseudohermaphroditism. And this is uh, WT1 mutation, so Wilms tumor. Okay. Uh, back with Weinheim uh, syndrome, this is the one with, uh, I think of Becky, who's like, has her tongue out. A girl named Becky, and her tongue is really wide. Okay. So... Wilms tumor and you have macroglossia. So hold on, let's see what this looks like first. Uh, can't really tell. Okay, so that's back with, it's the one with uh, the tongue. So Becky got her tongue out. Okay, and it's wide. So Wilms tumor, macroglossia, uh, organs are wide too. Okay, hemiharperplasia, so imprinting defect causing genetic overexpression associated with WT2 mutation and omphalocele. Okay, so they'll give you that this person uh, has a large tongue uh, and palpable you know mass in the stomach oh, and it's crossing midline or not i don't know see i don't know which one that was crosses midline let me see if i can search it up Ah, this one, neuroblastoma. That's the one I was thinking of. Okay, so most common presentation is abdominal distension and a firm uh, irregular mass that crosses the midline. Okay, so this one's the one that crosses midline. And you gotta differentiate it with this, uh, right? So adrenal tumor, uh, adrenal medulla tumor, right? Uh, that's what this is. Versus Wilms tumor, which is smooth and unilateral, and it does not cross the midline. That was bothering me. Okay. Done with that. Uh, you have urothelial, urothelial uh, carcinoma of the bladder, also called transitional cell carcinoma. Most common tumor of urinary tract system uh, can occur in renal calluses, renal pelvis, ureter and bladder uh, it's usually bladder uh, and that's where you will see hematuria can be suggested by painless hematuria so if you have painless hematuria it's going to be because of uh, cancer right it's usually because of cancer because you don't have pain and cancer right it's going to be that or this renal oncocytoma but they'll tell you about this and that 
here they won't tell you anything they'll just tell you that it's this so if you don't have anything else to go on and you just have this uh, always pick this as the answer it's associated with problems in PSAC so phenacetine tobacco smoking aromatic amines found in dyes and cyclophosphamide right that's the one that causes cystitic hem uh, hemorrhagic cystitis and you give mesna to prevent that you have fibrovascular core and papillary tumor dysplastic urethelium okay uh, squamous cell carcinoma so you'll have keratin pearls here as well uh, but for the bladder so chronic irritation of urinary bladder will lead to squamous metaplasia which leads to dysplasia and then uh, squamous cell carcinoma risk factors include 4s schistosoma hematibium infection from if it's from middle east chronic cystic uh, cystitis smoking chronic nephrolithiasis so stones can also lead to that it presents with painless hematuria um, uh, no cast here as well so okay so three things now we gotta remember for hematuria so it well we already know that this happens because of cancer right but then you got to differentiate between the two. If it's this one, they'll definitely mention keratin pearls. Either they'll show you a photo of it or, you know, explain it in words. Okay. This one is really important, though, for cancer. Okay. Uh, renal pharmacology, a diuretic site, afferent, efferent, glomerulus, um, PCT, descending limb of loop of Henle, ascending limb. Just a convoluted tubule and uh, collecting duct. Okay, you have um, N1. Uh, everything gets reabsorbed, right? You have bicarbonate, sodium, sugar, amine, amino acids. So uh, Na, Na comes in, then also does uh, H2O, right? Uh, in this part, uh, it's water uh, permeable, but not. Uh, sodium permeable, so it's impermeable to solutes over here. Over here, it's impermeable to water, but permeable to solutes like Na, K, and Cl as well. Okay, um, and because of this, uh, there is a paracellular gradient for calcium and magnesium going into the vessels as well. Over here, you have sodium and chlorine. Uh, this is important for thiazide, and uh, calcium comes in because of exchange of sodium because we diuretics does what it makes more water and sodium comes into this uh, so water will come into this to make more water in the urine uh, potassium and hydrogen go in and sodium comes in here so in exchange for sodium you lose cal uh, potassium or hydrogen okay uh, so we'll look at these while we read about them. Okay. That was just a review of what we know so far. Okay. So mannitol. Uh, it's important. Why? Because uh, of uh, it's used in drug overdose, but most importantly, we use it in elevated intracranial intraocular pressure. Okay. So that's why it's important. Uh, why do we do that? Because it uh, it lowers the pressure without lowering the osmolality, I think. Wait, so mechanism is uh, osmotic diuretic. Uh, so it increases serum osmolality. Yeah, see? So it does it without reducing the osmolality of the serum. So it, in, in other words, it increases it. Uh, that's why it's important. Okay, so osmotic diuretic uh, increases serum osmolality, leads to a fluid shift from interstitium to intravascular space. Okay, so that means outside of the vessel to inside of the vessel. Vessel. Okay, so this leads to increase in urine flow, which decreases intracranial intraocular pressure. Understand the mechanism. It's important. Clinical use, this is important, but it's also used in drug overdose. Adverse effects of all of these drugs are important, okay? 
So in this, dehydration, hypo or hypernatremia, uh, most importantly, pulmonary edema. Okay, so they'll be like, okay, this person had intracranial pressure or intraocular pressure increase. Then he was given some drug, uh, so it resolved, but after a while, he had difficulty in breathing. Which drug was he given? It's going to be mannitol. Contraindicated in anuria uh, or heart failure, so we don't give it in that. Because that's going to precipitate this. Uh, so its action is right there. Uh, number one. And the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. Then we have acetazolamide. Okay. It's used for glaucoma. Metabolic alkalosis. Uh, altitude sickness. By offsetting respiratory alkalosis. Idiopathic. Intracranial hypertension so this one is really important uh, we actually give the uh, uh, a person a hiker or someone who's going on to the you know to hiking above sea level, level or about like 3,000 or something 2,500 or 3,000 uh, we can give them acetazolamide because uh, it will prevent this metabolic al alkalosis okay uh, so acetazolamide mechanism is carbonic anhydrase inhibitor it causes self-limited uh, NaHCO3 diuresis and decrease in total body uh, bicarbonate stores. It actually alkalinizes, alkalinizes the urine. Okay. Uh, easiest way to remember that is it makes uh, metabolic acidosis. And to do that, you need um, bicarbonate to leave through the urine. It acts in this area, so proximal convoluted tubule as well. Uh, adverse effect is proximal renal tubular acidosis or type 2 RTA. Remember, 214, low, low, more, uh, normal, high, normal. And then uh, for nephro, it was no, yes, no. So, okay. Proximal renal tubular acidosis, type 2 RTA, perasthesia, perasthesia, uh, that's important. Uh, so is this ammonia toxicity, uh, sulfur allergy, hypokalemia. It promotes calcium phosphate stone formation because uh, it's, uh, you know, this makes the pH alkaline because it's insoluble at high pH, right, calcium phosphate. Uh, what stone type of stones do you get in uh, decreased pH? You get citrate and uh, uric acid. Not citrate, cyclic. Was it cyclic? Oh, not citrate. Need to confirm that. Hold on. Cysteine. No, sorry. I was wrong for both. Okay, cysteine stones. Cola. Okay. Like that, like that. Uh, loop diuretic so loop you think of that like you know a girl who has loop earrings so loop earrings right and let's me make a girl And these earrings are, you know, there. Yeah. So loop earrings. Why? Because uh, the most important side effect of loop diuretics are autotoxicity. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's used for edematous stages, uh, states, like for example, uh, heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, pulmonary edema, uh, hypertension, or hypercalcemia. So anywhere you have edema. Uh, mechanism is sulfonamide loop diuretics inhibits co-transport system like uh, NAK2CL, right? So this is where it affects the loop of Hanley right here. Uh, okay, so a thick ascending limb of loop of Hanley 
abolish hypertonicity right because when this goes in uh, what does it do it creates hyper uh, hyperton uh, hypotonic right so because here you have water going away you have uh, sodium in here but by here when sodium goes away this uh, gradient becomes uh, you know the osmolality becomes equal but now when you have sodium in here it keeps that right so it abolishes uh, hypertonicity of uh, medulla uh, preventing concentration of urine okay hold on prevents preventing concentration of urine associated with increase in PGE vasodilatory effect on uh, afferent arterioles inhibited by NSAIDs increase in calcium excretion uh, loops lose calcium okay so if you have uh, sodium in here what's going to happen to water while it's going down here it's not going to get reabsorbed right because wherever sodium goes water goes so when you have more sodium inside of this you will have uh, more water inside of this as well so then you'll leak out more water uh, thus reducing the edema loops lose calcium uh, that's important too. So what will that cause? Something. Uh, uh, right, so that's why you can use it in hypercalcemia, right? Uh, adverse effect is autotoxicity, hypokalemia, hypomagnesia, magnesemia, dehydration, allergy because it's a sulfur drug, metabolic alkalosis, okay? Here, uh, it causes metabolic acidosis. Here, we have metabolic alkalosis, nephritis, interstitial, and gout. Okay, so in interstitial nephritis because of this. So, oh dang. Right, uh, loop diuretics are furosemide, that's the most important one, but also bumetanide and torsamide. Okay, important side effect is this. Ethocrinic acid. Um, it's used in diuresis in patients with allergy to sulfur drug. So it's just like a loop diuretic, but here the it's just more autotoxic as a side effect. Okay, so if you have allergy to the sulfur, sulfur allergy, then this is uh, ideal for you. Mechanism, uh, non-sulfonamide inhibitor of co-transport system, NAKC2CL, again, that thing right there. Uh, wait, uh, of thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Clinical use is diuresis in patients' allergy and that and that. So loop earrings hurt your ears. Okay. This is amazing photo right here. Uh, thiazide diuretics, so these are your hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide, and metalazine, something like that. This is the important one, and the name itself, right? Mechanism is, in, it inhibits uh, NACL reabsorption in early DCT, okay? So it's not going to reabsorb the sodium chloride right there. Uh... In early DCT so this is early DCT right here uh, this leads to decrease in diluting capacity of the nephron uh, decreases calcium excretion okay because now calcium is not going to get you know into the tubules in exchange for uh, in exchange for cal uh, sodium hold on right so it decreases capacity of that, so it decreases calcium excretion. How does that happen? Oh, right, because, um, no, wait, I'm confused. I'll figure it out later. I'll move on. Uh, clinical use, hypertension, 
heart failure, idiopathic hypercalciuria, uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and osteoporosis. So I guess uh, sodium comes in in exchange for calcium. So calcium does not get excreted because of that for some reason. I'll figure it out in New World, I guess. Uh, adverse effect is hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, hyponatremia, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia, and hypercalcemia. Okay. Uh, sulfur allergy here too. So hyperglucemia, everything is hyper. So uh, glycemia, lipidemia, uricemia, calcemia, except for natremia because it's diuretic. Okay, and we have uh, potassium sparing diuretic. So that's gonna be over here. These are your spironolactone and epilinone. It has own in it, so it acts on the aldosterone receptors. And then you have amyloride and triamantarine. Okay. So spironolactone and epilurone are competitive aldosterone receptor antagonists in cortical collecting tubule. Triamantarine and amyloride blocks sodium channels at the same part of the tubule. So you gotta remember triamantarine and amyloride. Okay. Uh, Clinical use is hyperaldosteronism, so you need to block the aldosterone receptors, right? Uh, potassium, or you need to, you know, block the sodium channels so sodium doesn't come in due to aldosterone. Because what does aldosterone do? It reabsorbs sodium and excretes potassium, right? Uh, and that's the whole point of RAS system, to increase blood volume uh, so clinical use hyperaldosteronism potassium depletion uh, heart failure hepatic acid uh, acid ascitis uh, like uh, this is spironolactone uh, uh, okay so you give spironolactone in this hepatic ascitis uh, nephrogenic DI, so you give amyloride for that. Uh, Antiandrogen, uh, so you give spironolactone for that. Okay. okay. There's a question about why would you give a uh, diuretic uh, in nephrogenic DI. We talked about that in uh, endo, I think. Antiandrogen uh, spironolactone. We give it that. Okay. Adverse effects are hyperkalemia can lead to arrhythmias, endocrine effects in spironolactone. For example, gynecomastia, antiandrogen effects, and metabolic acidosis. Okay, and diuretic uh, electrolyte changes. Urine, NaCl. Okay, we don't need that anymore. So, electrolyte changes. If you have urine, NaCl increases with all diuretics. Concentration varies based on potency of diuretic effect. Serum, NaCl may result as a uh, may decrease as a result. Then you have urine, potassium. This is increasing especially with loop and thiazide diuretics excluding potassium sparing diuretics okay so it increases uh, usually with loop and thiazide but uh, not potassium sparing diuretics okay uh, blood ph uh, so decrease which is acidemia so metabolic acidosis carbonic anhydrase inhibitors Right, so acetazolamide causes metabolic acidosis. Uh, decrease in HCO3 reabsorption. Okay. 
potassium sparing aldosterone blockade prevents potassium secretion and age secretion uh, additionally hyperkalemia leads to potassium entering all cells via uh, hydrogen potassium exchanger and exchange for hydrogen existing uh, exiting cells increase or uh, alkalosis or alkalemia uh, loop diuretics and thiazides causes alkalemia okay these two uh, through several mechanisms so volume contraction will lead to increase in angiotensin 2 which leads to increase in sodium hydrogen exchange PCT in PCT okay uh, which increases uh, bicarbonate reabsorption Okay, um, before I go on, uh, so I was talking about why would you give uh, a diuretic and uh, diabetic nephropathy, right? Uh, it's because uh, when you give this, it uh, causes the kid, uh, renals to pull in more sodium in the proximal tubules. And when you do that, uh, it also pulls in more water. Uh, so it's known as uh, paradoxal effect. Of some or something like that but that's the whole point of giving a diuretic and that in uh, diabetic insipidus okay uh, so uh, potassium loss leads to potassium exiting all cells via HK exchanger and exchange for H entering cells okay uh, in low K state or uh, potassium state uh, hydrogen rather than potassium is exchanged for sodium in cortical collecting tubule so this leads to alkalosis and uh, paradoxal aciduria uh, urine calcium increase with uh, loop diuretic decrease in paracellular calcium reabsorption leads to hypocalcemia decrease with thiazides enhance calcium reabsorption Okay, uh, angiotensin converting enzymes, so your prills, uh, captopril, enopril, lisnopril, and remipril. Okay, uh, and your ARBs are your sartans. Okay. So, mechanism inhibit ACE leads to decrease in angiotensin 2, which leads to uh, decrease in GFR by preventing constriction of efferent arterioles. Remember, ACE. Uh, Angiotensin causes uh, constriction of efferent arterioles, and there was PDA, prostaglandin dilates afferent arterioles. Increase in renin due to loss of negative feedback inhibition of ACE also prevents inactivation of bradykinin, a potent vasodilator. Clinical use is hypertension, uh, heart failure, proteinuria, diabetic nephropathy. Uh, these are uh, renal protective. Well, they probably tell us that. Uh, prevent unfavorable heart remodeling as a result of chronic hypertension. In chronic kidney disease, diabetic nephropathy, decrease in intraglomerular pressure, slowing of GBM thickening. That's why it's renal protective. So adverse effect. Uh, Edwell cause, you know, because of ACE. ACE does what to bradykinin? It inactivates bradykinin, right? So when you block ACE, you'll get cough, angioedema, both due to the increase in bradykinin, contraindicated, and C1 esterase inhibitor uh, deficiency. So when you have that, do not give this. It's contraindicated and C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency. Uh, teratogen, fetal renal malformations, increase in creatinine, decrease in GFR, uh, hyperkalemia and hypotension used with caution in bilateral renal artery stenosis because ACE inhibitor will s further decrease GFR okay. uh, which will lead to renal failure so capital pills catch ARBs are losartan or angiotensin 2 receptor blockers are losartan, candesartan and valsartan Mechanism is selectively blocks binding of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 receptor. Effect similar to ACE inhibitors, but ARBs do not 
increase bradykinin. Clinical use is hypertension, heart failure, proteinuria, or chronic kidney disease like diabetic nephropathy, similar to this one, with intolerance to ACE inhibitors, for example, cough and angioedema. Adverse effects are hyperkalemia, decrease in GFR, hypotension, and teratogens. Okay. Uh, Aliskarenin or Kirin. Alice Kirin. Uh, mechanism it is, uh, you know, there's renin in it. So, ren for renin, it's a direct renin inhibitor. So, I ren, so inhibits renin. That's how you remember that. Direct inhibit, uh, renin inhibitor. So it blocks conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Eliskerin kills uh, renin. Uh, clinical use is hypertension. And adverse effects are hyperkalemia, decrease in GFR, hypotension, and uridema. Relatively contraindicated in patients already taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs and contraindicated in pregnancy. Well, done for today.